Tommy Wright. You know why I said that, right? <laughs> Tommy Wright. Good morning and welcome to the spring 2019 meeting of the Census Scientific Advisory Committee. <clears throat> Members, we're delighted as always to have you join us and we... I can speak to that. <laughs> okay. We're delighted as we're delighted as always to have you join us and we look forward to a productive discussion during the next two days. I want to do something unusual. We usually thank folks at the end of the meeting and sometimes everyone's not here and so I want to stray a little bit. I hope Tara it's all right to thank people at the beginning. There are many things that happen behind the scenes, and uh, many of you know this, filling out forms, doggone it, and getting them in on time. Uh, uh, people preparing presentations at the Census Bureau, you being sent these and uh, preparing remarks. Uh, Tara's staff and Enid, who helps with travel. and Well, puts the program together. I, in fact, I was thinking last night, Tara is sort of a producer and director, mm. and maybe some other titles. Yeah. <laughs> The, the technical staff as well, but, but many thanks to everyone, uh, particularly the, the folk who are here as advisors. Thank you very much. My name is Tommy Wright, the designated federal officer for the Census Bureau Scientific Advisory Committee. <clears throat> In this role, I am required to preside over the advisory committee meeting as specified by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, also known as FACA. At this time, I would like to request that uh, my colleague, George Barnett, uh, walk us through some safety protocols. George? Uh, and I'm on. <laughs> so I'm, <clears throat> good morning. I'm George Barnett. I'm chief of the Census Bureau's Health and Safety Branch. And I love my job because of the Bureau's total commitment that the safety of its employees in the field and headquarters is absolutely at the a most important part of enabling our staff to do their jobs. Along with that, we're committed to the safety of our visitors, so I'm going to give you a couple real quick briefing points about safety features of this building. Uh, we are very happy to have you here. I'd like to remind you that for security reasons, you are not able to go beyond the first floor of the building without an escort. You're not able to take photos anywhere. But as far as safety goes, we don't expect an emergency today. But emergencies, unfortunately, by definition, are unexpected. If there should be a fire in the building, you would be alerted by a series of sirens and strobe lights and really sweet alternating male and female voices saying, may I have your attention, please? There is a fire in the building. Please evacuate by the nearest exit. I haven't yet been able to get it programmed to say, and have a nice day. But that will tell you that you are to evacuate. And if you are in this room, you will see the three doors behind me that are the emergency evacuation at, uh, exits for the auditorium. They will lead you to a series of sidewalks, and your hosts will be more than happy to help you navigate to an assembly point at least 50 feet away from the building. There could be other sorts of emergencies which we would use our public address system to tell you about. And in that case, you would hear a, may I have your attention, please, notice. And you would be advised of the nature of the particular emergency and the actions you are asked to take. Now, in case there is anybody here who has, it doesn't matter, a permanent or temporary mobility concern or any concern about being able to follow the exit routes, use steps, walk distances, please speak to one of the panel support members here, and they will make sure that there would be somebody available to assist you if there are an emergency. Uh, this is, of course, a no smoking facility. There are designated smoking facilities outside the building and we suggest you speak to your staff members if you need to use them so you can navigate leaving and re-entering the building. So thank you very much for your attention. We're, along with everybody else in the Census Bureau, delighted to have you here. Have a good morning. Th 
Thank you very much, George. As we begin, I want to remind members and those joining us in the room that inside the census headquarters, you are prohibited from taking pictures with your smartphones, camera, or other recording devices. The proceedings are being recorded and transmitted live by way of a webcast. It's a census YouTube channel, which is linked today and tomorrow on the census.gov homepage. Members, when you speak uh, and are ready to speak, please uh, place your tent like this, and you will be called upon at the appropriate time. Remember to clearly state your name always at the beginning. For the record, please be advised that side conversations may be heard on the tabletop uh, microphones. All meeting materials are posted on the Census Advisory Committee a website for public viewing. I'd like to now introduce the folks at the head table. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> let's see, before proceeding with the review of today's agenda, uh, to my left is Committee Chair Allison Plyer. Next to Allison is Al Fontenot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank All you. right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been getting some coaching in French, so I, uh, Al, you're <laughs> <laughs> Associate Director for Decennial Census Programs. Next to Al is not Tim Olson, but uh, Michael Thiem, who's the Assistant Director for Decennial Census Programs Systems and Contracts. Next to uh, Michael is Laura Fugioni, uh, Chief of the Office of Program Performance and Stakeholder Integration. Uh, next to Laura is uh, Kevin Smith, the Chief Information Officer. Uh, next to Kevin is David Zayer, a Chief uh, Administrative Officer. To my right is the David Dillingham, the Director of the Steve. U.S. Steve. Steve, Steve, I'm sorry, still at David. Steve, <laughs> Steve Dillingham. Yes, Steve Dillingham, Director of the Census Bureau. To Steve's right is Ron Jarman. Deputy Director. Next to Ron is Enrique Lamas, a Senior Advisor to the Director. Next to Enrique is John About, Associate Director for Research and Methodology and Chief Scientist. Next to John is Tori Vilkoff, Associate Director for Demographic Programs. Next to Tori, so several people are not here just yet. They'll be joining us late in sitting in for Ali Ahmed is uh, Burton Rice, who's the Assistant Director for Communications. Uh, that's not Nick Orsini next to him. Uh, that, <laughs> that is Sam Jones, Assistant Director for Economic Programs. Allison and I will share in facilitating your deliberations today and tomorrow, and essentially what we will do, I will introduce folks from the Census Bureau, and after the presentations are, are given, she will, uh, 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 what is it, orchestrate the uh, discussions. Acknowledgements, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, uh, any members from the Department of Commerce, uh, congressional staff and regional staff who may be attending, um, I don't, all the faces that I see are familiar faces at the Census Bureau. We also want to welcome uh, people from the public and the staff who are participating by way of webcast and in, and in person. <clears throat> now, Kyle. Oh. Now our telecommunications office will provide an iPad navigation overview for those at the head table. Good morning, everyone. My name is O'Brien Grant, and I will be giving you a brief de demonstration on how to use your iPads for today and tomorrow. The iPads should be currently at the home screen. If they're not at the home screen, press the home button on the right-hand side of the iPad in the middle. When you are at the home screen, you will see three applications. The first application is Moss 360. This application will be used to view all the presentation and documents for the conference. The presentation will be on the left-hand side of the screen. Select the presentation you would like to view, and it will be open on the right. If you would like to expand the view, there is an X on the top middle of the screen. Select that to expand the view. When you are ready to go back to the presentation, select the docs on the left-hand side of the iPad. If you go back to the home screen by pressing the home button, the next application is notes. This application will be used to create an email for your recommendations. To start the recommendation, it's like the icon in the top right corner that resembles, resembles a square and a pencil. 
After completing your recommendation, you can email them directly to the chairperson to do this. It's like the icon in the top right hand corner that looks like a square with an arrow pointing up. You will then see an option that says mail, select that. Now in the line two, you will type the Gmail address for the chairperson. The Gmail address is csacchair at gmail.com. Please put your name in the subject line so the chair will know who is sending this recommendation. If you go back to your home screen by pressing the home button, the last application is Safari. This application will allow you to surf the web for anything you may need to look up. You have two handouts in front of you. The tablet overview shows you the application that and their functions, and you also have instructions on emailing from the notes application. To connect your personal device to the guest wireless, go to your Wi-Fi settings and connect your device to System 10 account. Once connected, go to your preferred web browser and try to access any website. You will be prompted to enter the credentials that are displayed on the 10 card. Once you enter the credentials, you have internet access. If you have any questions throughout the conference, myself and other analysis would we'll be here to help you. Thank you. Have a great conference. Thank you very much. Our, <clears throat> our meeting agenda today reflects a broad range of topics. We developed the agenda in response to the Census Bureau's need to share and introduce research and program developments requiring your attention. The agenda also includes topics um, CSAC recommended on critical program areas and research. Each topic session is broken into three parts, uh, the Census Bureau presentation, uh, the discussant presentation, and the committee presentation. And there is an understanding that if the session is an hour long, 20 minutes will be devoted for the presentation, 20 minutes will be devoted for discussant, and 20 minutes for committee uh, members discussion. Allison and I will try to honor that uh, schedule and we appreciate uh, your uh, cooperation uh, towards that end. First on today's agenda, our committee chair Allison Plyer will share remarks and introduce committee members. Following Allison, Steve Dillingham and Ron Jarman will provide executive remarks. Al Fontenot and Michael Thiem will present an update on the 2020 census followed by committee discussion. We will, we will let's see, Monica Vines and Gina Waleko will discuss the census barriers, attitudes, and motivators survey final report followed by discussing Jay Wright. Prior to that, we will also have a group photo at about 10.15. We'll stop for the working lunch and the update on the Integrated Partnership and Communications Program. Kendall Johnson, Maria Ometo, Malagon, and discussant Mario Mar Mar Marizzi. Then Jason Devine and Cynthia Davis Collingsworth will present the proposed 2020 data products plan, followed by discussant Catherine Pettit. At 2 p.m., John Evald and Tori Velkoff will present managing privacy loss budget for the 2020 census, followed by discussant Kunal Talwa. After your 3 p.m. break, Allison Plyer will lead the committee discussion and formulation of recommendations until we end at 5 p.m. The bus leaves at 5.15 or 15 minutes after we end. Other matters, as a reminder to the audience, during the question and answer sessions occurring today, only committee members are permitted to ask questions or make comments. The public will have an opportunity to comment tomorrow on Friday at 11 a.m. during the time set aside for public comment. If anyone plans to give public comment, please leave your name at the registration desk. If you have comments that exceed two minutes, please submit your comments in writing at the registration desk for the record. Finally, due to federal guidelines governing meetings and conferences, the refreshments provided off of committee members only. Now let's please welcome Allison, who will uh, give remarks and introduce committee members. Allison Plyer. Yes. Start by saying my name. 
Um, so good morning. It's my honor to welcome you all again to the um, CSAC meeting, spring 2019 this time. We're excited to have Dr. Dillingham here with us. Welcome to your first CSAC meeting. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, and um, I always like to restate the purpose of the Census Scientific Advisory Committee. It's to provide scientific and technical expertise to address Census Bureau objectives and programs. And the expertise among the committee members is really varied, and so uh, it's not surprising that we're really eager to support census on a wide range of topics. Um, so maybe we should start with, by going around the room and introducing ourselves, and if everybody could say their, um, their name and their organization, and maybe a sentence about your research or your work. It would be great, but let's start with Jack again. Sure, um, Jack Levis with UPS. Um, I'm, I'm responsible for all of our um, technology uh, for final miles. So everything that might touch one of the brown drivers you see, that would fall under my umbrella. Jessica McKellar, I'm the CTO of Pilot, uh, which is a automated bookkeeping firm. <laughs> I'm a computer scientist by training. Hi, my name is Mario Marazzi. Um, for about 10 years, I was executive director of the Puerto Rico Institute of Statistics. <laughs> Um, I'm an economist by training, and I've been working with the Census Bureau on a whole host of uh, projects for the past uh, six or seven years. Uh, good morning. I am Juan Pablo Urcal. I'm a computer science professor at the University of Iowa, and my area of expertise is human-computer interaction. Uh, good morning. My name is Jeff Lauer. I uh, work for a company called IIC Technologies. Uh, my area of expertise is uh, geospatial, um, remote sensing, and GIS. And I'm Allison Plyer, um, and I'm with the Data Center. The Data Center um, uses data to um, inform a common understanding to, inf to propel disaster recovery. And now we're looking at kind of shifting our gaze to resilience so that data can help um, our whole region be resilient in the face of any shock. Uh, I'm Kunal Talwar. I'm a research scientist at uh, Google. I'm a computer scientist by training, uh, and I, my area of speciality is uh, differential privacy and machine learning. Hi, I'm Jay Bright. I'm a professor of statistics at Colorado State University. I'm a mathematical statistician with particular interest in survey methodology. Hi, I'm Kathy Pettit with the Urban Institute. Um, I am a public policy city um, policy researcher and also have a particular interest in neighborhood level data and um, community use of data. All right, thank you all. Um, first, I want to thank the committee for being here. I know it's a substantial uh, chunk of your time and really appreciate your dedicating that to the Census Bureau. Um, I also want to echo Tommy in acknowledging Tara and the need, and also Tommy, for, for all the work that they do to put together um, these meetings. Uh, the government, partial government shutdown really put CSEC activities on hold for a while, and as soon as the government reopened, they just sprang into action um, and didn't miss, miss a beat, which was incredible. Um, I also want to acknowledge them that they really heard uh, the summary of CSEC interests and made sure that um, several of those topics are on the agenda this time, including the 2020 census products and disclosure avoidance. So uh, we really appreciate that. They've responded to our request to get materials to discuss as well in advance so that we could make meaningful comments. And um, they've worked really hard to have the census presenters include questions, um, including you know following up and, and, and really pushing for those questions. Um, so I just really want to acknowledge um, all of the work that they've done in response to to our requests, um, they they are fantastic. All of you. And then Tommy's going to help me make sure that the census presentations are kept to the 20 minutes, so that we have enough time for committee discussion. Because we know that's um, that's what we're here for. Um, I know uh, Tara, we're going to have a dinner tonight um, at uh, McCormick and yes. Schmidt, right near our hotel. Is that right? That is correct. We'll be sending around a sign-up sheet this morning for everyone to to RSVP so we can have an accurate reservation. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so if you're going to be there, it's it's not required. It's optional. It's pay your own way. Um, but I think several of the directors are going to join us. Will you be with us, Director Dillingham? Yes, excellent. Very good. That'll be fun. So hopefully everyone can be part of that dinner. Um, 
Just a reminder, we'll need seven members for a quorum tomorrow, um, so hopefully everyone can stay until two. Um, we will have Ken Simonson at dinner tonight and present tomorrow, and both Peter Glynn and uh, Krishna will be calling in um, at various points and certainly for the final discussion so that they can be part of um, that quorum. Um, Dr. Dillingham, when I was asked to be chair last fall, I took the opportunity to talk to all of the members one-on-one -on -one to find out their priorities and um, I thought it might be helpful to reiterate what some of those are so that you're aware. There's been, um, there's some concern about having sufficient budget for, um, for the business and economic series, um, as that's gotten squeezed a bit perhaps. Um, there's interest in ensuring the Census Bureau is really using the most up-to-date technologies writ large, which um, a lot of folks here have expertise on. There's interest, as you can imagine, in data for disaster recovery, um, making sure that it's timely and more frequent um, because there's a lot of uncertainty during after disasters for many years. There's a lot of flux and data can help spur investment. Um, there's interest in the usability of the web interface for the 2020. We really would like to see that interface um, and hope that that'll be um, on, a, on, a, on an agenda soon. <coughs> There's interest in providing input into evaluations to take place after 2020 is complete. Um, we a briefing on the CPEX program for um, 2020 would be great. Um, looking forward to the 2030, some folks really like the idea of exploring the possibility of a census of people rather than a census of households, um, which is something that's been battered around. So that might be a topic for an upcoming meeting. And of course, everyone on the committee is concerned about the citizenship question. Um, we know, and I'm sure you all saw the um, study from Harvard that just came out um, this month that it's estimated to cause, the citizenship question is estimated to cause an undercount of about 4, 000, 4 million Hispanics in 2020. So um, one thing that would be interesting as the census is acquiring new data from USCIS to have an update of the census's August 2018 study of alternative citizenship data sources. And then also following the 2020 enumeration, we'll be interested to know what the census plans to do to adjust annual estimates for any undercounts. Um, you know, the estimates, of course, uh, drive many federal funding decisions, um, but also innumerable business decisions nationwide. And businesses are super eager to know that the estimates um, will be as accurate as possible. But most of all, the most important thing everybody said is that they want to know how they can be most helpful to the census. Um, and so my goal really as chair is to determine how we can be of most assistance given the structures that the CSAC has. Um, so I'll continue to raise that, questions, that question and work to find ways that, that we can be most helpful. And one tool I really want to encourage the use of is working groups. Um, a working group is a tool we have for engaging more deeply with the census around any particular topic. It might involve like monthly one-hour conference calls where we interface with um, subject matter experts. Um, so um, CSEC members, if there's a topic you would like more engagement around, I, I want you to consider whether a working group makes sense and if you're willing to serve on the working group. And you can include that in your recommendations that we pull together in the next few days. And then I hope the census will approve some of those working groups so that we can um, be of greater assistance. So without further ado, please allow me to turn it over to Director Dillingham. Allison, thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to meeting all the members of the very distinguished advisory committee. And I want to thank them particularly for the uh, uh, bringing to the spring meeting here spring weather. So that, that's, a, that's a good sign. Um, the, uh, let's see here, I have uh, some abbreviated comments that I, I want to deliver, but uh, here we go. I want to thank everyone for coming to the headquarters here at Suitland and uh, in participating in these discussions. And I really like the format that Allison just described, where there's this interaction and sharing of ideas and knowledge. I have reviewed the uh, list of the members of the committee, and I really want to commend the, the committee on its expertise. And uh, in addition to your willingness to come here and share your thoughts uh, with, with the Census Bureau and to make, uh, help us make decisions, your contributions are certainly very much appreciated. I'd also like to thank everyone who's watching the media via our webcast on Census Live. I'm very pleased that we can use this technology to reach uh, uh, a number of stakeholders who cannot meet, uh, make these meetings. 
Um, and uh, today what I'd like to do is maybe quickly introduce myself and share some thoughts about the exciting work uh, here at the Census Bureau, some of the uh, important recent developments and innovations regarding the uh, 2020 Census, and some of the challenges that lie ahead. Uh, first, by way of background, it's an honor for me to be here at the Census Bureau. I, I consider it the, uh, well, I don't consider it, it is the federal government's largest statistical agency, but I consider it the premier statistical agency. Uh, and it's an agency where statistical expertise and integrity is a tradition. I previously directed two smaller statistical agencies, and I enjoy that very much also, but I could not imagine a more exciting and rewarding organization to be associated with in the Census Bureau. The many professionals here are extremely dedicated and widely respected in the government and within their numerous professional associations. Unquestionably, the talent levels are high and the accomp accomplishments here at the Bureau are highly visible. Now, the importance of the Census Scientific Advisory Committee, uh, as director, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to working with each member of the committee, a very distinguished group, as well as our partners, stakeholders, and community leaders who stretch across the nation. As advisory committee members and others understand, we rely on the many stakeholders, organizations, and communities for support. In the weeks ahead, we will continue to work as a team to ensure that the advisory committee vacancies continue to be filled with highly qualified individuals, and when the process is complete, we anticipate welcoming some new members this fall. As a group, I know the advisory committee is committed to providing expert advice, as Allison explained, to support the Census Bureau and its mission, including the agency's continued performance on unique leadership uh, to the statistical community, to the nation, as well as the constitutional and statutory responsibilities. The Census Bureau continues to perform a plethora of, of programs and, uh, and activities and surveys and censuses that are vital to the people and economy of our nation. And I will provide a few highlights of some recent important work that we're doing in preparation of the 2020 Census, and Al will be glad uh, uh, to spend a lot of his address uh, giving you more detailed information. And if you have the opportunity, either at dinner tonight or, or wherever, uh, he has, is a wealth of information and uh, would love to share it with you. First, let me mention the April 1st event that will be occurring on Monday. With about one year to go until Census Day 2020, we are dedicated to ensuring that the workforce is ready, willing, and able to accomplish the mission of the 2020 Census, which is to count everyone, to count them once, and to count them in the right place. If you haven't replied to the April 1st uh, one-year-out event next Monday, I invite you to do so, if at all possible. I look forward to seeing some of you there at that event. We are. All now actively engaged <clears throat> in preparedness assessments and risk planning with regard to the 2020 census. Our, our systems and operations are being constantly tested and assessed. We are where we should be, consistent with our plans. While agency plans, staff, and resources are being constantly mo monitored, I can attest that progress is underway in meeting future challenges and needs. The 2020 communications campaign Counting everyone at one time is a massive undertaking, and we start preparing earlier than ever. The uh, 2020 Census advertising and promotional campaign is well underway and on track. We are building the messaging and creative products now, and we will be, you, you will be seeing uh, some of the pr first promotional uh, materials soon. In addition, our advertising will launch in, in January 2020, and again, there'll be the unveiling of some of this, uh, at least the prelude to it at the April 1st event. The communications team includes the Bureau staff and our primary communications contractor, as well as subcontractors. The teams are working on developing the creative messages for the campaign, which are laser focused and geared to reach those who are hard to count. We're investing valuable time and resources in the advertising campaign, outreach, and media. With the release of the tagline, Shape Your Future, Start Here, we are very optimistic about the communications work that's being done. This tagline, along with the communications platform, is based on rigorous research. The team worked closely with our communications contractor to identify and evaluate lessons from the Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivators study, which you hear by the acronym CBAMS. This research assists our campaign in effectively communicating that when people respond to the 2020 census, they are helping to shape their future 
and that of our communities and nation. The creative team's multicultural agencies have participated every step of the way and validated the tagline's effectiveness in various languages. It was tested in focus groups around the country. We encourage stakeholders to use it in print, digital, social media, TV, radio advertising, and communications. The CBAM's findings also help us to strengthen the messaging and creative strategy for the 2020 promotional campaign and to increase self-responses. You will hear details later uh, from Maria and Kendall um, this morning on these topics. The complete counts, uh, count committees. Um, ultimately, the success of the census depends on everyone's participation. An important way to help is through the creation of state complete count commissions or committees, uh, whichever name the state chooses. Uh, these commissions encourage state residents to participate in the census in many ways tailored to their own state and local needs. Mm -hmm. The commissions enter into formal partnerships with the Census Bureau and provide structure for reaching state populations. States often pass legislation or resolutions encouraging grassroots participation. They host promotional events and display census information, including in government buildings, uh, even on customer billing statements, and in other types of correspondence. Commissions and committees help to provide valuable networks and to ensure everyone is involved. They champion the 2020 census and often provide funding for outreach. Now, the census hiring and recruiting updates. The 2020 recruitment activities are well underway. As Al will explain, we are actively recruiting for the growing number consistent with our plans. While agency plans and staff are constantly uh, being assessed, uh, we uh, uh, engage in hiring the people that are needed, and some of the uh, 2020 census operations will begin in late summer. During the 2020 census, we will hire an estimated 500,000, it's a moving target, or perhaps more people for temporary work. Census jobs are, offer good competitive pay. More than 200,000 applications already have been received. For the 2020 census, we're anticipating the hiring of 1,500 partnership specialists who will be deployed around the country. We hire partnership staff locally to engage with community leaders and to be trusted voices, especially for hard to count populations. The special 2019 census testing. In June, we're scheduled to conduct a 2019 census test. Uh, the test will measure the operational effect of including citizenship question. The results of the test will be used to inform operations and also the integrated partnership and communications campaign. Other improvements and innovations. Let me mention some that, uh, of the upcoming census innovations uh, and efficiencies uh, which I think are, are, are greater and more expansive than ever before. Among the many 2020 census innovations are new and improved cybersecurity safeguards, new technologies and options for responding to the, Senate, to the census, including the use of the Internet and of using the phones, re-engineered address, uh, address canvassing, uh, including the use of aerial imagery, more efficient non-response follow-up processes, expanded use of administrative and third-party data for verification, more language assistance and guidance is being offered, and more partnerships and specialists are, are being uh, deployed. Rigorous performance and scalability plans and testing is also underway. Those are just some of the highlights of some of the innovations, and it was mentioned that uh, in one of the recommendations that would be good to document some of these innovations and some of the experience for future census, particularly, particularly you mentioned 2030. In conclusion, many exciting things are underway at census. I am very optimistic about the path ahead, knowing full well that new and significant challenges will face the Bureau. I fully appreciate and expect that we will continue to achieve dramatic results in new, effective, and efficient ways. Most importantly, we will maintain organizational and professional integrity. Census data underlies services and products that serve as the backbone of our nation's statistical data system, including for the many purposes you mentioned and, and the, the emergencies that the country experiences, and they're vital to evidence-based decisions and policies. On behalf of everyone at Census, I want to thank you all who have committed to active participation on the Census Scientific Advisory Committee. The Census Bureau appreciates the valuable time you devote and the collaborative advice you provide. 
We are looking forward to many fruitful discussions that lie ahead and for the special opportunities to share ideas and information to provide better data and to promote a better and brighter future. Thank you. I'd now like to turn it over to a familiar face here, Ron Charman, who was the acting director and, and the current deputy director, who has some remarks about the uh, uh, advisory committee and uh, the Census Bureau. All right, thanks, Steve, and good morning, everybody. So I, I'm just going to warn you, if you see me nodding off here um, tomorrow morning, it's because I'm staying up late to watch my Ducks beat Virginia in the Sweet 16 tonight. So uh, go Ducks. Um, so I just want to give a few uh, remarks on, uh, on the budget. Um, but first, um, you know, uh, Allison mentioned um, the shutdown. So d during the lapse of appropriations, um, and the government shutdown, we were able to keep all of our preparations for the 2020 census on track because uh, we were able to do it because Congress appropriated a, a billion dollars of, of uh, extra funds um, in case of such a contingency, I think, um, in FY18 that we were able to utilize um, to keep all of our 2020 operations up and running and keep our uh, progress towards, um, you know, a year from next Monday. Um, in, in progress. Also, we were able to keep um, the operations for several of our reimbursable surveys um, uh, up and running because several other agencies did get an appropriation or they had um, money that, that could be used to, to keep those up. So things like the current population survey stayed in the field. However, uh, many of our other surveys, the American Community Survey, the Economic Census, all of our economic indicator programs and, and the SIP um, were, were put on put on hold during the shutdown. Um, kind of importantly on the, on the economic indicators because those, um, they, they come out either monthly or quarterly. Um, th they are the most sensitive to a shutdown in operation. So just let me give you a, a couple updates on, on that. So, um, you know, obviously we, we were not collecting data during, during the shutdown and uh, given the timing, um, the November data, we were able to release more or less um, you know, un unperturbed um, once, the, once the shutdown was, was done. Um, but we had to sort of re-strategize um, many of our other um, indicators starting with the December data or, or other quarterly data. So we, we came up with a plan um, that we discussed with uh, stakeholders at OMB and the Council of Economic Advisors and other um, important areas to sort of to get back on a schedule. So I think the, the first survey that'll be, that'll be back um, back online um, will be our construction uh, indicators, um, and then we'll, we'll get our international trade and goods uh, back on track by, uh, with, with the April statistics that we'll release in, in early June. Um, so in any case, you know, this, this was a, a big disruption. There was some, some press uh, out there about whether the shutdown had anything to do with, with how the numbers were coming out. Um, you know, our analysis indicates that that, that is not the case. Um, so, um, you know, December retail sales were, were down. Um, they were down because that's how the, the survey indicated they were down, not because of any issues that we had uh, with, with the shutdown. Um, you know, we, we've had to work um, very closely with, with our colleagues in, in Canada on, on trade statistics. So, you know, a, a U.S. government shutdown has implications for stat agencies outside of the country because we have a data sharing agreement with, with Canada where, where we each use our respective import data as the, other, as the other's export data. Um, so we, we've been able to get all of that um, sort of back, back on track. So um, now just turning to the budget. So in our FY19 appropriation of about $3.8 billion um, fully funds our request for the 2020 census. Uh, enables us to do all of the, the preparations, including our first major field operation, address canvassing, which will start uh, here in a couple months. Also, the progress towards opening our 248 area census offices mm -hmm. and hiring our partnership specialists and, and, and office staff. Um, so we're, we're very pleased to, to, be, to have a budget and to be moving forward um, with all those preparations. Funding also uh, uh, provides for the scaling of our IT infrastructure and, and for printing materials. Um, we'll be printing, I think, something like 1.5 billion pieces of, uh, 
Or is that 1.5 billion pieces of mail, or is that printed materials, Al? Printed materials. 1.5 billion. Yeah, it's, postcard letters and yeah. forms. It's a lot. So that's a billion with a B. So um, so and and we're you know we're on path. Uh, you know you might have read about our our uh, issues with our with our print contract, but I think we we are uh, good to go in that area. Um, but the appropriation also funds uh, our monthly, quarterly, annual demographic and economic surveys, and so I, I think everything um, you know we're, we're you know. The shutdown is over. We're back uh, in business and, and, and moving forward. Turning to the 2020 budget, um, that's $7.2 billion, um, or a $3.3 billion increase. Um, this includes a billion dollars I mentioned before, and that, that was appropriated in FY18 that we could use through 2020. Um, so $6.3 billion of that will be for the 2020 census. Um, we also have uh, $83 million in funding for our uh, SEDCAP program, uh, which we've discussed here before. Also, um, uh, $65 million to transform our, our data dissemination systems, um, but, uh, and 100, almost $140 million to continue um, with the dissemination of our products from the, from the economic census and census of governments, and then uh, $561 million for our monthly, quarterly, and annual economic and, and uh, demographic surveys. Um, importantly, our, our 2020 budget uh, it, I will support a complete and accurate 2020 census, um, including all the, the self-response and non-response uh, follow-up operations, um, as well as beginning to process the data uh, towards the end of the fiscal year. Uh, it supports an integrated <laughs> communications campaign that will reach all, all, of, all Americans many times. Um, and especially focusing on, on hard to reach um, populations. Um, but at the same time, the budget will, will support all of our other uh, work as well. And just to try to finish up, I won't go through, through all these things, but uh, you know, we'll be finishing up the releases from the, from the 2017 economic census, um, which will be critical for um, the Bureau of Economic Analysis to, to uh, re-baseline uh, the national income and product accounts um, that's a sort of an important critical step in, in the nation's economic statistics. So with that, I'll try to end this session a couple minutes early so we can turn it over to Al for 2020 updates. So, Yeah, we can do questions. Tommy Wright, are there any questions or comments to Steve or Ron? Anyone? All right. Very well. Thank you, both Steve and Ron. We do have uh, several traditions at the Census Bureau, and there's one I hope we can continue, and that is often to the person who sits to my right on this committee. We welcome them, and we congratulate them on uh, accepting this uh, uh, huge, I'm not going to frighten you but huge responsibility for helping ensure that our democracy continues, uh, helping to measure the, the condition of people and businesses in the country. And that tradition is to give that person a thunderous applause. We gave him an applause earlier for his comments, but he needs a thunderous applause. I, I appreciate it very much, but you know, uh, uh, everything here is a team, a team effort, yep. and I just happen to be seated in the middle of the team, and uh, so I, I want to thank the entire team here at Census uh, and our stakeholders that support us outside of Census, but uh, uh, I also want to thank the team, myself, and, if, and those of you that are here for such a great job, and uh, as, you, as the day goes on, you'll see that the wonderful, magnificent, and important contributions they're making to the federal government and to the nation, so and to your community. So, so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tommy Wright, as Ron mentioned, we are on schedule, and now we will uh, hear from Al and Michael, who will present on the update on the 2020 census. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, thank you, Allison, for your opening remarks. Thank you, Director Dillingham. Dr. Jarman, for your introductory comments. 
I would like to start off by figuring out how to turn it on. Okay. I would like to start off with our timeline, which shows where we are now and where we're going. But before we begin to discuss the wrapping up of our planning operations and transition into the execution phase of the 2020 census, I want to provide you with a brief preliminary look at some of the analysis we are beginning to do from the 2018 end-to-end -end census test, and then move through some of the decisions we've made as a result of lessons learned from the test. I will also touch on some of our upcoming milestones. As we have indicated in prior meetings and in our program management reviews, the preliminary data from the 18 end-to-end -end field test showed approximately 52.3% of housing units self-responded during the census test. When that data is further analyzed, the data indicates that approximately 56% of the residents of Pop Providence were accounted for within housing units that self-responded. The difference when we're speaking about housing unit response rates, we're looking at housing units regardless of how many people live there. When we're looking at the housing population, we're counting people in the house. For example, a housing unit that has five people will be only counted once when we look at a housing unit response rate, but when we count people, those five people will be counted as five people who have responded. Please note the primary objective of the end-to-end -end census test was to evaluate our systems and the capabilities of the systems to perform successfully and integrate effectively with each other and to evaluate their functionality when being operated by real people in a real field environment. Additionally, the test served as an opportunity for us to evaluate our field management capabilities, procedures, and tools. The test was very successful in both areas. The systems proved that they could successfully operate together and gave us several areas that we listed as lessons learned that we could refine and improve to optimize our performance. I will talk about some of the, or Michael will talk about some of those a little bit later. We are beginning right now to complete phase three or so of our scalability operations, start, start. starting four as we're looking to spend 19 ensuring that the systems that work in Providence can scale to handle the entire country. We also learned some lessons that helped us design better field operational procedures, and I will discuss those later in my presentation also. The test did not have media or partnership components, so we recognized that opportunities and requirements to use our media and partnership programs during the census to effectively focus on demographic segments that had a propensity to underperform in the test and in prior tests in the decade and in previous censuses will focus, be a focus for us in 2020. Also, I'd like you to please note that the data I'm going to share with you is very preliminary data that we're still in the process of reviewing and editing. It is from the census's unedited file and it's for operational assessment purposes only. When we're looking at response rates by demographic characteristics, all the percentages have been rounded to the nearest whole integer and the total population has been rounded to the nearest thousand. You'll also see categories identified as blank. Those are categories that we have not yet been able to perform edit and imputation activities related to them. Do not attempt to necessarily project some of this preliminary data to the nation as a whole. It gives us some indications of areas we need to focus on as we get into research, and it validates some things that we have learned from prior testing and from actual prior censuses. This slide talks about the percentage of self-response and the percentage of NERFU, or non-response follow-up, for each race. Let's look how people were enumerated during the 2018 test. The total household population was approximately 571,000. Again, for disclosure avoidance reasons, we've rounded that number to the nearest thousand. This graphic shows the way people were enumerated during the test as self-response, NERFU, and other. Other includes coverage improvement. Now, coverage improvement is an operation when we get data that is inconsistent. People will say, list five people in the household and send four names. 
or list four people in the household and send five names, or other data that's inconsistent, they will show themselves as being 12 and having four children. So we call up, we follow up, and the coverage improvement process clarifies that data. Some of the other areas in the other category include enumeration by administrative record. As I indicated before, 56% of the response data came from one of our self-response modes, internet, paper, or census questionnaire assistance, or telephone. When we specifically look at this data in terms of self-identified racial groups, we see that those who self-identified as white had the highest percentage of self-response at 68%. Those who self-identified as Asian had 59%, and two or more races showed percentages of self-response above the overall average response rate. On the other hand, blacks were at 39%, American Indian, Alaska Native at 44%, and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders all self-responded below the average response rates for the test. When we dive into the modes of self-response, we see overall those who self-responded, 65% responded on the internet, 29% responded via paper, and 6% responded over the telephone. When we look at how those groups self-identified in terms of race, we see that those who self-responded and identified as Asian chose to self-respond on the internet 75% of the time, which was the highest percentage of internet self-response by a racial group. Of the self-respondents that identified as some other race, 72% responded on the internet. The group with the lowest internet self-response was the American Indian Alaska Native with only 44% of those who self-responded as American Indian Alaska Native choosing to do so online. This was the only group that preferred to respond via paper based on the results of the Providence test. It's important to see that compared to self-response percentages, while white was the racial group most likely to self-respond, Asian was the group that used the internet most if they self-responded. Note that this analysis does not control for our male contract strategy. We know that there are some demographic and socioeconomic differences between areas designated for internet choice compared to internet first. We also know that the design of the internet choice strategy will result in more paper responses. We have to be always aware that there are factors that will influence people's use of the internet other than race, such as income, such as education, and such as the location and availability of Wi-Fi in their particular geographic areas. This is very preliminary data, so that's why I said don't try to use it to make a lot of projections, but it's helping us get some direction and some indications of things we need to look at as we move forward. Let's look from racial groups to Hispanic origin, non-Hispanic origin. As a reminder, you can see on this slide, 50% response came from one of the self-response modes. When looking at this based on Hispanic origin, we can see that people who self-identified as Hispanic, only 43% self-responded, among people who self-identified as non-Hispanic, 67% self-responded. When we look further at mode of response by Hispanic origin, we see that 68% of self-respondents that identified as non-Hispanic chose to respond over the internet, compared to 59% that responded as Hispanic. Again, we can see that while the overall self-response percentage was lower for Hispanic than non-Hispanic by almost 25 percentage points. When we look at the mode of self-response, we see that the gap in internet as a mode of self-response was less than 10 percent. Another way of saying that is while less than half of those who identified as Hispanic self-responded, when they did self-respond, it appeared that they preferred to respond online. Finally, let's look at the results by household tenure. That is, whether they own or rent property. The data here continued to validate one of our hard-to-count perceptions that renters are harder to count than people who are owners. Again, 56% self-response, as we would expect based on previous census results, owner-occupied households responded 
about 75% of the time on a self-response compared to 48% of the time for renter-occupied households. When we look at the individual modes of self-response for tenure, we see that the owner-occupied households, those that self-responded, did so online 69% of the time, compared to a total figure for all households of 65% of the time. Households identifying as rented that self-responded did so online 58% of the time. Similar to the previous slide, we see that while there was a significant gap in self-response, when people did self-respond, the rate at which the internet was the primary mode was much closer, with a gap of just over 10%. Now, having proceeded to go through that, I would like you to know that our staff is continuing to research the data, to refine the data, to apply uh, our normal edit and imputation processes, and we will have better data to show as we get further along but we promised that we would keep you in the loop as we started to see some of the data, so we wanted to give you this preliminary flash of the data. As you know, and as Dr. Dillingham mentioned, this is an exciting time for the 2020 Census. On Monday, we'll be hosting a live-streamed event at the National Press Club, one year prior to Census Day, where we're gonna be joined by several of our national partners to help increase awareness and get the nation in the mode to think about the importance of the 2020 Census. We're also prepared to begin infield address canvassing in just a few months. In August, we'll be in the field actually conducting the operation. In less than a year, the first enumeration will begin in Tuxic Bay, Alaska, and as you know, on December 31st, 2020, less than two years from now, the apportionment counts will be delivered to the President of the United States. One major accomplishment since our last CSAC was the release of our 2020 Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivators study known as CBAMs. Maria and Kendall will provide key information a little later in the presentation, so I'm not gonna duplicate their presentation here. Shape your future, start here. The United States 2020 Census. The communication team working in close coordination with YNR Advertising in, in Agency released our Census Integrated Communication Campaign Platform, Shape Your Future, Start Here. The message con conveys the importance and the impact of the 2020 Census to individuals, families, and communities over the next 10 years. As we mentioned in the last PMR, and as Dr. Dillingham alluded to, the 2020 Census Print Materials contract was awarded uh, to R.R. Donnelly following a competitive procurement process. R.R. Donnelly will be providing the majority of printing and mailing services for the 2020 Census. R.R. Donnelly, by the way, provided the printing materials for the 2010 census and for a great percentage of the materials in the 2000 census. So they're very experienced at working with census requirements, both of quality and timeliness. The print contract was the final major contract award for the 2020 census and marks a culmination of several years of hard work, dedication by our decennial staff and our partners, both inside and outside of the Bureau. As our print vendor, R.R. Dolly will be printing over three billion actually mailing pieces, including invitations, letters, postcards, questionnaires, covering every contact we make to households as we mail materials across the nation. We're gonna begin contacting households, inviting to them to respond on March 12th, 2020. For the 2020 census, we'll be using a two panel design We've used data from the American Community Survey along with information from the Federal Communications Commission to help us determine the likelihood of an area to respond online. We found that most areas, about 80% of the country, are areas that may have a propensity to respond online. So these households first receive a letter asking them to go online and complete the census questionnaire. We've designated this as the Internet First Panel. 
We'll also be working with the U.S. Postal Service to stagger the delivery of these invitations over several days. This way we can spread out the number of users responding online and be able to serve every respondent better if they need help over our telephone centers. Areas that are less likely to respond online will first receive a paper questionnaire along with their invitation in their first mailing. The invitation will also include information about how they can respond online or by phone with phone numbers for each of our 12 non-English language telephone centers. We have designated this as the Internet Choice Panel. We'll also be sending bilingual paper questionnaires in Spanish and English to areas with high proportions of Spanish speakers in both the Internet Choice and the Internet First Panel. We've defined high percentage and chose to send bilingual questionnaires to an entire census tract if at least 20% of the occupied housing units in the tract might require Spanish assistance. These are households in which at least one adult, 15 or older, speaks Spanish and does not speak English very well. Most importantly, on the fourth mailing, every household that has not responded to the census will receive a paper questionnaire. We will then send one final reminder postcard to remind people that it's not too late to respond, and it's important to remember that no matter which panel a household is in, Internet Choice or Internet First, every household will have the option of responding online, by mail, or by phone. On May 13th, we'll begin to follow up with in-person field visits to those addresses who have not responded to any of our self-response overtures. We recently delineated the type of enumeration areas which the census refers to as TEAs for the 2020 census, which determines how most efficiently we count people living in various parts of the country and how to invite them to respond. We have six type of enumeration areas. Self-response, historically we call that mail out, mail back. That's TEA 1. TEA 2 is update enumerate. TEA 3 are island areas. TEA 4 is remote Alaska. TEA 5 is military, and TEA 6 is update leave. These define the way we conduct the operation in those specific areas of the country and have meaning to our operations and field staff. However, this graphic simplifies the discussion by focusing on how we invite everyone to respond. Everyone will have the option to respond online, by mail or by phone. 95% of the households will receive their invitation to participate in the census through the U.S. mail via the mailing strategy I just discussed. Almost 5%, 4.9% of the households, those who do not have traditional mailing addresses, will receive their invitation when a census taker drops it off personally. These are the areas we call update leave. Less than 1% of households will be enumerated in person by a census taker instead of being invited to respond on their own. Those are areas we call update enumerate. These are areas that are very remote, very difficult to access, areas of remote Maine, areas of remote Alaska, and select American Indian tribal areas. I want to reiterate that everyone will have an opportunity to be counted in the 2020 census using one of our methods. Very exciting thing, building on the recently released TEAs is a TEA map which is available on our 2020 census website at www.census.gov backslash 2020 census. This map allows users to see the TEA delineation nationwide, drill down and see the percentage of housing units at each TEA all the way down to the census track level. As you know, our automated recruiting and assessment application has modernized our application, applicant hiring and testing process. Despite the challenges of hiring our workforce in a strong economy with very low unemployment, our recruitment efforts have been highly successful with over 280,000 applicants having created a profile using our online tool. Of those, over 220,000 have completed the skills assessment, far surpassing our goals. And despite this, we're going to continue to work very closely with our advertising agency and our advertising campaign with community partners to continue to aggressively recruit potential applicants from various categories such as students, teachers, homemakers, Uber drivers, retired persons, 
and people seeking part-time work so we are not dependent on a diminishing pool of unemployed workers in a time of very low unemployment numbers. We continue to make progress opening our Wave 1 area census offices. 37 of the 39 offices are currently ready for business. The remaining two offices will be ready within a few weeks. These are the offices that will be managing the address canvassing operation later this summer. The Wave 2 offices are scheduled to begin opening in June, and our goal is to have all of them open by the end of September 2019. All 208 of the Wave 2 ACOs have an occupancy agreement and lease awarded at this time and are at various stages of their internal development and build-out. The Census Bureau and GSA continue to work closely to ensure that all the tasks related to opening our ACOs remain on target. Yesterday, I met with the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of UNICES, who is providing all the internal uh, wiring and electronics for the offices, and he just wanted to express his commitment to making sure that we are on time. Um, they also provided some of that same infrastructure in 2010, so their experience with the census requirements. <laughs> Um, Steve talked a little bit about state com level complete count committees or commissions, and we have them underway in 46 states right now, including Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. An additional four states are currently considering forming those commissions. But I might comment that in all the states that do not have a state level commission, there are commissions at the major city levels, or major county levels, or with social organizations within those, community organizations within those states. Um, in addition to those state complete count committees, we have over 1,500 local complete count committees established nationwide, including 53 tribal complete count committees. In addition to the complete count committees, we have over 7,700 active total partners and have completed over 10,000 partnership events nationwide already. We're continuing our efforts to hire 1,500 partnership specialists by June 30th, 2019. So far, we've hired over 652 partnership specialists toward that goal. Finally, our national partnership program continues to build on our list of keystone partners. So those are national partners who can have local impact and local influence, such as major corporations, uh, major charitable organizations, and major community organizations. As we announced our last PMR, the decennial census has completed the final update to the 2020 census operational plan, which reflects our final design for the 2020 census and incorporates lessons learned from the 2018 census test. This update covers all operations required to execute the 2020 census, starting with pre-census address and geographic feature updates and ending once the census data products are disseminated. Two of the most notable changes in the final version of the operation plan are changes we have made to our use of administrative records during NERPU and our phase strategy for the final field operations and non-response follow-up. Due to some of the observations made during our 18 tests of the NERPU operations, we've updated our strategy on the use of administrative records. For housing units modeled as vacant or non-existent, Enumerators will conduct one in-person visit to determine the status and attempt an interview if appropriate. If the attempt is unsuccessful but shows an indication that the housing unit is occupied, tricycles in the yard, active mode and maintain lawns, drapes on windows, things that would indicate that people are living in the house, the unit remains in the NARFU workload. If the attempt is not successful in enumerating the housing unit and results indicate that that unit is unoccupied, boarded up windows, signs indicating that it's unoccupied, or the unit doesn't exist, and the recent mailings have been returned by the U.S. Post Office as undeliverable as address, the administrative record status of that vacant or non-existent house will be used to enumerate that house. If census mailings are unsuccessful, are, excuse me, are successfully delivered, it will remain in an ARFU workload regardless of the results of the first attempt. 
for occupied households in not hard to count areas that do not respond but have very strong administrative records and cannot be interviewed after multiple attempts, we may incorporate those in our enumeration using administrative records data. I would like to emphasize that regardless of how ADREC models the housing unit, all housing units in the Norfolk universe receive at least one personal visit and at least six mailing invitations to participate in the census. I want to stress that we're applying rigorous quality standards to the application of administrative records, and we've been working on and researching this methodology all decade long. <coughs> we've also designed a phased contact strategy approach for NORFU with tighter assignment and management controls through the phases of NORFU. This three-phased approach begins with a full optimization of the NORFU workload to complete the easiest cases. We're using the Mojo Optimizer, we're optimizing routing, we're going at the potential best times, we're assigning cases based on people's ability to work at those particular times. The second phase, which we're calling semi-permanent assignment phase, we put the work in the hands of the best enumerators in the middle of the operation. Let me just talk the difference briefly. During that first operation, every night, the cases are redistributed by our system. They're swept off the handheld, they're redissembled at work based on tomorrow's assignment and those areas that are easier for them to work that next day. When we move to phase two, there are semi-permanent assignments, you get to work your workload and manage your workload. One of the things we learned in the 18 tests was that was important as we moved through the operation that people had a sense of ownership of their caseload. While in the first phase we have a target rich environment, the optimizer really works to give us the most efficient methodology. We need to move to a tighter process of control as we move through having less housing units and fewer enumerators so that the best enumerators are working the middle of the operation to get the best results. During the final phase, which we're calling closeout, that will include a very small proportion of the cases. Cases are extended, enumerators make an unlimited number of attempts, closing out cases when they get the minimal information we need to support apportionment. That is basically the operational review on where we stand with the 2020 operation. It concludes my update, and I'd like to turn it over to Michael Thiem, who will provide a brief update on our 2020 systems readiness. Michael? Yes, please. Good morning. Um, I'm glad to be back at CSAC after many years. Actually, this is my third census, but uh, first time uh, addressing CSAC, uh, which is actually one of my favorite committees to deal with because I think at the at the root of the census, we are scientists, and that's that's what I feel like. And I also, I, I kind of want to come to you in, with, with two attitudes. Uh, one is humility, and the other is, is confidence. Humility because it's a dangerous world, and there's little room for hubris in, in the IT, especially in the IT world. And confidence because all the signs are there. Um, we are, and, and we're reading them. So I'm gonna go through just a quick list of some of the things that, that we have learned from over the years. In June of 2015, OPM was hacked. In August of 2016, Australia had a denial of service attack. Uh, the Wanna Cry attack happened in May of 17. The Petya and not Petya attack, ransomware attacks happened in June of 17. Equifax, probably all of our data in this room was hacked in July of 17, Yahoo, actually it became clear in October of 17 that Yahoo was, it was hacked back in 2013. Um, and then most recently from, from my perspective, GitHub had a denial of service in February of 18, and a particularly virulent type of denial of service. The point in bringing all these things up is we learn from every one of these things. We, and we realize what's going on and we have a team here that's a professional team dealing with it. Um, I'm also going to talk about, uh, I'm going to actually, after that, I'm going to start talking about the 2018 test. I think, you know, we have the uh, shape your future start here tagline for the 2020 <laughs> census. My tagline for the 2018 census test was proved a lot, learned a lot. <laughs> so let me uh, get to my slides here. Um, this is actually, uh, I'm going to try to go quickly because I think we want to finish by about five till for 20 minutes for the... 
that's what I mean, five till would leave 20 minutes. For, is that enough or should I just go a lot fa even faster? Okay, this is, this is just our last operation for the uh, 2018 test, which is tabulation and dissemination. Uh, these are the systems involved with it. Um, it just sort of a, a, an informational slide. But this, going back to what Al said earlier about what we learned, these are all of the sort of uh, um, understandable phases of the test, which, which are analogous to the phases of the 2020 census. The gray colored boxes include the, all the big operations and the darkly gray colored boxes are all of the things we actually proved and learned about during those boxes. The pink box is the one we are still involved in and we are working through, which is dissemination and um, uh, doing our dissemination products. And, and that's really what's left. Um, we feel very good about the 2018 test. It was very successful. Like I said, we proved a lot and we learned a lot. Um, one of the things we learned is going into the 2018 test, we had a sort of a delivery bucket that said for every system in the census, of which there are 52, we have a schedule to deliver those. The, the problem is for the 2020 census, we only gave ourselves four buckets, which essentially put sort of a false pressure on the system teams. If, 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 every, if each of those buckets had the same delivery times, we had people delivering things in a place that wasn't really aligned with the operations. So what we did is, is we said, look, let's, let's look at the, our operations and see when our software is needed, when it needs to be tested, and actually break this up into a more logical and uh, from a development standpoint, a better way to deal with this. So now we have 16 what we call operational deliveries. Uh, we, they, these align with operations and software is built um, in time to test and be ready for those operations. This is just a, 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 I mean, a list of all of our operations. You can see the, the second and third columns there are the test readiness reviews and the production readiness reviews. When we get to the test readiness review, software is built. We test it for three months until we say it's ready for production and then we conduct the operation roughly um, a, a few weeks after production readiness review. Again, process. Uh, we've already hit our first three operational deliveries. The, the first one is um, early ops, what we call early operations. The next is address canvassing, and, and, then, and the third one is um, early operations, uh, recruiting and hiring, peak operations, recruiting and hiring, I'm sorry. Um, and these are some of the systems that are in those uh, operational deliveries. Um, I also want to bring your attention eventually to the last five slides of my deck, which actually have every one of the 52 systems described so that you can go back and see what the, all these acronyms mean. Um, but in the spirit of moving through, I just want to keep going. This, this uh, set of slides actually, or this slide I should say, is really just a, a demonstration of what we need to finish before we get to the 2020 census. Um, the things that we learned in the 2018 test, um, obviously, or many times anyway, had uh, new functionality capabilities that we needed to build, the, the um, non-response follow-up um, uh, approach that Al just described actually had software implica implications, and we call those our delta functionality between 18 and 20. We have to finish programming those, we have to test those systems, um, we have to do performance and scalability testing. I'm going to talk quite a bit about performance and scalability because I think that is where our biggest focus is right now, and that's where many people have their most, uh, from a systems perspective, they have a lot of concern. Uh, after we, uh, as we are doing our performance and scalability testing, we will final <coughs> finalize our cloud deployment architecture. Um, if we find out that something we built doesn't scale to the way we wanted it to scale, we might have to change how our cloud structure is set up. We might have to add more. We have to, we have to essentially employ our scalability techniques in the cloud, and that's what, one of the big reasons why cloud is so attractive for something like the census. Um, we uh, threw out from the beginning, as I said when I started, we've been strengthening our security posture and that includes our partnership with uh, external agencies and um, the private sector organizations such as Facebook, Google, Microsoft, um, and, and other partners. And then finally we're going to deploy to the field, which means all of our area census, all of our 248 area census offices and six regional census centers will be uh, up and ready to run from an IT perspective and from an operational perspective. So, on to performance and scalability testing. I can't read that, yeah. <laughs> um, the important point about performance and scalability testing is that we, have, we, we need to know in advance how big our problem is. How many people will respond to the census? How many people in a given single second are going to be hitting our internet um, response uh, application. Uh, how, many, uh, can't, how many enumerators out in the field are going to be you know, hitting our servers from, from, an, from an iPhone? Uh, all of these things are um, 
demonstrated mathematically, scientifically in models that uh, have, have, we have developed over the last six years, starting with a MITRE uh, set of models that they, they gave us back in 2014, and we have been refining ever since. That, and they, they have to follow the evolution of our operational approach, and, and they really are the basis that say, okay, we think this is what's going to happen in the census, so this is what your system has to handle. Um, we, uh, those have been vetted by all of the people that are in the operations, and, and we believe those models are, are valid and, uh, and proven, and will be proven. Um, these next two slides really talk about the phases of our performance and scalability approach. Phase one is really a paper exercise where we uh, have expert architects and engineers who compare our models to what we've already built and say, this looks like it'll work. Phase two is a sort of a unit test. If, if for example, in our internet self-response, we are, our scalable unit, I call it, is a cluster of servers. We, we want to find out in phase two how many concurrent people can hit our, uh, our internet self-response application uh, with only one cluster. That gives us a figure that we can then scale over and over again to hit what our actual workload should be. Phase three actually uh, puts um, operations end-to-end. -end. We actually do uh, what we'd call a business thread through all of our testing so that we can see whether interaction between systems is affecting scalability. And then phase four essentially stacks operations on top of each other so we can do what we call a soak uh, to make sure that, that uh, we, we, we essentially try to break our systems with a, a maximum load and, and see where that is. Um, similar slide, this just shows our progress. In the interest of time, I'll say we're, we've gotten through all of phase one for everything. We're in the midst of phase two. We've started phase three. Very little in phase four yet, um, uh, but, uh, but we will get there. This is just a quick mathematical example of our, or, or that mathematical and operational description. So uh, let, let me just walk you through this. In our demand models for our internet self-response, we have projected with our models that 120,000 users will be hitting the internet self-response at any one time together. Um, a single internet self-response computer cluster in the Amazon GovCloud can comfortably handle 50,000 users, as, which, which is what we're proving in phase two. Uh, and so our initial ISR design provides for five times that capa capacity because we also have a model called the viral model that says we think the most we're ever gonna get is 600,000 people hitting that instrument at the same time. Still, we're not sure if that's true, but it, it seems like a pretty, you know, it's kind of like the, the Brooklyn Bridge approach. You build it five times stronger than you need it to be, and it'll last 100, 200 years. Um, as we go through the testing, phase one uh, confirms, uh, you, you can go across on the table, phase one, research compares design to industry benchmarks, and if that, if we confirm and adjust that, the resulting action is we stay with our design. Phase two, we test and confirm the capacity, as I said, and again, we either confirm or revise our cluster capacity. Phase three, tests the loads with interfacing systems, and again, confirms or, or makes this change, and then phase four, again, does this soak. So just a real quick mathematical, the, the next slide is just an example. We start out with a, with a model that says 600,000 is our viral model. Phase one says we need, so that means we need 12 clusters, and in the green boxes, we're saying that we're good. Phase two, again, verifies our models, says we're good. But once we get, and this is all notional data, once we get to phase three, we figure out that actually when we're stringing operations together, we can only support about 540,000 concurrent users. So we're gonna bump up our, the number of servers up to 13.3 in phase three in the Amazon cloud. And actually we're gonna go into the next phase, phase four, with 14 servers, uh, per, uh, 14 clusters, I'm sorry and uh, essentially uh, verify that we can hit our 600,000 um, uh, concurrent user workload um, if, uh, with, with what we've built. One of the questions from the discussant had to do with uh, elastic, our elastic capability to expand as we, as we are in operation. So what we have for ISR as an example, we will have another, uh, we, we, we don't really ever expect to hit 600,000 users, but just in case, we have another four clusters in the background ready and warm for, for if, we, if we reach 400,000. In other words, if for even 400,000 feels very high to us. But once we reach 400,000, we're gonna fire up the other four clusters and essentially have sort of a million concurrent user um, capability. Uh, so this is uh, just a quick walkthrough of that. Um, I, I hope I, I left enough time for, for uh, uh, discussion and questions and so on, but there's a lot we can talk about from the security perspective, from uh, from system readiness, from learning 2018. Um, we're ready to answer questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, and so Peter Glynn is our discussant, and hopefully Peter's on the phone. Hi, this is Peter here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Great. Everything's working. Okay, excellent. So I'm calling from California. I just want to say I'm sorry the personal circumstances made it difficult for me to join you at the census today. Um, thanks to Al and Michael for their excellent presentations on the state of the census. It's clear that a great deal of thought's already gone into advanced troubleshooting, but I thought it might be helpful to the census to do some additional thinking about uh, risk assessment and risk mitigation issues. So the remarks I'm going to be making here are primarily focused on these types of questions. Now, by the way, uh, because of the fact that the video online is out of sync with uh, my audio, about one minute out of sync, I think. Um, I'm going to be asking you to advance the slides. Yep. All right, so uh, maybe we can advance to slide number two. Yep. So slide number two has to do with, I think, one important uh, potential source of volatility with regard to the 2020 census, and that's the possible addition of the census citizenship question. So I'm already assuming that the census is doing some contingency planning in the event that the Supreme Court decides in June that the question can be added. So in view of that uh, contingency planning, I'm just going to suggest a few things that the census might uh, be uh, considering in terms of the contingency work that's already being done. So number one, obviously, is the question of what will the question actually be if the Supreme Court decides that uh, a citizenship question can be added. So in particular, I assume, does the census have a default question ready to plug in? I assume that the census is working on that question. Uh, another key issue I think to bear in mind if a uh, citizenship question is added is uh, there will be probably some significant variances in terms of non-response rates. And uh, the question, I think, is going to then arise as to how the census would uh, prepare for that or, for example, do additional post-processing of census data to try to determine how the addition of the question has affected response rates across both the general U.S. population across the states and across various uh, minority subpopulations. Well, uh, feeds into the question, next slide, feeds into the question of the apportionment issues. In particular, uh, I think according to the census schedule, the apportionment counts would need to be sent to the president in December 2020. Uh, in particular, uh, if there's significant large-scale non-response due to this, the addition of such a question, uh, there probably will be significant differential effects. So in particular, because the uh, number of uh, different minority groups and the uh, political posture of the states differs significantly. Uh, the question of non-response uh, could vary a lot from one state to another. Uh, that could potentially significantly complicate the apportionment uh, question. And, uh, you know, there perhaps are some things that the census can already be thinking about in terms of gathering additional data uh, with regard to the 2020 census uh, and there are other things that could be done in a post-processing form. Uh, probably the census wants to be thinking about all those different issues in terms of any contingency planning that's currently going on. There's also the issue of, <clears throat> you know, again, if the citizenship question is added, it's likely that uh, the level of non-compliance would increase dramatically, even relative to what the census is currently planning. In that case, uh, you know, there would be a need for a lot more follow-up, maybe even than the census is currently taking into account in its uh, planning and thinking for 2020. Then there'd be a question of whether the census actually has a budget and strategy for hiring any additional field enumerators that would be necessary to contact non-compliant households. Next slide, please. Uh, one other question 
that arises is, uh, again, if a citizen's question is added, uh, I think that there's certainly a possibility that there could be a mass movement in which individuals will decide as a matter of principle to not answer the citizen's question. And given that uh, the census is counting on a large measure of response to occur online, uh, that would then raise a question of whether the online census form would allow individuals to submit their form without answering every single question. Uh, if the answer to that is no, you have to fill out all the questions, uh, that could create uh, a lot of challenges in terms of online response. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Again, I think non-compliance is a significant risk factor for the 2020 uh, census. Um, so uh, one thing that I think is a potentially useful exercise to go through is the possibility of a non-compliance simulation. And I'm raising this in part because if there is a significant ramp up in non-compliance that one sees, it may be that it doesn't really become evident to the census until quite late in the process. So it could be in early 2020 that one sees that the political environment or whatever is such that the amount of uh, number of people that are likely to respond uh, has gone down significantly from what was planned and that there'll be a significantly greater need to do follow-up and various other such things. And you can see some possibility of this, I think, in the C-band results. These are going to be discussed in greater detail later today. Uh, but we can already see in that uh, discussion, in that uh, C-band's analysis, that uh, the public's willingness to respond to a census looks like it's dropped already dramatically since the 2010 census. And again, if the citizenship question is added, that'll add a lot of volatility to that number. So, you know, in view of the fact that a lot of this data may not, a lot of the uh, uh, non-compliance uh, issues and the uh, level of population non-compliance may not become uh, fully evident until quite close into the actual census itself, it might be useful for the census just to do a simulation of what it would do in that event. I think oftentimes these types of walkthroughs, these types of what-if simulations can often be quite helpful in terms of understanding what and how one might respond in that particular context. So in particular, if the non-compliance rates turn out to be, let's say, 50% higher than anything that the census has already planned for, that would give the census leadership some opportunity to think through how and whether it might be possible to adjust resources and protocols for non-response follow-up to take maximum advantage of the census resources and try to get the uh, amount of responsiveness up to the maximum possible levels. So next slide, please. The next slide focuses on the vulnerability of the census to cyber warfare. So we've already heard about some of the issues that can arise in that context with the census presentations. So that focus primarily, I think, on uh, uh, attacks on the cyber infrastructure of the census itself. But I also want to just point out another possible vulnerability to cyber warfare. And we have, of course, the 2016 election cycle in which foreign interference impacted people's faith in our elections. And there's also the possibility that the foreign powers might deliberately choose to manipulate the 2020 census through the use of social media, for example, to encourage non-compliance. Uh, that could potentially, in turn, undermine faith in the reapportionment process. And that obviously would represent some sort of national security issue. So uh, there was some indication in the presentations earlier that uh, there's been some coordination with other US government agencies and also with companies like Facebook and so forth. Um, that, again, could focus exclusively on the attacks on the census's infrastructure, cyber infrastructure itself. But I think it would also be useful to 
do some joint coordination with regards to uh, the potential uh, manipulation of social media to encourage noncompliance, similarly to what happened in the 2016 election cycle. So uh, the question here is, is the census taking such measures in coordination with these other agencies in cooperation with social media platforms, focusing this question primarily on the issue of uh, foreign manipulation as in the context of the 2016 election? Uh, next slide, please. So again, I'm focusing primarily on risk assessment and risk mitigation issues. One thing that uh, potentially is of concern is the fact that the number of test sites for the 2020 census was reduced from three sites down to one. And of course, the fact that the 2020 census was originally designed with the provision of three test sites uh, obviously had to do with the fact that the census believed that there would be additional experience and knowledge that would be gained from having three sites rather than one. So it's likely that some knowledge has been uh, lost or uh, is, uh, that the, the uh, level of certainty that one has about uh, how the 2020 census will unfold is uh, lower than it would have been if one actually had three sites that were running. And uh, the way that this additional uncertainty uh, will manifest itself in 2020 is something that would be, I think, potentially useful to think through. So things that in the 2010 census, one had a pretty good sense of how things would unfold because you've done three tests rather than one. Uh, this time around, you'll only have one test site to depend upon. Uh, one might think a little bit about the fact that some of the numbers that one uh, had a reasonably good handle on in 2010, maybe softer numbers this time around, and think through some of the implications of that with regard to the uh, planning for the 2020 census. Of course, that raises questions about whether there are other data sources that can be used as surrogates for the knowledge or experience that would have been gained through the two additional sites. Let's go to the next slide. So this has to do with end-to-end uh, -end testing. Uh, the end-to-end -end testing, I think, is a really fundamentally important part of the preparation for the 2020 census. It sounds like that's uh, going well. Uh, Full-scale system testing almost always exposes unexpected issues. And I'm sure that was also true of the 2018 end-to-end -end test. So presumably that identified various weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And we didn't hear so much about that in the presentation. Uh, it would be useful probably for us to hear a little bit about what was learned from the 2018 end-to-end -end test, what the weaknesses were, what the vulnerabilities are, and how the census is responding to those uh, newly identified weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the issues that uh, I think is a key issue and that was discussed also in the presentations that were just concluded is the dynamic scaling feature of the cloud apps. Um, it sounds like a significant amount of thought has been given to this dynamic scaling feature. It is a key issue for the architecture of the 2020 census. Um, it does sound like uh, the census is doing all of the appropriate things with regards to thinking through how effectively and how quickly that part of the architecture can be scaled. Um, it's particularly important probably to be thinking about what happens at the high end of the scaling. So and that's probably uh, the, the um, environment in which it's hardest to actually physically test the scaling feature. So. This is something where it sounds like the census is aware of the issues that arise in this context, but um, thinking through potential additional tests that can be done, particularly at the high end of the scaling feature of these cloud apps, might be a useful thing to, to bear in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm a big believer in best practice and obviously there are many countries that do censuses, and uh, probably some of these countries have already moved into online data capture and the use possibly even of mobile phone technology on the part of enumerators. So uh, my 
my guess is that uh, these countries have had their own uh, issues with regard to rollout of these new technologies, how they, their populations adapted to this, how resilient and how robust the technologies themselves were. Uh, I'm assuming that the census is taking advantage of these uh, effective experiments that have been done by other countries. Uh, but if not, uh, certainly the census should be uh, in touch with censuses elsewhere to see what sort of unexpected issues arose in their deployment of these new systems. Last slide, please. The last slide is, uh, relates to the 2020 workforce. Uh, relative to some of the other censuses that have been conducted, we're currently operating at a historically low unemployment rate. So one could anticipate that this might have an impact on the nature of the workforce that the census is going to be able to recruit for 2020. Now, it, it does seem like the number of applicants is exceeding the levels expected, but there's also the key question of whether the quality levels of the applicants are what the census will need in order to be able to operate effectively in 2020. So uh, the, presumably, um, the census is not only monitoring the absolute numbers, but also monitoring the quality levels of the applicant pool. All right, so that's uh, all the questions and comments that I have with regard to the uh, 2020 uh, discussion. And uh, I'll leave the rest of the time to my fellow CSAC members. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, should we have census folks give some responses? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Peter, very much for your, for your items that you brought up in the discussion. I'd like to address a number of them, um, beginning with your first question in terms of uh, a plug-in default ready to go. Let me give you some um, quick idea of what we're doing as far as the question is concerned. The question that we're using, if we go forward with the citizenship question, is a question that's been tested and proven in the American Community Survey where we asked the citizenship question and have asked it for a number of years. So that is the question that's actually planned in. We have two sets of plates that are ready to go to the printer depending on the decision, one with the question, one without the question. The printer knows that when the Supreme Court decision is made, we give them the go. Uh, to start the process with the set of plates they're ready to use. Um, right now, the current Supreme Court has taken, has taken up the question in the week of, August, of April 23rd in terms of, of arguments on the question. They realize that we have a deadline on starting our print process. We need to start the print process by July 1. Um, Everyone has brought that to the court's attention. That's why they put it on the calendar. That's why they stepped over the appellate process and are going to respond on the question in this session of the court. This session of the court ends the end of June. And I've spent time working with the president of R.R. Donnelly to make sure presses are ready to run July 1st, depending on the decision that comes out of the court. Um, they go into recess, do not come back until October. <laughs> And in October, they know we're way past all of our deadlines, and so that's not a likely occurrence. So we are planning to do that. In, 20, in 2019, we have a 2019 census test that we are conducting with 480,000 uh, respondents, two panels, 240,000 with the census question, 240,000 without the census question. It is a test that includes all of our self-response modes, internet, phone, and mail. And we're measuring differences across the nation and by ethnic groups that we find in people's response rates to the question versus the non-question panel. That's designed to enable us to better plan our workforce planning for 2020. If we, depending on the variance that we start to see between the two panels, it gives us some triggers to planning um, our workforce ahead of the fact that we're already in the census doing it. So during 2019, during this late summer and early fall, 
we will have that test and we'll start to have data on that test. The test will be totally completed by October of 2019. So we're using that to plan around any variances in response rate that we can actually measure and not speculate uh, based on having a question versus a non-question. We can slice and dice that by ethnicities, by types of community, and have a good information base. As you know, the census is really focused on data-driven decisions, and this will give us a data-driven decision on how to actually plan. In addition to that, we've used risk-based planning to develop a contingency within our budget so that there are dollars in the budget that we can apply on a wide variance in response rate to be able to staff at a higher level if necessary within the, the approved, the presidential budget that is currently being reviewed by Congress that, that is within our program budget segment. So we are planning on what the cost may be with wide variation in response. The way the electronic instrument works, um, people come to a question. They're reminded to try to answer the question because obviously we want people to answer every question on the census to get a good quality census. However, there is no hard stop. If they do not answer a question, it allows them to proceed on through the questionnaire and submit the questionnaire with questions, all questions not answered. And that's the same for any question on there. So we, we allow them to skip questions and still submit their census questionnaire. So that is something we talked about, we understand, and we've looked at the implications for what the impact can be on that. Uh, just as a point of reference, in 2010, we did not have three census tests for, before the 2010 census. As a matter of fact, we never really completed a full equivalent of the 2018 end-to-end -end test because we were having technology problems, if you remember, with, with our instrument that we had planned to use for the 2010 census. So we have done a much more thorough series of testing in prefer preparation for 2020 than we actually were able to do in 2010, even though it was one site instead of three. And when you look at the objectives of the 2018 test, which were really making sure the systems were talking to each other, we think we had a very thorough learning on the systems integration and systems functionality in this one site, doing all the operations. We used 40 of our 52 systems during the course of the test to give us a real workout. Some of the systems we didn't use are things that are post enumeration kind of things, things like island area census and some of those, those systems that were not tested during the test, or things that were already up and running, such as a system that manage our frame, like LUCA and some of those activities. But the core systems for peak operations and address canvassing were run during the, and given a full exercise during the uh, 2018 end-to-end -end test. Um, we have used Monte Carlo simulation, to discover, to develop some ranges of risk in most of the elements in our risk register to plan uh, contingency funding within the budget around those risks. And so we are planning and very conscious of some of um, the potential things that you mentioned. As far as the quality of the workforce, as we got ready to put together our automated testing, we worked with a team of industrial psychologists and the Office of Personnel Management and redesigned a new skills assessment tool instead of the test we used in 2010. The people are taking that skill assessment tool online as a part of their process. So the 220,000 folks that are now ready to be in our pool have passed, taken and passed the assessment test. At this point, that's our only real indication of quality. Outside of the fact that I have numbered, noticed a number of the people, and I don't have the exact percentages, people are working on that for me, work for us in the 2010 census and some in the 20, 2000 census. And the offices have done a very good job of reaching out to all those people who worked for them in 2010 where we had over 600,000 people working for them and inviting them to participate in the 2020 census. So it gives us a really good indication that we will have a good quality workforce in 2020. I'm going to ask uh, 
one of our, my staff to comment on censuses elsewhere. Um, Deb Stomkowski, one of your team, or you are one of your team, come to the microphone and talk about our experience with our other countries and some of the things that they're doing. Hi, good morning. Nice to see everyone again. If I haven't met you, I'm Deb Stempowski, Chief of Decennial Census Management Division. I think Tom Cook asked me at this, this question, specific question at the last meeting. Uh, so in terms of how we're benchmarking uh, with our partners around the world, we are very active in a group called the International Census Forum, which is comprised of those countries that are uh, primarily English speaking. Uh, personally, I've attended the meetings and we've actually had um, some deep dives conversing uh, with the Australians. I think if you're familiar with internationally what happened with the internet, you'll remember uh, the challenges they had in their census and they've been partnering with us uh, as part of what came out of their experiences uh, and what they were required to do with their government in terms of risk management, contingency planning, et cetera. They actually uh, did a, a benchmark exercise with the other countries on that. So we have a fairly open dialogue. We're aware of the challenges they had and we're uh, definitely active in helping each other with successful implementation of the internet. I'm going to turn it over to Mike, Michael, Michael Thiem, and, and perhaps Kevin Smith, and they're going to talk a little bit about some of the cyber questions that were raised. Yes, actually, uh, Kevin, our CIO, uh, has uh, really led the charge on this with other agencies, so I want to turn it over to, to him to talk about some of the things we've done together. And, and also, there's another side of this question, I, too, I think, also, we might want to have a con communications view for maybe from Ali or, or Burton, if Burton is still around, about some of the things that our uh, advertising contract is working through and some of the capabilities we're forming with um, uh, other social media and so on. But so okay. Kevin. No, absolutely. So this is Kevin Smith, CIO of the Census. I'll start with this. So on number three, uh, the question about vulnerability to cyber warfare. We are absolutely aware of this. We have been working with the federal government as well as with um, industry players in this area. And we are right now working through the coordination of how to best take the federal intelligence community's current processes and procedures, which we're providing data to for them to look for foreign threats, look for foreign adversaries within social media or within direct um, threats to the census technology, and coordinate that with, as Michael mentioned, ADCOM is looking at the Facebooks, the Googles, the Twitters of the world to do a partnership campaign, but as well as a campaign with social media and how to, how to um, attack things that may happen in that realm. And we are actively right now working on how to best coordinate that over the duration of the census. And so I'll, I'll hand that to, to Ali as well. So yeah, um, like uh, Kevin said, uh, obviously social media, uh, the dark web, is a place that you can find, track, and get intelligence about uh, attacks on the system that we might expect uh, during operations. Uh, but it also represents a potential source of attacks on um, confidence in uh, the census, on uh, uh, the misinformation, disinformation campaign might never involve an actual sort of classic cybersecurity attack, um, but uh, a lot of the same bad actors operate in both spaces. Um, so with the intelligence community, with DHS, with um, tech companies, I think you saw a little bit of a preview of that and there was some reporting on some recent meetings we had with civic society groups um, and that Facebook hosted uh, at their offices and, and we had the other major uh, social tech media players um, convened there as well. Uh, we're working on a, on a comprehensive way to not only monitor for misinformation, disinformation, but obviously most importantly uh, have the ability for very rapid response and just making sure that we have the most proactive good news out there. Uh, you know, one of the main battlefronts we have is the search space too. And by the time we're uh, motivating people to respond to the census, the top thing that should come up when they Google census should be a safe place to get information about the census. Um, and not all of those will be ours only. There'll be a lot of trusted voices and partners too, uh, and also the instruments so they can respond. So uh, I just wanted to add another thing. We recently had a briefing on, on Capitol Hill with, uh, with uh, some of the Senate and, and uh, House staff where um, DHS uh, actually sat with us on the Hill and said that their two top priorities for 2020 are the 2020 presidential election and the 2020 census. So they are essentially right in 
in the in the boat with us. Um, and and again, this combination of humility and confidence is important here because we, we know how dangerous the world is. But we have seen, we have watched and learned from all of these attacks. So so we, you know something might happen that we will never recognize, but but we're aware of what has happened and how people have dealt with it and how we've been able to learn from it and how we've been able to prepare here at the Census Bureau for it. Uh, do other committee members have questions? Yeah, Kathy. Um, hi, and um, as I've been talking about the census uh, around- Can the you state your name? Oh, it's Kathy Pettit with the Urban Institute. Um, as I've been talking about the census with uh, people around the country, they're very concerned about the digital divide. So this information about um, internet response is really helpful. And the, um, I love the enumeration map that just came out. Is there a plan to um, release the data about which tracks will get the form, get the internet choice form um, versus the, um, the uh, you know, just the invitation to, to respond online, because that would be really helpful as people strategize about their outreach. At the present time, there is not a plan to release the information on which tracks will be internet first and, and which will be uh, internet choice. So we don't, do not have that plan, but I would comment as I've traveled around, I've also heard the concern about the digital divide. Normally, when we make sure everyone realizes that every person in the country who wants to respond on paper will have an opportunity to respond on paper and will have a paper form, that pretty much dissipates the concerns over not being able to respond on the internet. Yeah, we are printing over 140 million forms to ensure that we have enough forms if people want to use paper. And if they did not respond in the fourth mailing, they get a paper form. The fourth mailing occurs the week of April 12th. So it's shortly after Census Day. They will have that in their hands. Yeah, it's more about um, optimizing the outreach strategy and the messaging. Yes. So, and um, related to that, if, if the... Um, <laughs> As part of the end-to-end -end test, one of the questions, too, that we're talking about is uh, which of the ACS indicators of the new data, the neighborhood data that was just released on access to computers and broadband, um, which one of those is the best to use? Um, so if part of the Providence end-to-end -end test could be some um, analysis of how the Internet self-response correlates with those data and what the Census Bureau thinks is the best predictor indicator, that would be really helpful to us also. Okay. Yeah, uh, we agree, and we just aren't that far along in the analysis of the data from the 18 tests, but we absolutely agree that there should be some good correlations in some of the information that the ACS has collected and the 18 tests has revealed to us in actual practice. So can I just follow up on, on the exact point about um, how messaging and outreach will uh, help with the digital divide. I think online, by phone, or by mail is probably woven into the copy of every ad you're going to end up seeing. I can't promise absolutely every ad, um, but that's a critical part of the message. So safe, easy, and important online, by phone, by mail are the top messages we're trying to make sure everybody understands. So uh, I just want to make sure that phone doesn't get lost in the discussion, too, and that's something. Yeah. We're going to, we have decided early on, working with Al's team at Decennial, that promoting the phone option through the campaign is critically important because that's going to help us, um, you know, bridge the gap in a lot of places. Yeah, Jeff. Hi, uh, Jeff Lauer. Um, uh, going back to Peter's questions, I just wanted to, to follow up on his question number five and, uh, and ask about the dynamic scaling test. Um, and just get a little bit more information on how that's done and what was done and if it's all simulated or if there's some sort of real-time test or a little bit right. more so, information. So just to be clear, in the 18 tests, we did not test that scaling capability because it was a small, relatively small town um, and, and did, did, that didn't provide the workload that we would need to do that. So our four-phase scale, scalability, performance <laughs> and scalability testing does test that. There, there are many places where we made the decision. I mean, even when you do dynamic scaling, you have to sort of arrange it with your provider. So, so what we're essentially doing is, is essentially setting up warm uh, 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 expansion um, 
capability and testing that out during this, this performance and scalability testing. Um, that, that was the example from, inter I, our biggest concern is internet self-response, obviously. That's the one, that's our flagship data collection operation and it needs to work and it needs to feel good for people that are using it. And so that's, uh, that's, that's our big, uh, the, the thing that's being tested as much as anything in this census is being tested. I think the other part of that um, is that we actually have uh, gotten a, a way to, uh, Kevin actually has, has also led the, the charge on this, the, um, our, our ability to use Amazon in a new way for the trusted internet connection. Uh, which also increases um, speed and, and improves user experience. I don't know if, Kevin, you want to talk a little bit about that? or Yeah, I can, um, the Kevin Smith CIO census, so I can elaborate, too, from what Michael said. So specifically the questions like, did the dynamic scaling feature be tested? Was it tested in the 18 end-to-end -end test? It was not. But some of the numbers that Michael came up with from unit tests of the internet self-response tool were from performance tests we ran last year to determine within the cloud and within the architecture and design of what we've laid out, will this scale? And it demonstrated linear scalability. You keep adding a cluster, you get the same response. You know, if you're technical, there's a, a level of degradation at some point. We now know where it is. And we know how many clusters we need to put forth to meet the entire load need. That's fantastic. And so some of the things Michael said that were not tested last year, which we're doing the final levels of testing, is just testing it completely from the outside of the internet all the way through the system. We tested all the components inside the cloud that we were wanting to get early numbers on, and we're satisfied with the numbers we have, and now the final test we have is looking at, well, when people from your home computer go to the internet self-response site, what is the, the, uh, the uh, um, a rate of latency potentially that may be an issue? So we're talking about milliseconds here and there, but we're gonna test it to see so we know exactly what the user response is, and there may be some small tweaks we need from that, but uh, the core of the system is, is scalable, and we're confident in that. Right, and the loads are simulated from around the country, so you also have the last mile issues that we're trying to test for and so on and so forth. Yeah, one pop-up. Uh, this is Juan Pablo Urquette. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that we brought up last December, and I know we didn't come up with the recommendations until very recently for a number of reasons, but um, we had talked about the importance of uh, bringing up evaluation criteria for the 2020 census, ex basically uh, explaining how the quality of the census will be evaluated, how undercounts and overcounts are gonna be estimated after the fact, but making that criteria clear before the census 2020 is conducted and actually having a chance to get feedback on how that's going to be done from stakeholders, et cetera. And I know we had brief conversations last time where I know the plans are there, we just haven't had an opportunity to provide feedback on those and I think it will be very useful for everyone to do that. Pat is going to respond on that. Hi, uh, this is Pat Cantwell from Census Bureau. Uh, thank you, uh, Juan Pablo. Uh, we have a plans for the post enumeration survey in, in 2020, and for the most part, they are very similar to what we did in 2010. So, of course, we have uh, some other activities that we'll try to measure, such as uh, by modes of response, some things like that, but for demographics, for uh, states and the national national level, we have planned the same publications as in 2010. Is that the only way you all will evaluate the census, 2020? We also have an entire program of uh, uh, experiments and evaluations, and we'll be releasing at some point the, the uh, final list of those. Currently, they're being, uh, evalu they're, they're being investigated to see which ones we go forward with. Um, Juan Pablo might want to follow up on that, but um, that I just want to add that we also are going to do uh, the traditional demographic analysis that we've done for each census. So that's another way to evaluate the census. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm looking at Peter's, um, I guess it's his second slide or his third slide, where he's asking if the census has a policy and methodology to determine the differential effects of large-scale non-response across the states and take that into account in recommending apportionment counts, which I'm not sure anybody talked about. Uh, oh, that, 
oh, should I repeat the question? So his question was, does the census have a policy and methodology available to determine how the differential effects of non-response across different states would be taken into account in recommending apportionment counts to the president in December 2020? I didn't know whether the post-enumeration survey results would come out before the apportionment or that comes out afterwards. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, this is John About. Uh, one of the experiments that Pat just mentioned is explicitly an experiment designed to measure the differential net undercounts associated with the citizenship question. Uh, we haven't released the public details of that, that set of experiments yet, but when we do, it will be clear that we designed one. And that's the one that's taking place this summer. I think it's no, no, that's, summer. that is a self-response test. Uh, the CPEX experiments take place during the execution of the census itself, and it, it, there's a long history of doing this, so if you look in 2010, there's, uh, somebody in the audience probably knows the exact count, but there were quite a few. They're documented in, in public memoranda and, and uh, uh, show uh, what we uh, learned from them. Uh, one of the ones that's been most highly cited from 2010 is the uh, content uh, alternative content test that uh, tested various ways of asking race and ethnicity in alternative formats. So it'll be an experiment along those lines. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, just a uh, Kunal Talwar, CSEC. Uh, so just a quick uh, related question. So uh, it's conceivable that the citizenship question also affects how people answer the other questions. Maybe they don't respond to the ethnicity question or lie on it. And are there any plans to evaluate if there's any such effect happening? Uh, John About again, yes. There, there, there are plans to do a full th analysis. The uh, treatment and control haven't been determined yet because the Supreme Court hasn't uh, uh, issued an opinion. But uh, once you have the treatments and control uh, define. There's a full randomized design, so you can compare all of the aspects of the uh, uh, of the two. And the experiment itself goes all the way through non-response follow-up and subsequent response processing. So we will have all the outcome variables available. Great, thank you. Um, I know. All right, Mario. Just very quick, Mario Marazzi, CSAC. Um, if there's a lot of interest in the CPEX studies that are being uh, designed, uh, and that assuming that they're designed over the next couple of months, perhaps uh, one of the topics in the, in the fall meeting could be the CPEX plan. Yeah, we can definitely all do thinking. that. <laughs> there we go. We're all thinking alike. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. We are supposed to get our picture taken. Are we ready to move on to that? Yeah. People in the hallway. Sure. Michelle's up. Here. Stay here. Okay. Okay. So apparently we're going to stay right here. So we'll have a little break. Jack, do you have something? Yeah. Sorry. I, I just one question. I guess this is for Al. So we talked a lot about this. Is Jack Levis uh, talked a lot about systems. Talked a lot about the census. And you know, last meeting we said there's, you know, you really can't have in a meeting like this enough info to truly um, identify if the systems are ready or not. Right. That's your job. Al, I'm guessing if your job's anything like mine, you're saying um, if, if Michael gives you the ball, you'll run with it. So are you ready? I mean, is the <laughs> ball ready to give to you? What are your concerns? You know, you know are you ready to take it and run? Um, and is everything ready to go? Because we can't evaluate more than that. I just got to look in your eyes and say, are we ready to go? We are ready. I okay. actually had that same question asked by Senate staff and House staff <laughs> earlier this week. Are you ready to execute the census? We are ready. Uh, it's, it's a combined effort of the entire team, but working closely with the field division on their hiring and execution at their end. Uh, we're getting the systems moved in, and I have to worry about that equally. So yes, if that comes through, and, and we are seeing the results of our work uh, being manifested in the scalability testing um, I meet with all the primary uh, contractors that are working each aspect, including the technical integrator, and walk through every issue that they may be having. 
on a weekly basis at this point in the operation and normally on a monthly basis, and yes, we're ready to go. This is an art as much as a science, so I yes, trust you is. run with it, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Anything else? We good? Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you for the great updates. They're really helpful. Um, so we're going to get our picture taken. Members, please gather around the stage right there, and Michelle will take your picture and orchestrate how we're going to stand. Thank you. And also, please start removing your name tags.
People are great. We, we lost control over our side. <laughs> no, where's Tommy? <laughs> Tommy. <laughs> oh, he was wanted to get tea. That's only fair. That's right. That's fair. All right. <laughs> hold it up to Tori. So we went a little long, and we're going to try to make up a little time. I think um, Gina and Monica are ready to help us make up a little time, right? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Oh, I, Tommy says I can tell you to start. Go ahead. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you. So today we're talking to you about the 2020 Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivators Survey. Uh, the final report. Oh, I'm sorry. That title up there is incorrect. It's the study, survey, and focus groups report findings presentation. And I'm Monica Vines, and I'll be presenting with Gina today. So I'm going to start with a quick outline. I'll begin with an overview of CBAMs and move into our study design and methodology. Next slide, please. We'll look at key findings, including potential barriers and motivators to census self-response. And finally, we'll discuss 2020 CBAMs conclusions and recommendations. like developing psychographic mindsets and using those to profile our audience segments. Um, however, the primary and most exciting purpose is to inform and inspire the creative strategy. Ultimately, the goal of all of our work is to help increase self-response to the 2020 census. So by conducting a quantitative survey and qualitative focus groups, the research team sought to answer the four research questions you see here. Moving on now to the study, study design for the CBAM survey. We executed the 2020 CBAM survey from February 20th to April 17th of 2018. We mailed invitations to a total of 50,000 households across all 50 states and the District of Columbia. The questionnaire consisted of 61 questions. Adults 18 or older were eligible to participate by filling out and returning either a paper questionnaire or by completing the online instrument, and both of these modes were available in English and Spanish. A one to $10 prepaid incentive accompanied the first of five mailings, and note that we aligned our mailing strategy with that um, prepared for the 2020 census. And additionally, to help ensure inclusion, we oversampled Asians, Blacks, Hispanics, and other small sample races. Upon completion, approximately 17,500 people responded to the survey, and that corresponds to a weighted response rate of 39.4%. And I just wanna note, quickly hear that all numbers in our presentation do come from the CBAM survey data. And when we explicitly compare two numbers, it infers they are statistically significant. But when there's not a direct comparison, um, numbers may not be significantly different from each other. Okay, now um, survey des study design for our focus groups. So including focus groups in CBAMs was actually an innovation over the original CBAMs we conducted in 2008 to support the 2010 census communications campaign. This time around, we supplemented the survey by talking to groups not included in the survey, so that includes residents of Puerto Rico, groups that may not have had a large enough incidence for which to produce valid statistics, um, for example, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, and groups that are otherwise hard to measure via surveys, such as non-English speakers. So at about the same time as the survey from March through April 2018, the research conducted a total of 42 focus groups of 308 total participants with 11 audiences in 14 locations across the country. We conducted 16 of these focus groups in a language other than English, and those included Chinese, both Mandarin and Cantonese, Vietnamese and Spanish, both mainland and Puerto Rico. All focus groups were then transcribed and transcripts were coded to identify themes related to census response barriers and census participation motivators. 
And throughout this presentation, you'll see quotes. These all come from our focus groups, but it's very important to remember that focus groups are not representative of the entire population and are not necessarily representative of their respective subpopulations. The quotes here we are presenting just to provide a richer understanding of potential census participation barriers and motivators. For your reference, here's a list of the 11 audiences in our focus groups, covered by our focus groups, I should say. And now moving on to key findings, we're gonna start with intent to respond. But before discussing intent to respond here, I want to make one other important point. So as I mentioned, we did conduct the version of CBAMS back in 2008 prior to the 2010 census, but we have to say that direct statistical comparisons between the two surveys are not appropriate due to significant differences between the two in terms of mode, questionnaire, and sample. But this time around, in fact, we intentionally designed the current CBAM survey with a much larger sample and other methodological differences to allow us to um, draw statistical inferences for smaller subpopulations than was possible in 2008. So for the reasons I just stated, we do not advise comparing the 2008 to the 2018 CBAM survey, but there are some high level dis differences that we might wanna look at. So here we look at one of those very high level differences between the two surveys, and that brings us back to our question, so who intends to respond? In our survey, we see 67% of all respondents said that they were either extremely likely or very likely to fill out the census form. In 2010, 86% of respondents said the same, but the actual male return rate was 76% or 10 points lower. Given that research suggests intended behavior does not accurately predict actual behavior, across the board decreases in survey response rates, increases in government distrust, and an otherwise vastly different climate, we can hypothesize this time around that the same rate for 2020 will be lower than that 67%, but we can't say by how much. Now we're going to look at our knowledge section of the CBAM survey and focus groups. So we found that in terms of familiarity, people generally knew what the census is, but don't have specific knowledge beyond that. Here you can see 79% of respondents were at least somewhat familiar, but only 33% reported being very or extremely familiar. We essentially observed the same in focus groups. So when probe, most participants did not communicate a detailed understanding of the census, and we heard things like this American Indian and Alaska Native participant who stated, in part, isn't that like the people that wanna know like everything? Okay, now we're going to look at some knowledge gaps. We asked people a series of questions, some true and some false, as to whether these were actual uses of census data. We found that there is a relationship between census knowledge and intent to respond, though it is an indirect effect. So CBAM's research uncovered some specific gaps in public's understanding of how the 2020 census will be used. 80% of respondents knew that the census was used to determine changes in the size, location, and characteristics of the United States. Um, that's the highest of all, all the questions, and that's great, but we'd even like to see that higher. And then on the other hand, just over half of respondents, 57%, knew that the census is used to determine how many representatives each state will have in Congress. We're going to highlight a couple more statistics from this slide. So first, let's look at knowledge about community funding. This will be very important when Gina starts to discuss motivators. And it is true that the census is used to determine how much money communities will get from the government. However, less than half, only 45% of respondents knew this to be true. And we have the data to break these numbers down by race and ethnicity, and we saw that some questions had more variability than others. And in this case, every group was less than 50%, and across all groups, there is limited understanding as to whether the census is used to determine community funding. Responses to this question did not vary greatly across demographic groups and white non-Hispanic respondents were most knowledgeable at 47%, and that figure decreases to 47% for non-Hispanic, black, or African-American respondents. Alternately, this is an example where there is substantial variability across race and ethnicity, which is important for the development of targeted advertising for particular race and ethnic groups. Knowledge differences will be most important 
during the education phase of the campaign. We asked respondents whether it was true or false that the census counts both citizens and non-citizens, which of course is true. 55% of respondents overall answered correctly. This time, however, 68% of Hispanic respondents answered correctly, while only 48% of non-Hispanic, black, or African-American respondents answered correctly. And these are the exact type of nuances that will assist us in presenting the best messages to the groups with which they most resonate. I'm going to turn it over now to Gina to move into um, potential concerns and attitudinal barriers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gina Waleko. Thank you for your time and attention today. So looking at CBAM's responses, we group potential barriers to participation into the five categories listed here. Apathy and efficacy, concerns about data confidentiality and privacy, fear of repercussions, distrust in the government, and then few perceived personal benefits. Does it matter if I'm personally counted? Well, in the survey, we asked how much, if at all, do you think it matters if you personally are counted in the 2020 census? 41% said it mattered a moderate amount or less. 18% said it mattered only a little or not at all. These are people who, think, who do not think the census makes a difference. They might care whether or not they're counted, but they don't think anything will come of it. With this question, the survey unveiled the belief that the, the census doesn't have efficacy. Of course, our goal is for the communications and partnership campaign to influence this opinion as people who believe it really matters if they are personally counted may be more likely to self-respond. We're referring to this simply as lack of efficacy. On the other hand, apathy as a potential barrier means I just don't care if I'm counted. CBAMS also found that over one quarter of respondents were extremely or very concerned that the Census Bureau would not keep their answers confidential. Certain demographic groups reported even higher levels of concern with 41% of non-Hispanic Asian respondents and 40% of respondents with low English proficiency reporting being extremely or very concerned. How concerned are people that the Census Bureau shares data with other government agencies? 24% were extremely or very concerned. And this level of concern is substantially higher among certain demographic groups. 37% of respondents with low internet proficiency and 35% of non-Hispanic Asian respondents reported being extremely or very concerned. Said one Middle Eastern or North African focus group participant, Every single scrap of information that the government gets goes to every single intelligent agency. That's how it works. Individual level data, like the city government gets information, and then the FBI, and then the CIA, and then ICE, and military. In addition to concerns about apathy, efficacy, and concerns about data confidentiality and privacy, some respondents expressed a fear of repercussions. 22% of CBAM survey respondents reported being extremely or very concerned that their answers would be used against them. This concern was the highest among some subpopulations. For example, 41% of non-Hispanic Asians and 39% of respondents with low English proficiency reported being extremely or very concerned about this. In an attempt to hypothesize what these concerns might be, we turn to the focus groups. One Middle Eastern or North African focus group participant shared, they could say, look, this community has like X amount of race or something, let's avoid them, or let's define that area. You can see it sometimes where they don't fund certain schools because it's in certain bad areas. Other focus group participants believe the government would use their data against them personally expressed one Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander focus group participant about why someone might not participate in the census. Someone might choose not to participate because it can come back to, and haunt them. Like if you get food stamps and they will be afraid that it's going to affect their food stamps if they report somebody else is there. The citizenship question may be a major barrier for those who believe that, one, its purpose is to find undocumented immigrants, and two, the political discourse is targeting their ethnic group. We chose these four quotes to illustrate our findings. First, from a Vietnamese participant. 
The purpose is to make people panic. Some people will panic because they are afraid that they might be deported. Next, a Middle Eastern or North African participant stated, ICE is working with different groups on deportation sweeps, and it would make me feel like I'm aiding in that. They're doing a lot of illegal stuff, and so I wouldn't fill out any of the questions. Finally, here are two quotes from Spanish speakers from the US mainland. For this census, a lot of people are afraid. It doesn't matter if they ask you whether or not you're a citizen. The first question they ask you, are you Hispanic or Latino? And that's enough. That's all they need, and people are scared. And Latinos will not participate out of fear. There is practically a hunt for us. Latinos are going to be afraid to be counted because of the retaliation that could happen. It's like giving the government information saying, oh, there are more here. As a reminder, these quotes come from focus group respondents who may not be representative of their broader audience. Social science data shows distrust in government increasing over time. In the survey, we found that 59% of all survey respondents said they did not trust the federal government, 55% did not trust their state government, and 47% did not trust their local government. It is the job of the communications campaign to help mitigate non-response due to distrust in the government. An interesting finding comes from the survey questions, do you believe answering your 2020 census form could benefit or harm your community in any way? And then another question, could benefit or harm you personally in any way? Despite all of the negative things that we heard in the focus groups, only 1% of survey respondents felt harm would come to them or their community. Respondents were much more likely to report either a benefit to self and community. And now we turn to some conclusions and recommendations from the 2020 CBAMs. Survey findings suggest the 2020 census messaging needs to connect the census with community funding. Although 30% of respondents said the fact that the census helps determine funding for public services in my community is the most important reason to fill it out, only 45% knew that the census is used to determine community funding. This gap in motivating knowledge is a focus as we develop creative messages. CBAM's research found a general lack of knowledge about the scope, purpose, and constitutional foundation of the census. It also found five high-level barriers, including apathy and lack of efficacy, privacy and confidentiality concerns, fear of repercussions, distrust of the government, and few perceived personal benefits. However, it found funding for community needs to be an influential motivator across audiences, especially universal services like hospitals, fire departments, and schools. So in conclusion, 2020 Census communication and partnership efforts will strive to do three things. One, connect census participation to support for local communities to attempt to address apathy and a lack of efficacy. Two, inform the public about the census's scope, purpose, and process while addressing privacy and confidentiality concerns and fear of repercussions. And three, engage trusted voices to attempt to address trust-based concerns, especially among the most skeptical and disaffected. We leave you with um, these three questions. Thank you for your time. Great. Jay. Can I get the clicker? All right, thanks very much for the presentation, Monica and Gina. Um, I'm Jay Bright, Department of Statistics, Colorado State, and CSEC. So um, first of all, I think the qualitative focus groups are a really useful innovation to CBABs. Um, I'm a mathematical statistician, so I'm kind of naturally skeptical of qualitative data, but <laughs> I'm now convinced I'm a believer. They really are a useful supplement to quantitative surveys. As pointed out very carefully by Monica and Gina both, they're not generalizable, but they do give very useful existence results. So we know that there exist these barriers, these motivators, these attitudes that are out there, and that can be useful for suggesting hypotheses or perhaps creating future generations of questionnaires and things like that. It gives context, support, illustrative information. It really helps in understanding quantitative results. 
and it's adaptive to new circumstances, unlike the fixed survey, for example, as pointed out in the report, the citizenship controversy erupted while CBAM's questionnaire survey was in the field, so that was not addressed in the questionnaire, but um, the focus groups could pick up on it. Um, for the quantitative survey, you know, this is traditional Census Bureau approach, um, at, on a very large scale, so a national address-based sample of 50,000 households, um, stratified at the track level by the mode push and by race and ethnicity with oversampling of minorities, careful non-response bias analysis, and all the usual kinds of steps of waiting for unequal probabilities of selection, non-response adjustment, raking to population controls, and sort of big picture here is that there's no news to report. This is the Census Bureau doing its usual um, excellent, impeccable job of adhering to the highest standards of statistical practice, and particularly for surveys. So this really is the gold standard of survey design, implementation, estimation, and reporting. And um, there's a very careful description of methodology, results, and limitations in the accompanying report. Um, and, you know, leave the census to its own devices, and it just does a really <laughs> great job. Um, and the other thing is that this entire survey, this entire study, both the qualitative focus groups and the quantitative survey, is just designed to improve the quality of another census product. So this is just part of the overall strategy of, of just continuous excellence in, in statistical practice. So gold star there. Um, <laughs> in the report, there is a comment on the limitation. One of the limitations has to do with non-response. And this, this is a real concern. Um, and as they point out in the report, results involving householders' intention to fill out a census form could be biased by the fact that responses were received only from those willing to fill out the 2020 CBAM survey. 2020 CBAM survey non-respondents may be less willing to complete the census than respondents. So this is certainly a concern. There's already some concern because the, the indication from CBAMs is that there's going to be reduced response relative to what we've seen in past censuses. And this may be biased further, and there may be some further non further likelihood of non-response to the census masked by the non-response to CBAMs. And so um, we know that non-response is a worry. Failure to account for differential non-response causes bias, and that bias increases if the response probability is correlated to the variable of interest, which you would certainly expect to be the case in this setting because response to the CBAMs, which is a very census-like approach to um, to getting response sh should be highly correlated with actual census response. The standard non-response adjustment that's reflected in the weighting adjustments that result in the estimates that we see in CBAMs um, does reduce bias under a, an assumed model, a standard assumed model that's quite plausible, but um, difficult to empirically verify. You can't do it within the context of the current survey. You have to do something external to the survey. And um, that really does warrant further investigation in when trying to use CBAMs to project to what might happen um, down the road. Um, one of the ways to do that, of course, is to do a, a follow-up study for the CBAMs non-respondents. And I'm curious if that sort of thing is in the works and have some other things down the road. Um, so CBAMs has certainly addressed its key research questions. Who intends to respond? Where are these gaps in knowledge? What barriers would prevent people from completing the census? and what would motivate people to complete the census. And as was pointed out, the goal is to act on this information. And in the report, and as highlighted by Monica and Gina, the point of this is to develop a research-based communications plan with the objective of motivating self-response to the decennial census. And also to use CBAMs down the road to set the research agenda during 2020 and beyond 2020 through mid-decade testing and beyond. And so those uses are sort of reflected in the questions that were posed for CSAC. Um, the first of which was this um, question number one. The CBAM survey found that concerns about data security and confidentiality may be a barrier to decennial response, especially for racial and ethnic minorities. What data security and confidentiality innovations should census implement and partners highlight when communicating with concerned residents? And um, I'll throw that out to the larger CSAC committee when I finish, but my sort of immediate reaction to that is making further security or confidentiality innovations won't help in any way. The idea is to try to convince people that these security and confidentiality um, procedures already in place make any difference, and that's a hard problem to do. Um, and it seems to me the only way to do that is to get assurances from trusted sources external to census, which is exactly the strategy 
that's been described. Um, I wanted to focus a little more time on question number two. During the 2020 census, what strategies should we use to evaluate whether different communication strategies worked? For example, whether messages to different audiences were effective in promoting self-response. And I sort of, sort of took that as during 2020 and beyond, so throughout the decade, because um, as pointed out by um, Pat Cantwell and John About, there's, there's various evaluation studies that census will be doing that we haven't really heard reporting on, but surely that's in the works. And um, so I'm just sort of throwing out ideas, some of which I'm sure have been, are being considered, some of which are probably ridiculous, and then I'll just go through them. But the, some possible evaluation strategies. It, it seems to me that um, CBAN should be followed up in some way, particularly the non-respondents. I think that'd be very interesting. Um, and you might follow that up via census. You might also follow that up by a, some new survey. Um, I'll talk about a few other ideas here, census case control studies, tracking surveys, analytics, and media experiments, just very briefly. And again, I'm sure many things are in the works and have been carefully considered. So the first thing is CBAMS itself is a randomized treatment. So people have been, random, households have been randomized to either receive the CBAMS treatment, which is a census-like approach, or not. And so you've, you've split the population immediately, and then the CBAMs treated households are then further divided by self-selection into those who respond to CBAMs and those who don't. So you have kind of a structure of an experiment prior to any census intervention. And then there's the census intervention, which includes the census and all of its communication strategy. And then afterwards, if you do something to follow up, you have sort of a before and after with um, something that you might approach with a diff and diff type approach or some other um, methodology. Um, the households that were randomly not selected for CBAMs are, are control cases of self-response. Um, for the CBAMs respondents, you actually have their self-reported likelihood of a response to the census, and then you could maybe follow up with them. Did they self-respond? When did they do it? Um, for the CBAMs non-respondents, at the moment, all you have is the fact that they've been exposed to CBAMs uh, and chose not to respond. And um, you have a model that projects their response behavior. And the model is based on the CBAMS respondents. And we don't know if that model is good. Okay, so a, um, a follow-up could be a survey of those non-respondents to really make every effort to get responses from them, or just um, look at their census response. Did they self-respond and when? Um, so that might suggest a modified non-response model that might be useful for future iterations when you're trying to predict how much likely census response is there from CBAMs like survey in the future for 2030 or beyond, um, and maybe uh, get a better handle on the non-respondents there. So if CBAMs were followed up by a survey, um, as was done for 2010, there was a CBAMs 1 and a CBAMs 2, and I think CBAMs 2 was a, a pure second cross-section with no overlap with the original CBAMs, but I'm actually not sure. Um, Maybe you could repeat it without overlap, um, measuring their exposure to census communications and seeing if exposure is associated with self-response. Or maybe you could do some overlap. So you could have some of those CBAMs um, folks, those respondents to CBAMs, and now measure their exposure to census communications and compare how they self-reported their likelihood of response to the census to what they actually did down the road and what communication strategies they were exposed to. So, Maybe you could learn something there. Um, another sort of spitball idea here is sort of a case control studies. And maybe, maybe you do this, or maybe it's dumb. But um, down the road, you could select self-responders. So these are self-responders to the census. So consider them the cases. And then there are other folks who have not yet self-responded or had to go all the way to non-response. Treat those as controls, matching them on similar geographic and demographic characteristics. But these are people who did not self-respond. And now, retrospectively, go back and see what kinds of communication strategies they were exposed to. And um, that requires an interview with them, but it allows you to estimate an odds ratio to, to determine if exposure to census communication was associated with higher odds of self-response. Um, tracking surveys, it would be very useful to have small surveys repeated regularly throughout the communications campaign, uh, maybe conducted independently of census. Um, th these kinds of things have been done in the past for census, and they're probably in the works but they could measure exposure to various types of communications, they could measure the amount of self-response, and then track the evolution of these sort of mindsets that have been determined from the CBAMS data. Tracking analytics, so if um, 
in addition to surveys or designed experiments, maybe just get analytic type data that um, are not representative but readily available. So from so auxiliary sources like social media or whatever. Um, media experiments, so um, again, maybe this is in the works, but you could match market segments by characteristics predictive of their response propensity, randomly assign half of those segments to version A communication, half to version B communication, and it sounded like John Avad was de describing something very much like that, um, and see if self-response varies according to communication strategy. And in social media, it's really easy and fast to do that in sort of real time. Um, marketers do this all the time. They do what they call A-B testing. Version A is the base of the control. Version B is a modification. And then those can be very modifications. Does the picture of the library or the picture of the fire station um, make more difference in pushing people to the web? OK, um, question number three. After 2020, what gaps in understanding the public's mindsets, motivations, and barriers to the decennial census response could be addressed in mid-decade testing? And I, I didn't really have a response to that, except as a general overall reaction, one of the key findings of CBAMs is that there's unfamiliarity with census, there's distrust, there's misconceptions, there's concerns with the census, they, there's a feeling that it lacks efficacy and so on. And um, that seems like a systemic problem that needs to be addressed throughout the decade in a um, continuous and consistent way of branding of census products, both by census and by um, users of census data throughout the decade. This needs to be monitored. And of course, there's going to be some ramp up during the decennial, but um, it, it just seems like there needs to be additional work um, indicated by CBAMs. So, that, so that's all I had. And I'm just repeating the questions here for convenience of the committee. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much, Jay. That was excellent. Um, what, what other uh, questions do people have? Or even, um, actually, maybe if you could go back one slide so we can see the questions that Census asked us uh, again. There they are. If folks have um, ideas and, and suggestions for the Census. Hi, this is Mario Marazzi. Um, uh, Jay, that was brilliant. Yep. Really, thanks. Um, and thanks to the Census Bureau staff um, for their great work in reviewing the CBAM survey. I just had uh, one, maybe two points. It really seems like uh, the CBAM's non-respondence uh, concern that Jay was talking about really spoke to me. Um, and and it, you know, to answer the simple question, the last one: <laughs> After 2020, what gaps in understanding, uh, you know, perhaps we should focus on? Uh, I would study non-respondents throughout the decade as much as I could over and over uh, in preparation for the next census because, you know, right now as we approach the 2020 census, it seems to me that it's one of the big, you know, questions uh, that Jay has, 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 has brought to, to my attention that, you know, we, we, you know, we don't really know what the propensity of the CBAMs and non-respondents will eventually be during the decennial census. And so um, I would you know, uh, urge you, the Census Bureau to do that. Um, my other point is, is you know, question one, uh, what uh, security and confidentiality innovations uh, should we be focusing on when we communicate to residents? Um, I don't have a good answer to that. I think that, you know, the, the more that, um, that the Census Bureau talks about the details, the nuts and bolts of how it's securing data, the more questions sort of come up. Um, in the last panel, uh, uh, the, the CIO was talking about, mentioned DHS, and just my heart stopped for a sec because of the great integration that we're having. And I said, let's not even mention it. So I'm not going to talk about it more. Um, but I, 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 um, I do think that what Jay's point, and, and I'll be talking about it a little bit more in, in the next presentation, the next discussion, which is partnering with advocates of privacy and confidentiality. Uh, really will help sort of, you know, if you, if you get some of these folks on, on, on board to sort of say, hey, the census is safe to, par to participate. Your information is protected by them. It isn't just the Census Bureau saying it, it's actually people who care about this topic. So those are my two remarks. Uh, hi, Jessica McKellar. Um, this is maybe, this is, I, I want to frame this up for you all, and it's maybe m actually more of a thing to, to, that'll come up in the next um, in the next section, but maybe to, to, to tie these two together. So um, 
your community benefiting is, 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 is like people identified as the most important reason to fill out the census, and it seems like believing that there are benefits for you and your community, you, you know, co correlate with people being, being willing to fill it out. And then, um, but, but the, the, I'm interested in sort of the altitude at which we describe the, the potential community benefits um, sort of in the marketing and in the communications, and then tying that back to you all, like how you tease out what altitudes are, like end up being most effective or cause people to believe in the, in the value of the census. So, um, you know, there's like one framing that is your community benefits. And then I'm, I'm curious, and again, maybe this is more for the communications folks, but, you know, if, it, if it's like filling out the census means your schools will get better, or like filling out the census means more housing assistance, or, you know, I mean, I don't know how strong a statement you can actually make about drawing the lines between any of these things, but, you know, I live in San Francisco, public transit, <laughs> it'll get better. <laughs> Um, I'm, 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 cu I'm curious just sort of how ac across the different orgs that think about the communication strategy and then the assessment of the communication strategy, uh, sort of what altitude for the community benefit has been explored and if, if we've found if any different altitudes are more or less effective or like sort of different slants on the specific community benefits like has proven to be effective for, for certain populations. Does that question make sense? This is it, the altitude question. It does make sense. Thank you. Um, I can't really speak to how successful those efforts were previously, but what I can say is that across the board, like reported in the slide, um, that was the number one motivator for all groups, but that was a, f um, a forced choice selected motivator. Previous to that, it was broken down and our longer presentation actually breaks that down by specific roads, schools, hospitals, et cetera. And then we're able to look across the various race, ethnic, ethnic groups and other subsets like LGBTQ um, and look at which of those motivators specifically resonate with them. And then when we um, go toward the creative development, which fortunately I've been involved in that process, it's actually a very good opportunity for us. Not only, like was mentioned, almost every advertisement will say you can respond by mail, phone, internet, that, almost every advertisement will point out some benefit, some motivator that we saw in the survey. Um, and as you asked and assumed, these motivators do differ by groups. So an example, um, if we're going into more of a downtrodden area and you know we're saying big things about hospitals and medical centers, well perhaps in that case we're gonna talk more about a community health clinic, something more accessible, something you can walk to. Um, so we do various iterations across all the different audiences in that case. I think Burton wanted to well, I mean, add to that. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right on all, on all counts, uh, Monica, but um, I also just wanted to say that as we've been, and you'll remember this too, as we've been working with the creative in developing the whole approach, we've been very sensitive to the need or the fact that we can't overpromise. We can't say the census will mean a better school. And one of the reasons, one of the things we were re we've really warmed up to this tagline is that it, it defines a process. Shape your future, start here. It doesn't, it doesn't say that we're going to get a, you know, better services because we answer the census. But it does say that the census is a part of a place to begin to approach that. To it's it's important because as funds are distributed, they're based on population data, and so we're we're trying to find that appropriate balance between citing the the services that um, and the infrastructure that'll benefit from accurate data, but recognizing that that's just part of the process. That you know it it, it lines up nicely with the notion of the census, the foundation of our democracy. We still have to act on that, and that's, I think, that uh, part of, of what we're trying to, to get at in, in, in kind of throwing that uh, or, or threading that needle, kind of, you know. That's a very good point about not over-promising. I can say during um, the CBAM's focus groups, you would not believe how many people mentioned potholes as a number one community concern. And unfortunately, we're not able to say in our ads, fill out the census and your roads are gonna be super smooth and perfect. <laughs> um, however, we can do what um, Burton mentioned, and it really is the first step. And then we're trying to connect even more so with community spe specific 
examples through our partners, and we do a lot of that currently with the ACS. So in this area, this data allowed you to get this, that, or the other thing. So um, hopefully it'll really resonate with people where they are in the life they are actually living. Um, I'll let you, it looks like you wanted to. I was going to say thank you. That's all. Oh, okay, <laughs> Great, good. Um, and then Gina is going to address some of the suggestions, which we think are absolutely wonderful. Um, but the first one I will talk about is about uh, doing a follow-up CBAMS. So thank you for mentioning that there was that second iteration of CBAMS that came between these two. With all the information we have to present from the survey, it's hard to explain how all of that had gone down historically. But the first CBAMS was conducted only and exclusively by the contractor. And so that was external to Census. This time it was a joint effort between Team YNR and Census Bureau staff. And we actually drew the sample in-house. So this time around, we do know who our respondents and non-responders are. And that offers us a very great opportunity, even if we didn't do a follow-up survey, we can match, because that was something, um, you know, we tried to get anything we could out of that CBAMS too, but at that time, there were still some methodology differences. Like you said, it had to be a fresh sample, but what Nancy Bates did was look at um, people who were part of the NORC evaluation, and then looked at the specific questions that were in the NORC evaluation survey that overlapped with our CBAMS mindsets. And she was able to show that mindsets did shift in a very positive direction after the advertising campaign. And then, unfortunately, we start to lose some of that throughout the decade. But doing that this time will actually allow us to you know, start to figure out how to support more of an evergreen awareness campaign throughout the decade. So this one is really exciting to us and the opportunities to do a, a very in-depth um, study there is highly possible. So thank you. Um, yeah, as Monica said, I think it's a great idea. We all, it also doesn't involve a separate data collection. And um, in 2008, I believe it wasn't just an address-based sample either. So the fact that we just did an address-based sample will make that matching possible. In terms of um, the, the, where you talk about doing some type of like repeated CBAMs and then asking about exposure to census communications, we know from previous research, both uh, research that the Census Bureau has done, but also organizations, it's just the, the responses you get about people and what they've seen or heard are, it's, rife with measurement error. So that's probably something that we would try to avoid unless we had some type of passive measurement. Attaching that to an actual household is very difficult, but uh, you know we have talked about potentially trying to use um, the information that we receive from the contractor in terms of placement, uh, Nielsen numbers, ratings numbers, et cetera, to um, at least know how much people were exposed to. Um, in terms of the, it, so that's kind of a comment for the follow-up survey and the case control studies. I see one more thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, one more thing about the follow-up survey and what you were exposed to, not only is there the measurement error, but the other problem we have in that circumstance is our advertisements aren't the only thing out there. So there's the work of all of our partners, so it would really practically be dis, uh, impossible to disentangle if people were seeing things from the Census Bureau or if they were seeing things um, not sponsored directly by the Census Bureau. And then in terms of the tracking surveys, we are planning on doing actually two different tracking surveys, one online and one by telephone. Again, we don't know, we, we will be asking people about their general awareness, but asking people specific questions about hearing certain or seeing certain advertisements, we probably won't be doing. We could ask people about certain messages though, and that's something that we plan on doing to help us um, you know, optimize our campaign. But also, I think you bring up a good point to really think, how can we use this for analysis after the fact too? And we should probably sit down and talk about that a little bit more. Tracking analytics, that's a great, that's, I already said that we, we can use that and we do plan on using it. 
um, whatever data we get back, as if we can tie it to household or smaller geographies, it will be better. Um, and we do have an agreement with the contractor to receive a lot of that media placement data from them. Um, and there is also a partnership tracking engagement system that we could use, but we know that you know, someone might say, I hung up a poster, and then another person might say, I went to a 2,000 person church, and both of those are kind of entered in the same way, and it's really hard to disentangle, which is worth more in that data. Um, in terms of media experiments, we don't have anything planned right now. Social media experiments, undoubtedly our contractor will be doing A-B testing. It's a matter of us working up a system with them to understand what was A-B testing, A-B tested, so that we can learn from which of those messages actually were most effective to which target audience via which medium. And um, I, I do think that setting up some type of, you know, formalized organization of that could give us something to use throughout the decade and then into 2030. So it is, it's nice to see these formalized and definitely we're already planning on doing some of it, but I think, you know, it, it will go back and talk more about some of these and actually think how can we use these with our planning to 2030. So thank you very much for your comments. They were helpful. Yeah, I just want to underscore that they really are helpful. This is exciting stuff. Um, I just wanted to also make the point that we're in a delicate position with the census. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could just say, we're not going to advertise in this DMA, and we are going to advertise in this one, and do that kind. But we cannot, we cannot put uh, Steve Dillingham or Al Fontenot in the position of trying to explain to a mayor why we didn't advertise in his or her uh, city, right? And, and so that's, that's, I think, the bind we're in. We have to be very equal in the way we apply this for the needs or the, the, the results of the census. And it undermines our ability to do a lot of the really high level kind of experimentation that we, we could do. There's always more we could do, though. Um, and I think you've offered us some really, really good suggestions. Other questions or comments? No? Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all. That was excellent. Thank you. Tommy Wright, thank you very much, everyone, Monica and Gina. The agenda calls for a working lunch. I think people, let's see, I'm looking at that clock. It says 11.40. Uh, and if we can be back by maybe 12.05, the presentation will start at that time. Does that sound all right? Thank you very much.
Tommy Wright. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Hi, Tommy. Ken Simonson on the line. I'll stay muted. Thank you very much, Ken. Ken Simonson. Ken Simonson. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. No. No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. We will now hear from Kendall Johnson and Maria Omedero Malagan and the discussant Mario. Hi, that was a surprise. Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Maria Omedo Malagon. I'm the program manager over the partnerships and communications operations at the decennial directorate. I am really excited to be today here. I know Kendall is too. Um, we're coming as a forefront to talk about the communications and partnerships program. Um, I have decided, or we have decided that today our presentation will be very more from an operational standpoint, not as a <laughs> partnership programs or communications contract, because we really see everybody working together right now. We have a very diverse staff, at headquarters, at, at pretty much almost every directorate in the in headquarters, working in some uh, capacity on the campaign. We have uh, staff in the field, we have our partnership specialists, and we also have our contractors from different co contracts, but mostly from Team YNR, working together on this. So at this point, all the program areas of the campaign have someone from all of those <laughs> spectrums working together, so uh, we don't really want to look at pieces. Um, this morning, Michael Tim said that, that this was at the end of the day uh, uh, agency of researchers and I think this is very well reflected on our campaign. Different from other communications campaign that you will see out there, ours is very, very focused on research and that's what we uh, want to bring today. Everything that we have learned from CBAMs and other research uh, exercises that were conducted through the decade and that were very well explained uh, by Monica in the last presentation, they are being implemented in this program. We have been re reaching several milestones, uh, including the fact that we, are, we just launched our creative testing this week on Monday and Kendall and I have been very busy uh, either attending or watching Focus with Kendall just flew back from Oakland last night. Uh, I have been watching on a system called Focus, v Focus Vision every night, and I'm running after here. I'm, I'm going to Annandale, Virginia for our Korean focus group. So that's a big milestone <laughs> for us. We have our one year out event on Monday. We have media vendor day next week. So it's a lot what we have today, and, and we are very excited about talking about all those today. So as you know, uh, I always like to remind our goals, which are engage and motivate the population, preferably to self-respond, preferably through the internet, and to raise awareness through the entire 2020 census to encourage the population to participate. And that's exactly we are, what we are doing at this moment. Also, I like to remind always that we are part one of the 35 operations. That's easy to uh, forget because it's, um, <laughs> because it's, some people see it kind of fancy or not as scientific, but I really like to stick on that because we are one of the operations and we really behave and produce deliverables in the same way that the other operations are doing. Right now, we are still in the strategic early education phase, which we formally start in October, but informally we have been working on it since 2016 when we hired our first partnership specialist and we initiated our research methods. Right now, we are in the phase in which we're implementing everything that we learn from the research on our activities, and we have a lot of our activities starting, and you will see that on the, on the next slides. We have 
media outreach. We have social media really starting to explode next week after uh, the uh, census day. We have the partnership specialists really working hard and national partnerships working hard too. So our key accomplishments. The recruitment advertising. We, uh, we are very proud to say that we finished our recruitment advertising several months before that we had on schedule. Uh, we were able to equip the, the regional offices with advertisements uh, for radio, for print, digital, and we also have promotional materials for any events that they want to attend. And we have videos that we um, prepare to educate uh, candidates on what, it, uh, on, on what the positions at the field entails. Also, we're moving to phase two of recruitment advertisement at the moment. Next week, we are starting something that we really <laughs> want, and this is a very technical thing in, in, in the communications world, but the, what you are seeing here, although that is very nice and we're very proud of, our stock photography. These were not produced for the Census Bureau. These were a lot of photography that Kendall and I and other group, big group of people had to run around and pick whatever we thought that could reflect a good picture representing the Census Bureau, but it was not made for us. Only the videos that were made with uh, field division staff were made for us. So this time we are um, doing a, a huge uh, photo shoot next week. We are uh, taking pictures of people of all our target <laughs> audiences on the campaign. That, that means that you are going to see everything that we will have represented on paid advertising. We are taking pictures and videos next week. That includes Asian audiences, black audiences, AIN, Hispanic, uh, native Hawaiian, Puerto Rican. So we are, are, we are doing that and we're also uh, shooting several videos next week. So that's a that, that's something big, and YNR is delivering really quickly. By the end of April, we will have new, new materials, and we are very excited about that. Partnerships. We have secured several national partnerships. We are working closely with the American Library Association on strategies to use nation libraries to promote the 2020 census as locations where the public can respond to the census. We're also working very closely with the Federation of Pediatric Organizations on strategies to use pediatric health systems and providers to, in, to encourage parents and caregivers to make sure children, <laughs> especially those zero to four years old, are counted during the 2020 census. The National Partnership Program have engaged and contacted more than 400 organizations, including the National Football League, Major League Baseball, Best Buy, National Geographic, Uber, and Cox Communications, and have secured more than 45 organizations to date. Also, we have been doing a lot of work through our um, uh, local partnerships uh, program. We are very well on the way to hire <laughs> 1,501 partnership specialists by June 30th. However, I am going to leave most of the, the details on the local partnerships programs for tomorrow morning when Peer Division will be presenting. We really want to go on detail on the program. However, I can also say that we have the, uh, prepared promotional materials and items for the partnership specialists and the staff at the national partnerships level to start using. So everybody who is coming on board, it's getting materials to work with them. And those materials are about to hit the internet tomorrow. We are also working on producing more materials and items. These are kind of like temporary, more limited, but we are committed to have more materials and items for the partnership staff, both at national and local level to use starting this summer. And tomorrow, it's a big day. We're launching the new 2020census.gov. Uh, it's the phase one. It's, it's a more limited um, website, but it's, it's new, new pictures, new information. And it's, I think it's good for what, what the stage where we are right now, in which we will have more people, um, who, more data users or partners that will be coming to the website. So it will have the promotional materials for for partners to use. It will have information about the complete count committees, information for congressional offices, for, for those type of partners that can help us in the community. Um, I think it's going to be between July and August. We are going to have <laughs> phase two of the website, and that's the phase of the website that we really envision for the, for the public. Not that the public cannot find useful and we will not have answers for them 
on, on phase one, but definitely that will be the phone stage of our website, the phase two. We are also working on the expansion of the customer experience management system. That's the system where we are going to centralize all our performance measurements for uh, the campaign. It's going to help us with our uh, rapid response efforts or what we call um, in the campaign, campaign optimization. That's going to help us for crisis management, but also for those day-to-day -day decisions that we will have to make. <laughs> As you can imagine on a campaign that is so big like this one, uh, we have to leave a space. We cannot plan everything now. We're planning a lot, but not, nothing can, can be completely planned or completely perfect. We really need to leave space to work day to day on response rates, on crises that can arise at the local level, on bad actors or, I don't know, potential cyber attacks that we what discussed this morning, so, someone saying something on social media. So that's the platform that will be showing us those metrics and which we will be using to make decisions. Do we need to put more money on paid advertising or send an area of the country? Or we need to do more responses or social media? Or perhaps we need to mobilize partner chief specialists from one area on a state to another area to take care of those local communities. So that's what SEM is going to uh, allow us to do. And we have completed a lot, and we have an, an order that in the contract that we call the Earn Share and Own Media uh, Order. And that's the one where we are having our media outreach, crisis communication, social media events, et cetera. We have been working a lot with the team, both internally at the Bureau <laughs> and at YNR, in developing public relations, social media events, and crisis communications efforts. A lot of presentations on best practices and training the staff, both headquarters staff and local uh, partnership staff. We are also selected a vendor for social media monitoring that you know that in these times is so crucial on, on these types of campaigns. And we are very excited because this is the team that is, that is organizing the event on Monday that we will have at the National Pre Press Club to kick out the, our activities. And this is a key day for us because that's when we see that Everything that we have been planning, really, you will start seeing it in the media, in the press, social media, the website, etc. And a statistic in school, I know th this is a favorite for a lot of people. And since we um, kick uh, activities for a statistical school, is a school last year, we have been working on a lot of materials for target audiences. In particular, we have a group of teachers working with us in developing worksheets for pre-K, ESL, uh, kindergarten to eighth grade, and high school uh, populations. Um, also, we are reviewing ideas for Puerto Rico and the island areas, and we are working on several um, milestones. We have developed a script for Coco and Breezy, which is a, a, a show on Wonderama. We are working with the National Council <laughs> of Geographic uh, uh, Education to prepare articles for the Geographic Teacher magazine. We are attending several conferences like the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics and the National Head Start Conference, which is so important for us for the undercount of young children. And we have been conducting outreach calls to all the state boards of education. A big uh, part of what we are doing with SIS is uh, an initiative for, uh, to prevent the undercount of young children. A lot is being done from the SIS perspective, but also, as I mentioned earlier, on the national partnerships, we are working with pediatric organizations. So what we have decided to do is to create a task force inside the Census Bureau, which is led by Karen Deaver, who is the program manager for the prevention of, the, of undercount of young children at the decennial director. She's actually co-sharing that task force with Burton Rice, which is the assistant associate director for communications. And we have a group of people from decennial, from field, and from every division in the communications directory. That means that other than statistics in school, and partnerships, We've, we have people from our press team, from our website team, from our social media team, working together in coming with ideas in how to implement on the different areas of communications in the Census Bureau best practices to reach these populations. And by reaching these populations, we are not limiting ourselves to parents of young children. As you know by research, this is not about the parents. Mo most parents by myself, we don't forget that we have kids and we don't forget them on the form. But we really need to reach those <laughs> complex households. People 
kids that are living with the grandparents or with the uncle and the aunt or with a friend or had to move with, with a friend or, or a neighbor because a, a natural disaster, several circumstances that make it very complicated to count these kids. So those are the populations that we are afterthought and we're really trying to use our most creative people to come with ideas, with very creative ideas to reach this because this is not your average population. This, this requires more thought. And also a big <laughs> accomplishment, as you heard before, was uh, completing the 2020 CBAMS. And by completing CBAMS and completing the analysis of other research uh, that we had at the Census Bureau, we uh, reached three conclusions. First, that we need to connect census participation to support and resources in the local communities, that we need to educate about the census, and that we need to engage trusted voices. Once we have those findings, we were able to sit down with, with, with our contractor and conduct several workshops in, with, in which we brainstormed ideas with what will be the platform for our campaign. Um, we come, we, they came with several ideas for us. I think it was about 15. And from those, we picked like a top three, and that top three went for further research. And now I'm going to transition to Kendall that I think she wants to start talking a little bit about that research and what we did next with the platform. Thank you, Maria. So in case you all didn't know, we actually have a campaign tagline. It's um, shape your future start here. We went through, as Maria talked about, we went through, uh, we'll call it a vigorous testing <laughs> um, process to determine the tagline, but I think vigorous will be dependent upon who's looking at it. Um, we had seven, da seven days, seven days to test the tagline. We tested it in English only. Um, we tested it via an online platform. Um, and then because we know that online there are some audiences that don't have um, significant representation, um, we actually did some focus groups. Again, we did all this in seven days. And on top of that, because we, there are audiences that we needed buy-in from that we know we could not get online and we could not get through focus groups, we actually did what we call community representative reviews. So it would be a, a representative from a specific community that could give us insight as to how the tagline would resonate with their particular community. Um, we did work with our multicultural subcontractors to make sure that the taglines that went into testing, all the taglines that went into testing would resonate with their audiences and could be translated, even if it's with a, a, a small tweak, so that it was culturally relevant, but it still maintained the spirit of the, of the, the um, tagline. <clears throat> so just to be clear, the, when we looked at the tagline, we needed to make sure that it performed well that it was aspirational, that it was informative, relatable, right? Because it doesn't make sense to have a, a tagline that nobody understands, that does not relate to anything. We needed it to be forward-looking because it will be something that we'll use moving forward, or well into the intercensal years, so to speak. Um, it needed to have be a mixture of community-oriented and benefits, right? We wanted people to look at it. It had to have legs. It had to be able to be used for multiple messages. It couldn't just focus on one thing. And we also, when we came up with the tag, or when Team YNR came up with their, the various versions of the taglines, they took into consideration everything they had learned from CBAMs. And they needed that tagline to be able to emphasize those key motivators as well as address the barriers that were identified in CBAMs. So for example, if you took that tagline and you looked at how it might work with the Hispanic audience, um, it would evoke uh, the motivators that the Hispanic audience identified, which include aspiration, opportunity, family, future. Um, it has to be able to be amplified by our trusted voices and used by our partnership specialists. And it had to have language and, language and cultural reference to drive the message appeal. That's very, very important. So I said before that it was important that the tagline were flexible enough to accommodate the many messages. For example, if we wanted to talk about data confidentiality, there's an example of, of a way we could use copy. These are all examples, let's be clear, they haven't been tested. 
Um, we wanted to be able to emphasize the importance of counting everyone in the household, especially young children. We wanted to talk about the, the community benefits and how funding can be, or data can be used to um, determine how funding is allocated. And we wanted to talk about the constitutional mandate of the census. All of these things are able to be discussed under the overall guise of this particular um, theme. So as Maria also mentioned, we are in, we just started conducting our creative focus groups. Um, we are scheduled to conduct 122 focus groups. Uh, these will last, they started on Monday, they will go through early May. Uh, we are having an online qualitative session specifically focused on the diverse mass audience. Um, we end, let's see, there's about 130 participants in that. Uh, we are also going back to that community representative review mm -hmm. because again, there are audiences that we absolutely cannot reach. We are doing this testing in all the languages that are supported by the contract and the campaign. I mentioned earlier that the tagline connects to all the audiences. It absolutely does. This is just a slide that talks about the agencies that validated it would um, connect with their audiences. But on top of that, as we are going through our creative testing, we are asking those probing questions. Does this tagline resonate? Does it say what we want it to say? Do you understand um, the, the spirit of this tagline? And are you comfortable with it? Is it culturally relevant? <clears throat> we've gone through and we've started uh, almost completed or ca have completed the segmentation. Um, we're revisiting some of the names of the segments, uh, but we have completed the segmentation. And, you know, just wanted to real quick go over the goals of the segmentation, and that's really, we want to provide an overarching framework so that we understand how the country. We want to use that geography to bring together the various behavioral, demographic, attitudinal, and media usage data. All of that helps us to drive the strategy and the creative and the media that will be used in this campaign. We use a track level segmentation approach. I could read the slide. I think we're all grown. But um, really, it's, it's taking the entire, all this, the track level, tracks within the country, and we're, we're putting them into light categories so that we can then segment them, and then we can communicate directly to them based upon uh, the characteristics within uh, the tract itself. For example, the way you speak to an urban audience may be different than how you speak to the rural audience, and the communication track channels that you use to speak to them vary. We also take the media usage data, and we use that to help us inform exactly what media we use. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to use all your traditional media, TV, radio, print, um, your out-of-home advertising, internet. Um, but we also, we take the media usage data, we, we layer on the segmentation data, and that helps us fine-tune exactly what those communication channels are. Because you don't speak to every, there are some audiences that are more heavily reliant on radio than they are on TV. And you want to make sure that you're using the most appropriate mix of communication channels so that our messages are clearly um, articulated through, through to the uh, target audiences. This is a high level timeline and I want to be clear, it's really related to creative and media because those are the two major trains that are running right now. <coughs> you will see that we are just, we've already started the process of um, preparing for the upfront uh, media buy, and the upfront media buy is really focused on national level media. But national level media is great to provide, you know, air cover, but you still need local and hyper local media. We are working very hard to make sure we engage as many media outlets as possible. We want to make sure that people, that all the media outlets know that the opportunity exists. We want them to be aware of where they can find the information and how they can participate. One way we're doing this is we are having, um, we're con well, Team YNR, let me be clear, Team YNR is conducting a media vendor day. And I, I stress that it's Team YNR because all contracts, negotiations with media are done between YNR, their, their subcontractors, and the media, not with the Census Bureau. So Media Vendor Day will be held April 3rd in New York. 
previously, I believe Tara's office uh, sent you a few documents, um, the 2020 paid media fact sheet, uh, the um, link for the evite, uh, the do not buy criteria, as well as the press release that went out uh, a few weeks ago about Media Vendor Day. Um, we've, we've also supplied that to the NAC, to um, the national partners, to our state data centers, to our census information centers, to our stakeholders on the Hill, to our partnership specialists in all the regions, because again, we really want to make this as, as open a process as possible to, and to encourage every interested media vendor to participate. We are also conducting a media vendor day on April 5th in Puerto Rico for Puerto Rico media only. April 5th. And we'll make sure to, uh, I don't think I sent, make sure to send all that information to you all as well. Next steps would be, um, once we have all the media, so Media Vendor Day is on April 3rd. Media vendors have a little over, uh, I think they have about 40, 45 days to actually respond. Um, they, it is a portal. Everybody responds to the same portal. That portal within Team YNR will make sure the appropriate media buyer um, gets it based upon the audience. Um, and then Team YNR <coughs> will spend the next month and a half reviewing all of those proposals and coming up with what they think would be the best plan moving forward. Um, we hope to, to, to see that plan probably late September, early October, um, and final negotiations and purchases will be made once that plan has been approved. No matter when the media is negotiated and purchased, the media will not begin running until January. So key 2019 milestones, is this where I was passing back? Okay, sorry. Um, so we talked about finalizing the media plan. So media plan 1.0, um, we, we will uh, provide approval for that in the next few days. That really, again, only covers the upfront negotiation. Um, they will conduct the media upfront negotiation uh, April through August. Um, social media launch April 1st. It's, that's a one, day, um, one year out event. Uh, we already talked about the creative testing that we are in the midst of doing. We hope to have results from that in July because we want to go into production in August. It is imperative that all ads have been produced and approved um, prior to January. We don't want to be in January doing this. We want to be on air. Um, and then uh, we will, it is our plan to post the media buy information. Um, all, the, all the outlets that are part of the media buy will be made public um, probably in late December, early January of 2020. This is very similar to what we did for the 2010 census. Uh, and then, I didn't mean to skip over it, but the um, Statistics in Schools Count of Young Children campaign begins in October. So we did come up with a, a few questions for you all. We wanted to know what kind of experiments you would suggest for a campaign of this magnitude, um, whether or not you suggest any potential national partners um, particularly partners focused on privacy and confidentiality matters. And then would you partner with us in promoting some of our current initiatives such as Media Vendor Day um, and the RFPs that are associated with it. So thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so Mario. Thank you, Allison. This is Mario Marazzi and I wanna thank um, both Maria and Kendall for a great job of putting together what must be one of the most sophisticated marketing campaigns in the world. Um, data driven and, and, and you know, I, and I really appreciate you guys trying to formalize uh, in a statistical framework um, what is, you know, uh, long term practice in the marketing industry, right? And you guys have the opportunity to do that, um, just as all these exciting changes are happening in technology in the world. So. Um, apologize if this came out a little small. I'm trying out new software. So why, why, is, why is the, uh, the integrated partnership and communications operations update uh, important? Uh, the decennial census is a huge undertaking for the Bureau, requiring the largest and most complex survey and field work. And when respondents are motivated to participate, the field work is more cost effective and the resulting data quality is better. 
the 2020 census will be only the third decennial census with a marketing campaign. Before that, there was no marketing campaign. Um, it was a census taker who actually went to your house and counted your, your, you know, your, the members of your house. I believe ever since self-response, we've basically moved to having these advertising campaigns, which I think is, is interesting and fascinating, uh, a development for the methodology of censuses in general. Um, in, you, know, you can think about, you've heard of get out the vote campaigns. Uh, this is sort of like that, but instead of get out the vote uh, civic marketing campaign, this is a fill in your census form campaign. And the campaign also affords the Bureau the opportunity to guide respondents to its preferred use of response, which is being inaugurated with this current census, which is the internet. Um, and I think we all agree um, it's the most cost effective and quickly and, 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 and best way to capture data. All of that said, the big caveat in the room is what you know, you've heard many times is the hard to count population. Um, precisely, uh, these campaigns are, ga are you know, geared towards helping uh, the Census Bureau uh, motivate the hard to count populations and everyone to participate, but especially the hard to count because, well, they're hard to count. And so, um, a lot of the, uh, the underlying research on, on hard to count populations still shows that there's a preference for paper-based uh, forms. And so in that sense, while we inaugurate the internet mode and we certainly have to guide respondents to it and it's gonna be a major innovation in the census, we can't forget that the marketing campaign and everything we do really has to focus on trying to find those hard to count folks to get them to self-respond. Uh, if it has to be in a paper form, then it has to be in a paper form. So um, back in February, the, um, the Bureau did a great job and it, uh, I think it was probably because of the leadership of the, the National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations, the NAC, created a working group uh, on the Integrated Partnerships and Communications um, uh, Operations. And um, members of that working group, uh, together with Allison and myself from the CSAC, uh, came uh, and met briefly here for two days to sort of get a, a, a quick glance of what you are now seeing and what is now public, uh, the, the media plan uh, in, in, in broad strokes um, that, that helps sort of guide what's going to be the, the, the campaign for, for the 2020 census. Um, this has been uh, really interesting for me. The, the NAC is a very a similar group to ours, but um, they represent different racial and ethnic groups, and they have, you know, they're, they're very passionate about this topic. Uh, their, their groups, uh, many of them are hard to count, and so they have very specific experiences with, with this situation, with, with this topic, and I'm gonna try to communicate some of their concerns as well um, uh, without being uh, specific about it. So before we get to the questions that Kendall and Maria have brought upon us, um, I thought I'd present what are my questions um, when I think about you know, uh, this topic, uh, it, it, especially after participating in the, in the contract creative review session that I mentioned in February. First of all, is the awareness campaign uh, for the hard to count population long enough given the results of the evaluation of the communication plan of the last census? So after the 2010 census, there was an evaluation of the communications plan, and it found that for the hard-to-count populations, it would be nice if the awareness campaign, the phase of the awareness campaign, lasted longer because perhaps for these hard-to-count populations, um, they weren't as aware that the, what, what the Centennial Census was, what its purpose was, um, and so um, by, by recommending after the last census that this campaign be longer, we can create greater awareness in these populations before we actually ask them to participate. And uh, right now, I believe there's an awareness campaign for everyone that lasts about the same amount of time. So that's a, an open question for the Census Bureau to think about. Um, of course, the citizenship question is uh, key to thinking about these topics as well. So how should the integrated partnerships and communications operation be changed? be adjusted in some way in either of the two scenarios. Pardon me, Mario, please. Yes. This is Tara Dunlop-Jackson. Folks on the line, would you please mute your phone? We can hear you in the room. Thank you very much. Please continue, Mario. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. So, this, turning to the citizenship question. So how should 
the integrated partnerships and communications operation be adjusted in either of the two scenarios of the Supreme Court decision? Has the Census Bureau thought through what it would do in terms of communications based on whether the citizenship question stays or whether it goes? And, and I think you know, one of the things that, that came up from, from my thought process is that no matter what the decision is, there should be some adjustment to the communications plan. There should be some uh, mention to it um, you know, I'm still uh, perhaps hopelessly optimistic that you guys can announce, hey, that's not a concern anymore, participate, you know. Um, but we shall see, we shall see. Uh, but it's important to realize that you, need, you, you do need a, to, a, to do some sort of a, acknowledgement of the decision from a communications perspective, no matter what the answer is. And third of all, and this is a very charged question with lots of things in there, have adequate provisions been made for hard to count populations within what's known as the diverse mass audience? So um, in, in doing the, the, the plan for, for the communications um, the, and the segmentation, they've developed uh, this concept called diverse mass, which um, includes a whole group of people that you know, might otherwise be considered hard to count. Um, so, um, parents of very young children. You heard of the initiatives that they're doing to make sure that young children are included. Um, the LGBTQ community, uh, also hard to count, but technically it's considered within diverse mass. Uh, people that are otherwise low income in general. Um, English language speakers who uh, are, are, however, of traditionally non-English speaking communities. So if, be very blunt and give us a straight example. You know, uh, I'm Hispanic, but I speak English. I receive lots of questionnaires. They're all in Spanish, a lot of marketing material in Spanish. Does it not attract me? Does it make me feel like this is not part of me? This is for the Spanish-speaking community, and therefore I don't participate or I'm less likely to participate. So it's these sort of um, audiences within the diverse mass that are probably hard to count and, and have, has the Census Bureau you know, done enough for each of these groups to make sure from a communications perspective that they are gonna be motivated in participating. Um, number four, is there adequate capacity to respond quickly to local communications crises? I think this is one of the most exciting areas of the 2020 census because you're gonna be not only uh, uh, dealing with traditional media, you have social media, not just local issues, but I, I love Kendall, hyper-local issues. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, it presents opportunities, but it also presents threats, right? And so, you know, does the Bureau have adequate capacity to respond to all sorts of pot potential local communications crises? And finally, um, you know, as perhaps the CSAC could tell, um, there's a timeline, it's, there's a lot of details that they will be slowly uh, evolving over the next couple of months, and so will the, the Bureau consider convening the NAC IPC working group uh, perhaps later on this fall uh, once the approval of Media Plan 2.0 gets closer and we have a little more details as to how that's, that's gonna work out. Um, I wanna throw those questions out for, for us to think about uh, and perhaps add uh, value to what the Census Bureau is presenting to us here today. But let me now uh, address the questions you guys raised. Um, so uh, the first one, what kind of experiments would you suggest for a campaign of this magnitude? I think Jay did an absolutely awesome job proposing all sorts of different methods of evaluation. I will not try to reproduce that here. Um, I just thought of a couple when I was doing my, my brainstorm. But I, I, I think the word experiment in your question is, is taking me somewhere else, right? Um, so, you know, from what I gather, during the data collection period, uh, the Census Bureau will be collecting, uh, measuring, and even publishing response rates um, at relatively small areas, maybe counties, maybe even smaller. Um, and they'll be updating them on a real-time basis. And whether you publish them or not, you're gonna have them in-house. And so this affords perhaps uh, an opportunity to actually do some experiments uh, that we might not typically be able to do in, in official statistics. So, the question that I ask is, in response to your question is, <laughs> can small area response rates be used to gauge the effectiveness of different media cam communications campaign strategies? Um, and if the answer is yes, if you see two areas that have different response rates and we believe those response rates have something to do with the communication strategy that we employed in each of those two, then, you know, does the CSAC believe that the Bureau has uh, gotten to the point where it can experiment 
with different campaign strategies and make appropriate adjustments during the data collection period itself. And some of this sort of came up uh, uh, in, in the last uh, conversation. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be where we either have a communication strategy or we don't, right? I mean, that's, I think that that's a false choice. I think um, you can have two different photos uh, that are, you know, either promoting people to participate more effectively one than the other. And you can, you know, can we get to the point where differential response rates where you're using different photos, say, and everything else is the same, can you use that and say, well, you know, the, the greater response rate in this area tells me that I should be using these photos to promote the census participation. And, and should you, during the data collection period, say, hey, let's, let's start using the right photos, the photos that work. And I think that that's, uh, it's an open question. I don't think it's an easy thing to answer, but it's, it's worth raising. Um, also, you asked, uh, can we suggest any potential national partners uh, focused on privacy and confidentiality? And so I took the time to, to go ahead and, and, and look for some, some organizations. Um, I'm not endorsing any of these. I'm not, you know, a member of any of these. I literally looked them up. I, you know, I said this is, this is something that can be easily done. Um, the Consumer Reports, for instance, has an advocacy group called Consumer Unions. There's the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, Electronic Frontier Foundation. I think, you know, if this, now from an official statistics point of view, this is a difficult conversation because, you know, we, we believe a lot in getting data out and in publishing and being transparent. And I think that that always has to be part of what the Census Bureau does. But at the same time, in order to allay fears that people may have about the privacy of their information, this sort of organization is, you know, the best sort of people to speak on your behalf. And so reaching out to these may not be easy. It may require difficult conversations, deep briefings where you actually explain, you know, what you are trying to do to protect people's privacy. But I think it is a worth good investment of your time to do so because if one of these organizations, and I have another screen here, um, comes out and says, hey, you know, uh, the, participate in the census, it is safe, your information is private, that is much more worth it from a communications point of view than anyone from the Census Bureau saying, yes, your information is private, right? And so here's a couple more, the Consumer Federation of America, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, Privacy International, Electronic Privacy Information Center. Um, and then the final question, um, would you partner with us in promoting Vendor Day? An unqualified yes and C, absolutely. Uh, I already have started, and now that I know that you'll be doing it in Puerto Rico April 5th, I'll also be doing that. Um, and uh, thank you. Uh, before I finish, though, I do want to now just give you a couple additional points that came up as a result of what you were telling us, okay, uh, that I think are probably um, important as well. So you mentioned stock photos, right? Um, and I think that's great. Um, I think we've all heard that all politics are local. Well, I also believe that all censuses are local, right? And so um, and pictures are worth a thousand words, um, and, and maybe even all censuses are hyper-local. And so, you know, in the last uh, presentation, th there was a lot of discussion about connecting the census to community funding, right? And how far can the Census Bureau go to say that, you know, participate in the census because, you know, the potholes will be fixed? Um, we certainly can't go that far. We, I know we do go as far as saying the census does have a role in determining school funding, right? And then we, you will probably put a generic stock photo of a school next to that message. And now I'm wondering, can we go a little further or, and, and, you know, and actually put a photo of a local school, right? And that, I mean, all censuses are local. If you really, and, and pictures are worth a thousand words, you really want to inspire people. We, we don't, we're not saying we're not going to improve, we're going to improve that school. That, that's, that, where is that gray area? Where is that line, right? And, and, and by using stock photos, have you now made it impossible to do so, right? Uh, that's one question, one point. Um, and just as a final thought, I think that it, with regards to young children and the, the topic of complex households, um, it really very close to my heart. I believe that complex households probably need to coordinate where, where the child will be counted, right? If this is a child that is living in several households different days of the week, 
then maybe your campaigns can somehow uh, speak to that, that parents should beforehand coordinate where the child will be counted. Because otherwise they might both believe that they're both reporting and no one reports and then the child gets undercounted. Those are all of my remarks, literally. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I did want to, you had talked about diverse mass, and I wanted to real quick explain that that's the terminology that we use um, uh, as we're, as we're um, describing the various audiences that the campaign covers. And diverse mass, the definition is um, <clears throat> anyone that consumes English language media. So. You use yourself as an excellent example. You would receive messaging both in Spanish and in English based upon the media that you consume. Um, in terms of whether or not um, there's enough to, all the audience will see themselves, we sure hope they will. That is our goal. We're out there testing. Um, well, the online, the, the diverse mass is being tested through the online panel. And um, it is a very, uh, we went for very diverse um, uh, 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 participants, so to speak, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And where, where we aren't able to get that, we're going through the um, community representative reviews. Um, that said, um, I'm a, and I'm going to sort of slide into a couple of things. You talked about um, stock images. And we, the stock images were used for the first round of the recruitment ads, and a lot of that was time sensitive. Okay. We just didn't have the time okay. and the funding when we were doing that to get out and do a full on. Right. Um, photo shoot. Moving forward, absolutely, we learned from the 15 test how important it is to have local imagery in the advertising. Now, will we get every single lo location? We, we can. I can't make that promise. But we will make it as local as we can. Um, and many of the recruitment materials provide the opportunity to swap out some of the um, information. We have templates where you can, at least definitely for the next round of recruitment, will have templates where they can use local imagery or local or, or um, uh, pictures of individuals that more closely align to the audience that they're trying to recruit within. So on a, in addition to the photo shoot that we're doing for the recruitment okay. advertising, as part of the creative for the campaign, we are also going out and doing a photo shoot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm dating myself here. But we did this in 2000. We actually went out and we, <laughs> we got a photographer and we took all these images of everyday people, just regular people. And we were very fortunate and um, we are still using those images, believe it or not, I can't believe it. I'm sure people are walking around saying, is that me? Um, because we're still using them. But it proved to be a very, very useful tool for the Census Bureau because it allowed the partnership specialists to find images of persons that more closely aligned with the audiences that they were trying to reach, they could create their own materials specifically, you know, because there are only so many languages that we cover, so many audiences. The partnership specialist um, or the partnership program increases the number of languages that um, can be uh, uh, communicate, with whom we can communicate, um, because they just have that depth. We don't, we're not, well, now that you don't, we just, it's not part of our mandate. That said, we try to give them the visuals to go with the creative that they're doing on the fly in the regions so that they can talk to the people they need to talk to. Um, you talked about, um, are we able to, you talked about uh, some experiments and, and while this isn't an experiment, through the with the digital ads, we have the ability to pull ads if they are not performing to expectations. Um, we can read, we'll, we, we will use the approved um, uh, languages or language that we're out testing now through the creative focus groups, but we're able to, you know, create new digital ads based upon that approved language and hopefully um, switch those out as other ads are not performing. Um, and I, that's it, I'm gonna pass it to Maria. <laughs> okay, Kendall and I have been working on some answers to your questions. First of all, muchas gracias for your comments and questions. Um, on the first one, you asked about uh, if the awareness, this, the timing is long enough. The length of the campaign, um, I think we need to differentiate several things here. We start the campaign several years ago, formally in October with our early education phase. It's more cost effective 
to target our target audiences, our hard to count, through the diverse communications methods through the year using those. In terms of paid advertising, it's more difficult. It, first of all, it's very, very costly, and we are trying to be very savvy here with federal dollars. From all of the orders in our contracts, me media is the most costly one. It's the one that we're investing the more, but at the same time, we need to be very effective because we don't have infinity dollars here. We have a, a limited amount. So we work with the contractor to work on something, and again, based on research. It's called applied recensive theory. And it's a theory in advertising with the belief, after several studies, that when you do advertising, you should do it immediately before you want the, you, you want the call of action. So if we start, we have heard several times why you are not advertising right now. We are not advertising right now because at the end of the day, if we, even if we conduct an experiment, we could have an ad right now and people will forget very quickly. So we are going from, we definitely need to educate our heart to count, but we need to focus to what we are allocating for that on things that are going to be more effective and that we can use more. For example, producing a social media post is way cheaper for us mm -hmm. and we can use it several times through the year and people are not going to get tired of those. We can tweak, let's say, as Kendall said, digital, so easy. We can start working on, on statistics in schools and really work on a long period with the kids educating them on that. The advertisements, we produce them, but then it costs us every time that we air them and we are not being effective because people just forget them. We have a very saturated market th these days. So that will be for the first one. For the second one, you are asking about the scenarios uh, with the citizenship question being look at the Supreme Court in a couple of weeks. We are testing using, not, not even thinking only about the citizenship question. We are conducting creative testing right now, focus groups, online panel, and uh, community representative interviews, thinking about all possible scenarios because our form is not final yet. So we include and not include through research a lot of the questions and a lot of the topics from the form because, again, not final. We have to mention, in some of them, we mentioned, um, it will ask you about if your household is rented or is owned. In some, we don't, we don't mention that. It's the same with the citizenship question. Some of the discussions that we have on the focus groups, we include it. In some, we do not because it may not be included. So we are looking at all post potential scenarios here with the question. Number three about the hard to count populations within, within diverse mass, and Kendall touched a little bit about this. I, I agree, it's, it's something that it's, it's concerning for everybody, the diverse audience is something that is, 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 is a topic of a lot of discussion, both internally and externally regard, regarding this campaign. I think we get questions about diverse audience, uh, the diverse audience all the time, and I think we have debating a lot even <laughs> inside the team what diverse audience is. In terms of the research, we have been very careful because we know that diverse audience means a lot of things. So we have been including in our focus groups, in the screening for online representatives, and even on when we uh, conduct community representatives um, interviews, we look at all potential scenarios, including rural, and we are doing focus groups in rural areas. Low internet proficiency, we are conducting those uh, focus groups this time, and we did it with CMAMS too. Um, complex households, we are having focus groups in several areas of the country, specifically under the, on, with the topic of the undercount of young children in mind. When we, are, we screen and some of the focus groups for LGBT, so that those, all, all of those are included there. And even we are doing uh, focus groups with Latinos who mostly speak English, because they are Latinos, but at the same time, they are part of the diverse audience and they will be consuming the, di the diverse media. We are trying to reflect all of that in our research and what we have been developing the creative also. You talk about hyper-local, let's see how it tests, but we have been including some things that are very local, but that function at the national arena. And it plays a lot with, with very, several communities. It's, it's, a, it's a really fun concept. And, I personally hope it works on, on creative testing because it's, it's, it's very fun and very local, but bringing local to the national level. 
Um, we have been uh, doing a lot of discussions in terms of media bias, in terms of diverse mass. Again, we need to, um, we are trying to be effective in reaching all our audiences while at the same time being efficient. And being efficient includes a lot of diverse mass because there are a lot of very different people in this country who watch the same things. I always joke about this is us. I watch this is us and I am a Puerto Rican woman and, but, <laughs> but I have a lot of my colleagues and friends who are from other races and ages and, and they watch it or people who, were, who watch NCAA. Tommy and I were having a discussion about that in a meeting yesterday because we both watch <laughs> <laughs> the NCAA and I understand Ron too. And I am watching tomorrow because Yukon is going to meet to beat UCLA tomorrow. You will see. You will see. <laughs> so uh, that those are the commonalities in which we can save money. But definitely, an event like the NCAA happens in the middle of the census. Most probably, I cannot guarantee anything to it, but most probably will be because it touched people from different ages, different races, different backgrounds that really like to watch the game. So we are really trying to be efficient going after those. And then number four was um, respond, if we have adequate resources to respond to local crisis, absolutely. I think even more now. Um, we have double our partnership specialist efforts. We are going to have 1,500 partnership specialists. We have 700, 1,500 and versus 700, more, 1,501. We have 700 in 2010. We have more partnership coordinators. We have more media outreach specialists. And we have a very strong support from headquarters to those uh, staff in the field. We are producing materials earlier than we did last night. We are really equipping them with a very strong training. We are giving them the customer relations system, the CRM, and also we are helping them make decisions with what we get from the SEM, the system that I discussed during the presentation. So I really think that we even have more hands to work with these problems at the local level and at the same time a better support at the headquarter level for them. And number five, absolutely, our plan is to continue having uh, a lot of briefings for the working group the rest of the year, and media buying is one of those. So when we have the plan ready, uh, which will be in the fall, we will definitely have a briefing for the working group. I know that a lot of comments sort of focus around the level of information that we will um, that will convey through the advertising. And I, I really just want to say that paid media is not the panacea. Paid media is a great opportunity to provide air cover um, and, and to, it's, it's more for broad messaging. We have our partnership specialists. They are our boots on the ground. They are the ones that have the ability to engage in more in-depth conversations and provide more detailed um, um, information. So I, 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 that's why this is the integrated partnership and communication campaign. Together, we're able to do what it is you're asking us to do. We're able to provide broad and detailed messaging just you know, in different ways. Mario, I think, the, I think that Kendall and Maria did a great job of covering your questions. I just want to underscore the last point that Kendall said, and Maria touched on this, but um, we learned in the 2010 census how important and how effective complete count committees are. We fielded 40 partnership specialists, seasoned people who've been working with the Census Bureau for a long time in January of 2017. That was, that was two years before we had partnership specialists working on the 2010 census. We now have over 1,500 complete count committees around the country. 46 states have them, but every state has extensive representation with complete count committees at lower levels of geography. That number's growing. And, and, and you know, part of the way we extend that awareness campaign, and, and both Kendall and Maria touched on this too, is by that partnership effort being out there, being robust, being stronger, because it's, it's, that's where you're building the awareness in these communities. Those are the trusted voices in those communities. And I just thought it was, it was worth underscoring that point. The other thing that, there, there was something else that 2010, 10, and it's, a, it's contradictory, but that 20, analysis of 2010 taught us, and that is that our, our advertising campaign actually peaked a little too early in 2010. So, you know, on the one hand, they say start awareness earlier. On the other hand, they said you saturated the airwaves too early. So it's, it's kind of, it's, we got to find the balance. And I think that's one of the things that we're, we're working to do. Um, but. Um, 
Kathy, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, could you, I know you had a lot to cover. So the um, customer experience management dashboard, and it said it, it will have a lot of, it will have multiple data sources that go into it. Can you give a little flavor about what data sources those are and how you will be monitoring uh, through the, um, through the, especially obviously through the um, uh, active season? But just to, they are a lot, and they come from or all the, the types systems. Or the of data sets, <laughs> but this system, yeah. But definitely our primary source will be uh, the response rates at the same time, and response rates and several other data that will come from the different decennial systems. At, and we are plan to go very, very local, hyper-local with those response rates. Number two, we are going to get um, res, um, information from Team YNR. They are going to provide us information with everything that they are doing in the campaign, particularly paid advertising, but they are going to be involved and they are going to monitor all other efforts that we are using them through. And number three, we plan to also include data regarding local partnerships and how local partnerships are working, and that data is mostly from us. We'll also have our data on data from national partnerships from headquarters, what media outreach uh, that we are doing from headquarters, but those will be three sources that I think are critical to the success of the dashboard, with the, and they, th we will be inputting. So what do you imagine that, I'm just thinking of the operations during the piece about like you were looking and like Topeka has a lower response rate than you expect. I don't know, do you, do you feel uh, covering the whole country even with a great dashboard feels hard? I don't know. Do you have, will there be flags or, I don't know, places to signal for you, places to yes. look at? Or, yes, exactly. Is so there an army of people that will be looking at the dashboard? I, as I say, no, response rates will be our number one uh, performance metric. And we will be looking and how to respond, how to best respond to those least low response rates through the, through, the, through the dashboard. For example, I think it's very important to see what we are going to look in the system what similar areas, demographic areas or with similar response uh -huh. rates in 2010 and 2000 are doing and if, if we are doing anything different, if the system shows that we, something different could be we have less partnership specialists in that area, something different could be we put less advertising dollars or what is working on an area that is similar, that's another uh, feature that we are planning to have. If something in an area that is similar is working, we probably will do a what, what could have worked. Well, maybe we had an event over there. Oh, well, maybe it's time to put some money in having our partnership specialists to, do an e to have a special event over there. Or maybe it's the, in this other area we really mobilize churches. And maybe the faith-based community can help us on that particular area. So those are the, the type of decisions okay. that we are planning to make. We will have also a very sophisticated system in terms of teams that we are planning to have. Um, we were actually reviewing our playbook this week. And we are having uh, different teams um, specialized on different areas of the campaign to make decisions and make recommendations to more senior teams, which will include Kendall and myself, and up to the executive level in the Census Bureau, to make decisions day-to-day -day in terms of the different program areas of the campaign. So it will seem important to have the partnership people or your faith-based groups like know that they're on call? Do you know, I mean, yeah. uh, as opposed to sending an email to say like, hey, guess what, we need your help right now because. Yeah, that's I one of the things that the partnership specialists have in mind. I think that's, that's very into the core <laughs> of their training. You know, I think it's, it's also important that the, the, the SEM uh, works hand in hand with the customer relationship man, uh, management system, the CRM oh, okay. management system, where we're tracking all of the partners yeah. and all the partnership specialists and the activities that they're, that they're undertaking. Great. So that we can, if we see something happening in Topeka, we can direct digital advertising maybe in a more stronger way there. But we can also communicate with partnerships, specialists and partners to ask them to uh, focus on, you know, maybe there's something going on in the news. Maybe there's a misinformation campaign, anything of that nature. I think that that's um, an important thing to keep in mind as well. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think one other critical thing is that we're not doing this just at headquarters. These decisions are made in um, coordination with the regional offices. Jeff. Hi, thank you, uh, Jeff Lauer. I just wanted to add to the list of potential partners as it relates to uh, uh, the concern over protect protection of information. Um, and I'd just add 
uh, potentially the private sector. And, you know, there's a number of companies that specialize in ID uh, protection or identity uh, protection like LifeLock and Watchdog ID. Um, I don't really know how that relationship could work. Maybe it's some sort of testimonial or some sort of seal of approval or something that um, also gets it away from the politics since it would come from the private sector. So I just wanted to add that to the list. That's a great suggestion. And I think that um, one of the things Mario said that I thought really made a lot of sense when he was talking about the privacy organizations that we should be working with, and we, we really are uh, reaching out to them. Um, if we can get them to make the point that the census data is safe, it's much stronger than anything we can say. Same goes for the tech industry. Um, we're working very closely with Microsoft. Twitter's, you know, working closely with us. Um, if we can get data savvy private sector organizations to talk about our cybersecurity efforts and the fact that the data are safe and the fact that Title 13 is strong when we're not going to share the data, the more we can get companies and organizations that people listen to to say what we say too, um, the stronger we're going to be on this point. But that's a very good point. Mario? So yeah, just as a final thought, um, the um, I hear you guys mention partnership specialists a lot during this, and I guess I'm now getting a sense that I wish I had a better understanding of what their functions are. Are they Census Bureau employees? Can they engage in social media discussions? Um, are these questions that you've, you've, you've thought through? And, and if you have answers, that'd be great. Tomorrow, the first presentation is the local partnerships presentation, and I really don't want to, <laughs> to steal anything from them. But yes, the partnership specialists are Census Bureau employees. They are very well engaged. Actually, I was talking to one of them earlier who, who came to the presentation. So they, they are very engaged, and, and they work uh, very close to us. Jessica? Uh, hi, Jessica McKellar. Uh, this this is maybe more for the future, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious um, sort of what, what framework y'all use to decide what channels are in scope for advertising. So if I, it's like the, the 2010 census, the 2020 census, the 2030 census, and it's like billboards, AM radio, Taylor Swift on Twitter, and YouTube ad. Like how do you, how, how do you decide, and in particular um, to, to ensure that you have like the data and the instrumentation you need to plan for future censuses, like how, how do you think about how you frame up like what you decide is in scope? So, again, I'm dating myself. Um, in 20, in 2000, you know, the media from 2000, the landscape was different from 2010, and 2020, the landscape is different as well. So there are some commonalities, there are some lessons learned that can be applied as we go along. But we evaluate each and every media property and media, media channel to determine if it is the best uh, method to convey our messaging. But in the end, we are trying to reach everybody, right? So we're using whatever communications, whatever, um, I'll say vetted communications mm -hmm. uh, channel there is. You can't use every social media out, uh, uh, channel, but you can use some. Um, we've, again, we talk about CBAMs and we talk to uh, 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 respondents about what was the media, the media, how do they receive their messaging? And that varies by audience. We make sure that we include that um, in the media planning. We have multicultural agencies that specify in reaching their particular audiences. We rely heavily on them because they're doing, they're creating campaigns for other um, business that reach their particular audiences. They know what works and what doesn't. We talk to you all, we talk to the other advisory committees, we talk to all of our stakeholders. It is a plethora of inputs to help determine that, but in the end, we make as the most common sense uh, 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 decisions that we can. We look at media usage, we look at the media vehicles, we look at the audiences that we're trying to reach. And, you know, in 2010, we got a lot of questions about the media that we were buying, you know, you didn't buy my media, what about this media in my district, all that. In the end, when we published our media buy list, it all stopped. We buy so much media, we make sure that we are reaching everybody that we need to reach. Now, it's gonna be on TV, it's, you're not gonna be able to turn around without seeing it. 
Now, whether or not you accept the messaging and you internalize it, we can't, we can't um, guarantee that. We can absolutely make sure that messaging is out there, and we will. So there's a lot of inputs that go into it. It's not just a willy-nilly, I like that, we're going to advertise there. There is a science behind it. And the Census Bureau, even though we have an agency that does that for us, they work very closely with us because we are trying to be good stewards of government money. We are spending taxpayer dollars. And as such, we do have to pay very good attention to how we do that. Yeah. And, and Ali Ahmed, Associate Director for Communications. You know, what, what, one thing I wanted to pull out from what Kendall's answer was is it's driven by the research and the modeling of what real estate, media real estate, reaches what audience. Um, and I think that's likely to continue to be the case uh, for 2030, certainly if it's done well. You know, we hire these experts on reaching uh, different audiences, as Kendall mentioned, and we uh, will sort of continue to evolve. It, the evolution from 2010 to 2020 in terms of the media that's available, how it's purchased, um, how it's packaged up and sold in terms of industry standards uh, couldn't have been more. I imagine there'll be even more dramatic changes before the next decennial census. Uh, and, and hopefully the folks, you know, were working on the media plan at that point in time come with the same sort of attitude of saying what's available and how does it reach you know, modeling down to that geographic level, you know, how does it reach that audience that we need to reach? And if I could just step on one of his points, um, that that's that's one of the reasons we hire YNR, and we and we build that team of subcontractors is that it's their they're experts in reaching these populations. They know and can negotiate for um, the the high powered media presence that you know we could not do this ourselves. Um, we know a lot, we know more every decade, but, but we rely on those ex the expertise of these very high-powered, very uh, established and, and well-respected media firms. Um, and we need to do that in a campaign of this nature. Anyone else? No? Um, well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Wright, thank you very much. Maria, Kendall, and Mario, and everyone. Next, the next session, we will be moving to the next session, and I understand Cynthia is not going to be with us today, but we will have Jason Devine and Jane Ingold presenting the proposed 2020 data products plan, and there's a discussant, Catherine Pettit. So, um, Jason, you could be my new best friend if you can help make up some time. Because oh. <laughs> we're running a little behind. So that okay, would be fantastic. Okay, we will do our best. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Jason Devine. I work in the population division. Jane Ingold will be my co-presenter today. Cynthia was very disappointed. Uh, she had to miss this, but she's doing her civic duty by serving on a jury. Uh, we're here to discuss her work on planning the suite of 2020 census data products. The planned census data products cover all the topics included on the census questionnaire accept citizenship and include many different geographies. Citizenship data will be available through a separate product known as the Citizen Voting Age Population File, or CVAP. All of the products I'm going to discuss include data for the 50 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. While we are working on the data product plans for the Pacific and Virgin Island areas, they are not covered in this presentation. Because the 2020 Data products cover such a wide range of topics. We have made sure staff are available in the room to help answer any questions you might have. In preparation for the 2020 census, we have conducted a comprehensive review of our suite of decennial data products. This review is necessary because of the implementation of a new disclosure avoidance methodology. The goal in designing the proposed suite of, of data products was to meet data user needs while maintaining data confidentiality through the use of formerly private disclosure avoidance methods. 
The formerly private disclosure avoidance methods being implemented this decade require balancing accuracy with privacy, which is harder for small geographies, complex variables such as family, relationship, small, complex variables such as family, relationship, or household data, and variables with many possible values such as detailed race. The session following this one will provide more information on the new disclosure avoidance methods being used for 2020. The proposed suite of 2020 data products and the content of the products will be similar to the 2010 data products. Stakeholder feedback has been an important part of this process and is ongoing. In this presentation, I'll walk you through the proposed products and discuss we are still working to resolve challenges related to disclosure avoidance. I'm going to change the size of the microphone. I think it's a little easier that way I can orient myself a little more towards, towards you. Our data products proposal has been informed by data user needs. The primary way we collected feedback was through a July 2018 Federal Register notice, its extension, and associated outreach. This notice asked data users to provide use cases for the decennial data products. We received approximately 1,200 comments, and comments provided use cases detailing legal, programmatic, or statistical needs for specific tables and geographies within the decennial products. Use cases for data products, tables, and levels of geography were used to inform the development of the proposed suite of 2020 data products. After each census, a complex array of data products are released to inform the public how the nation has changed. The Census Bureau has traditionally grouped tables together in the data products to satisfy a specific requirement or data user need. The release of each product then follows a schedule based on legal requirements, data user needs, and production review times. The first product that will be released from the 2020 census satisfies the constitutional basis for conducting the census, which is to apportion the U.S. House of Representatives. The apportionment product will be the first release of the 2020 census data products. The apportionment product will consist of the total resident population of the 50 states, plus the overseas federal employees, military and civilian, and their dependents living with them who are included in their home states. The population of the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico are also released as part of the apportionment product. The apportionment product not only shows how state representation will change, it also will be the first official counts of how the total population of the nation, states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico has changed since the last census. The apportionment product must be released within nine months of census day or by December 31st of 2020. There are no proposed updates for the apportionment product for 2020. The second product that will be released will satisfy Public Law 94-171, which directs the Census Bureau to provide data to the governors and legislative leadership in each of the 50 states for redistricting purposes. This product will be the first file released that will include demographic and housing characteristics for detailed geographies. The prototype for this product from the 2018 test was made available for comment Today and the design of this product will be finalized this summer. The subjects will include counts of the voting age population, counts by race and Hispanic or Latino origin, house units by occupancy status, with counts for the group quarters population for the seven main GQ types, with the inclusion of GQ date data being new for 2020. These data will be available at the census block level and must be released within, within one year of census day. Proposed updates for, the 2020, for 2020 include adding counts to the population in the seven major group quarters types, which were provided in a separate product in 20, 2010. Because this product will be available at the census block level, that means the subjects included in this release, including 63 race and Hispanic or Latino origin groups, will be available for the smallest level of geography the Census Bureau releases data for. The third product that will be re released will be the demographic profiles. These are straightforward profiles that provide critical demographic and housing characteristics about local communities as soon after the census as possible. They have been referred to as the Thank You America product. They will include data for each area on age by five-year age groups, sex, race, Hispanic and Latino origin, household type, relationship, the householder, the group quarters population, and housing occupancy and housing tenure. For 2020, we have proposed moving this product from the census track level to the place minor civil division level with the demographic profile, we add sex, five-year age groups, household type, relationship, and housing tenure to what was provided in previous files.
Well, the first three files that come out are limited and designed to meet a specific need. The fourth product, which will be called the Demographic and Housing Characteristics File in 2020, and that will replace what was previously known as Summary File 1, will include a wider range of detailed demographic and housing characteristics and will, will provide the foundation for later data products. Subjects will include detail age, sex, household type, family characteristics, relationship to the householder, data on the group quarters population, housing occupancy and tenure, with some of these subjects being iterated by major OMB race and ethnicity groups. Data in this product will be available at various levels of geography with the goal of providing data at the block level when supported by a use case and possible with the new disclosure avoidance methodology. The target release date will be the summer of 2021, and we have not been able to finalize the content for this file yet because of unresolved challenges due to disclosure avoidance. There are two unresolved challenges with using formally private disclosure avoidance methods with this file. The first involves tabulating or protecting tables that require the linkage of data from the person and housing records, for example, characteristic of characteristics about children and households or about the householder. The second is determining how to tabulate information on characteristic allocation, which may not be included in this product as it was in 2010. The Congressional District and Demographic and Housing Characteristics file replaces the Congressional District Summary file. And as in 2010, this file will simply provide a retabulation of the Demographic and Housing Characteristics file for the new congressional districts and will include the same subjects. This file will include data down to the census tracts within congressional districts with a target release date of the spring of 2023. The unresolved challenges with using formally private disclosure avoidance methods for this file are the same as for the demographic and housing characteristics file. For 2020, we are proposing a range of additional data products that will be similar, similar to those provided in 2010. The additional products include census briefs, which will provide summaries of population and housing data and display data visually through maps, graphs, and figures. The briefs will provide information down to the largest places and are planned to be released on a flow basis, beginning with the apportionment brief in December of 2020. Examples of census briefs from 2010 include reports on each major, major race group, the two or more race population, and the older population. We also have supplemental population and housing tables these tables will provide population and housing data, often providing comparisons to data from 2010. The first population and housing tables are planned to be released on a flow basis beginning in the fall of 2021. We also plan to produce special reports that will provide in-depth analysis of population and housing data not available in other data products. These are planned to be released on a flow basis starting in the fall of 2022. Examples of special reports from 2010 include reports on metropolitan area change, the emergency and transitional shelter population, and centenarians. Each of these additional products will be updated to include new content and will be modernized to incorporate new ways of disseminating data, and we don't anticipate any challenges with these products. As was already touched on, there are challenges that remain for the 2020 census data products. These challenges impact the detailed tables that were included in Summary File 1 in 2010, all of Summary File 2 and all of the American Indian Alaska Native Summary File. The remaining challenges include tabulating accurate counts and detailed demographic and housing characteristics for detailed race and Hispanic origin groups and the American Indian and Alaska Native groups, tabulating tables that require the linkage of data from the person and housing records, such as characteristics about children and households or about the householder, and tabulating accurate data for levels of geography beyond block, block group track county, state, and nation, such as school districts, urban areas, and American Indian and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian areas. Despite these challenges, our intent is to provide as much of these data as possible while maintaining accuracy and privacy protection. The next two slides summarize what I've just discussed. On the left, we have, the list, list, we have listed the proposed 2020 data products, then lined them up with the proposed updates and remaining challenges on the right. The apportionment and redistricting products are unchanged from 2010, except for the inclusion of the GQ data in the redistricting product. The demographic and housing characteristics file will, re will replace the demographic and housing characteristics summary file, also known as summary file one in 2010. And while we continue to draft individual tables, we're working to resolve challenges with tabulations for all the various levels of geography, tables that require linking data for the person and housing of files, and tabulations of characteristic item allocation. 
I talked about how the congressional district demographic and housing characteristics file was simply a retabulation of the demographic and housing characteristics file, but for new uh, congressional districts. And our data product plans include additional reports such as census briefs, population and housing tables, and special reports. The reports will be primarily sourced from the files listed above them in the table, so as I said, we don't see any additional issues with those tables, those reports. I discussed the unresolved challenges for products that include data for detailed race and Hispanic origin groups and American Indian Alaska Native groups. And while I didn't discuss the availability of a public use microdata file, the disclosure avoidance methods used this decade present both challenges and opportunities for a public use file, so it is something we continue to, to discuss. There were two additional data products we listed here in 2010 that we do not plan to publish for in 2020, but these uh, products will be available, the data in these products will be available in other files. So thank you. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Jane Ingold, who will talk about the schedule going forward and our dissemination platform. Thank you, Jason. Um, to the committee, Cynthia was disappointed. She couldn't be here, so she'll look forward to seeing you here in your next uh, committee me meeting in this venue. But you might also want to follow us as we go into our outreach with stakeholders through the spring and into the fall. And that's not a, a, a tight window, so we can be flexible there. Uh, Jason, Cynthia, and others from Population and Decennial will um, be presenting this information to other groups. Some of you might be members of those other groups, but so much. Uh, we discussed the tight mandate. We have a constitutional mandate to do apportionment and redistricting, so those two dates are fixed. The rest of our schedule is going to be designed from there, and that those products include what Jason has presented as well as the island areas data. And I also want to discuss with you the enterprise dissemination platform, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to, we wanted to show you how we kept in touch with users at both a micro level and on a re release planning level and information, and this was products at a glance. So we're committed not only to reach out and make presentations, but also to keep the information current and on, the, on our website. This is just one page from products at a glance. All the products are listed and described. So you see the geography, you'll see the release dates, there will be planned dates when we first post it, but then you may ha also have an opportunity, like we did in 2010, to interact with the actual table design and feedback. Here's that enterprise dissemination platform. After 2010, and now I better get to my notes so I get it right. While today's discussion is centered around the products we're planning to release for the 2020 census, we want to take a moment to tell you about the future of accessing data from the Census Bureau, including data from the 2020 census. In response to user feedback following the 2010 census, the Bureau developed an initiative to rely on the efficiency of its enterprise solutions. The Census Bureau has been developing a new dissemination platform to streamline the way you get data and digital content. Since 2016, we've made the platform publicly available as a preview or a beta site on data.census.gov and continuously updating that site every several months. And that goes with our Agile development. We're now a few months away from the, its official launch, and that's data.census.gov. This site will be the new way to access the full set of Census Bureau data, including data from the 2020 Census. The longer term goal for this new platform is for you to be able to access all Census data in one place, so you'll spend less time searching for data and more time using it. We're starting with the most popular surveys and programs, and they're on deck for release in 2019. The American Community Survey and the Economic Census and its surveys. We're also migrating data these data from Fact Finder, American Fact Finder, to data.census.gov. An important part of our agile development is your feedback as well. With that in mind, we encourage you to check out data.census.gov as we go from beta to production and tell us how we can make your experience better by emailing sedsci.feedback at census.gov. 
as we continue to improve the site beyond the launch. And you're able to, to get to that email site destination when you're on um, the other page. Right now, you can explore selected products from 2010. We have summary file one and its detailed tables, as well as both the 113th and 115th Congressional District summary file. The rest of the tables from 2000 and 2010 will be migrated to the new platform, with a few exceptions. We expect this data to be added to the new platform by the end of 2019. While we don't have time to do a demo today of the platform, please join our public webinar on April 9th at 1 p.m. No, sorry, I thought it was on the slide. And we'll keep that information for you and get it back to you. April 9th at 1 p.m., there's a deeper dive and it will be entitled Accessing Census Data in 2019, the transition to data.census.gov. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Jason who'll wrap up with our questions and then our discussant. Thank you, Jane. I'll just quickly go through the questions we provided for the committee. First question, what are your critical needs for decennial census data and at what levels of geography? Second question, do you have any suggestions for outreach and engagement about the 2020 data products with particular scientific, academic, or professional organizations? Do you have suggestions on how to convey the current challenges with tabulating the proposed 2020 data products, challenges with tabulating and pro the proposed 2020 data products to stakeholders, how to convey the challenges? That's what we're trying to get at with that question. And considering the changes and challenges discussed in this presentation, what concerns do you have? Thank you. Kathy. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. I thought I had the fun part of this presentation because there's all this effort and work and um, uh, uh, concern about getting the operations right and then we get this beautiful, beautiful data set. So, um, although I guess fun's in the eye of the beholder. But anyway, it's fun for me. Um, so I appreciate the chance to comment also while things are not set um, and to uh, discuss it on an early stage. So when I look at your first question, one, um, I will say when the Urban Institute uh, submitted its Federal Register um, comment on that, we had lively debates even within our research institution about which was the critical piece of the census project, um, census tables, and I am sure you can find a constituency for every item that was published in 2010, I'm, um, I am guessing. So it is a huge challenge that I'm recognizing about trying to um, satisfy so many different um, different types of users. Uh, but I, if you, um, there were 1,200 comments, so I understand that's a lot, but uh, would love to hear any big takeaways or surprises or things you didn't expect from that um, Federal Register call. Um, you mentioned the microdata product, so I assume, um, uh, I was just wondering why it wasn't listed under the considerations, if it's like that, handled separately or later, or how, how that decision-making process will happen on behalf of my um, uh, research colleagues at the Urban Institute who are concerned about that. The, um, the just that you mentioned also the citizenship data question, that there would be a separate uh, um, file that was produced. So whether or not you were thinking about whether you were considering having the citizenship question be part of the cross tabs, or if they're not, if it's not going to be in those other products at all, or it's still up for debate, that would be helpful to know. And then, uh, just to plug on formats, my institution and local organizations have really benefited from the modernizing, um, making data available through APIs. So the um, data.census.gov I think is fantastic for lay people, but. Um, but for um, other technical people, that variety of formats, um, including the APIs, have been a great help. So as you um, get to that part of it once the table structure is done. Thinking about suggestions for outreach and engagement, and there's a ton of acronyms on here that we can share later. I'm sure that 
Um, this is a really great role for CSAC since we represent such diverse um, folks to think about the different aspects and who we care about, um, not just my uh, personal opinion about which tables I love best, but um, thinking about cross-sector groups, and many of these I'm sure you've already thought of, that span things. So the um, IPUM site that we use so much, they must know how many people access the 2010 microdata, for example. So they um, have some sort of user base or, or idea of, um, or how many, they know what queries people do on the 2010 original short form data. Or, so I think there's a lot of information about what data is used from online places like Policy Map is an online mapping service for community users. There seem to be a lot of questions about which tables are most important. So thinking about those age breaks and what's important for I don't know, people that think about early childhood versus or youth development or those kinds of groups or um, older adults and figuring out what those age cuts might be if you're, look, if you're looking to broaden the age groups to be able to um, uh, be able to release more characteristics seem like one of those options. So thinking about what those differences and cuts are. Um, uh, race, ethnicity, you mentioned the NAC already, so I assume that's covered um, well. There's issues around sector-specific things. The use cases from the Urban Institute did involve um, education and school district, um, building things up for the school catchment areas, for example. Um, for housing, we have a whole uh, group that focuses on, on homeownership policies, so what is the tenure cuts that are important for the policy recommendations. Uh, I just, um, local state government, obviously, I, there's a lot of those academics I felt like are gonna be the most vocal already. And the private sector, I think that already came up around vendors or retail associations. So m mostly I was trying, I, you know from the, um, where are your gaps? So who haven't you heard of from? The Federal Register process is obviously not a uh, friendly, you know, every day on the street kind of process. So who is being left out that regularly uses this data? And we can help, um, some of us can help on the community group side uh, that wouldn't be the people, or I'm not sure how many city governments you heard from in that Federal Register um, call. So thinking, uh, if you can help us think of, uh, identify some particular gaps, I think that we are all really eager to help um, try to make those connections for you. And the other thing you didn't mention, which I thought would should be a good source, is your own website. So American Fact Finder, what are those queries? Like who's hitting the 2010 census data? Um, uh, what kind of tables are they asking for? I don't know, that felt like another big source of actual um, use data that you can tap into if you have hopefully historic records, but uh, particularly now. Um, conveying the challenge to stakeholders, so this is really near and dear to my heart, so I was very excited to be the discussant again. Um, I think that there's a ton of education about how 2010 was processed. So everyone, I mean, the, I would say that the general um, uh, user of 2010 products believes that those were the actual counts. They don't understand what protections or swapping or noise or whatever was involved there. So um, that's gonna be a baseline piece that will need to be, um, I think will help as you educate people. Um, I'm a big fan of the ACS user guides. So I don't know if I don't know how many people know it, but the, they, had, they were guides like guides for statisticians, researchers, guides for local government, I don't know. They were guides for different, um, uh, different user groups that were amazing. I use these all the time and I refer people to them all the time. So whoever developed those, thinking about language and use cases and um, interpretation, it had all the same information, like how do you calculate you know, statistical significance with the MOEs, but, um, but it was, had a voice and tone and purpose that was um, really um, uh, useful that it was tailored. So um, I thought you have these, um, I've also had connections over the past couple of years with 
your local dissemination specialists and have all been great, right? And they talk to all kinds of people. So testing out any education materials or um, language around uh, slideshows around differential privacy for the every man or I don't know what the, um, uh, those pieces are, the, the you know, FAQs um, with them, I think they'll have a really good perspective of um, a wide array of users, including you know, chambers of commerce and, uh, uh, and the local government and the community groups. Um, and then, I mean, I think overarching just transparency about the priorities in the decision making. So if, you know, the redistricting and the, um, uh, you know, the congressional based files, you know, are obviously, um, if everything is, all those decisions are made so that those are the most accurate. Um, or maybe uh, is it that you sacrifice some of the housing characteristics accuracy for the race or um, so I think those decisions would be helpful more about not that there's going to be a right answer and definitely not from me who's not a statistician but more about fitness of use so this is what I care about like what are the implications of the change in the methods for me so should I be concerned about comparing things over time now if it's a different methodology um, I assume, I wasn't sure, I assume everything will be internally consistent across all the products, but if they're not, um, I remember confusion about, you know, SF3 and SF1 having different numbers um, at the track level. Sort of what are the measures of uncertainty that I should be looking at? Um, sort of uh, use cases about decisions, like if you want to show, you know, that homeownership is lower for Latinos than um, non-Hispanic whites. You don't need, eh, you know, you don't need perfect numbers. Maybe it doesn't matter to the, um, uh, you know, to the actual decimal points out. But if you're trying to figure out, you know, how many childcare slots um, that you are going to authorize as a state, then that feels like you need more specific numbers. So, you know, just um, thinking about it that way, about communicating, um, how, about these, these, these compromises are gonna make lots of people unhappy. So I'm guessing, sorry. Um, uh, some people will be dissatisfied. So just thinking about what those, um, yeah, how it affects the different, different use cases that are, that are there. So those are some things that, um, uh, that occurred to me as I was looking through your presentation. And, uh, you have a big job ahead of you. So I'm, um, I'm really grateful that you're um, reaching out to the users, uh, including uh, my personal constituencies, to, um, to find out what the um, best path forward is as we all, um, and, and for us to be more educated about these new decisions and the new processes. Do you want to respond to any of that first? Yes, uh, Jason Devine, Census Bureau. Thank you, Kathy, for your comments and questions. A lot of great inf information. I think I can go through and, and try and answer some of your questions and then respond to some of the input you provided. Um, and, and thank you for recognizing the incredible challenge and the diversity of our, our constituents. Obviously, absolutely, we have, uh, we have our two priorities, redistricting, apportionment and redistricting. Um, but we also recognize that we have to provide detailed data to a diverse set of, of constituents, and that's what we're trying to work through here for 2020. Um, but your next question was a great question. Any big takeaways from the uh, Federal Register notice? Um, I've gone through many of the, of the comments we received, and I have, I have three takeaways. Um, but by the way, the comments are, many of them are available online. There's a public site. I don't have the, the, the location now. We can make it Am available to you. Am I just lazy that I didn't read all 1,200? <laughs> yeah. um, and when we do our, we're going to do a final Federal Register notice, and we do, we'll summarize those comments. Um, but first, what, from going through the comments, what I, I, I saw was that they really, data users understand this need for protecting the confidentiality of the data and not providing data, being careful about what you provide at low levels of geography and protecting that data, um, and also recognizing the challenges of implementing a new disclosure avoidance methodology, and it was mentioned several times to proceed with caution, right, urge caution. Um, second, um, Going through the, the, the responses, you get this, this really great appreciation of how the census data, and I think it was said earlier how the census data is the back, backbone of our statistical system. 
Um, on top of apportionment and redistricting, um, the distribution of federal funds, these data are critical for um, many different types of programs. They do an incredible amount of good for their communities and the nation, and this really comes out when you see uh, what people provided in those Federal Register notice, everything from measuring racial disparities, public health, cancer rates, um, disaster response planning, forecasting, I could go on and on, just a lot of, and something that I found really interesting about going through the, the comments was I think this group, this committee really, the, what we received was well represented. This group represents that sort of cro collection of data users, um, whether it's academics or people working in the public health field or private sector, nonprofits. Uh, I saw rep representation from all those groups in the Federal Register notice, but I think your suggestion though of looking in those what we received and seeing where there are gaps for how we can sort of uh, do some additional outreach, I think is a great one. Um, and third, it was kind of came out there is these different dimensions of, of what's important for data users. Um, for some data users, it was consistency across time. For others, it was really getting that sort of granular, that granular data down to lower levels of geography. And for others, the information that comes out of the census on the household structure and family type was really important. So you kind of start to see there are these different, different areas of where people really are looking to get data from for their particular use. Um, you mentioned, you asked about the microdata, and in the presentation, my, my uh, bullet said there are challenges and opportunities for the, with the new disclosure avoidance methodology, and I think as we go into the next session, you, you'll, you, we may discuss this more, but it, basically the idea is with this new protection, you're actually protecting the underlying microdata to the point where it's not as sensitive maybe as it would have been considered in previous decades, and I'm sure John A. Bout will talk more about that, but it also, once it's protected, it may not serve the use that researchers are used to getting out of a public use microfile. Um, so that's kind of this idea of, of opportunities and challenges. You asked about the, if there are any thoughts on the citizenship data and with the redistricting file, I did mention the, the CVAP product, which is an annual tabulation with data on the citizen voting age population by race and ethnicity. Um, the citizen, citizenship question, as we know, came was a late addition, so we we're really still talking through and considering how that would be included in the 2020 data products. Um, my understanding, and I talked to James Whitehorn, who represents the redistricting activities at Census, um, the interest from those who use the data, it's, it's not necessarily they'd want it in the same file, but that they'd want it around the same time. And I don't know, James, if you want to add anything to that, I'll give you an opportunity. Okay. Um, you asked if we're thinking at, you mentioned thinking ahead about content, so um, I'll let Jane uh, say a little bit about that since she kind of covered the dissemination part of this uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> Kendall a couple times said she didn't want to date herself, but then she said census 2000. I can go back further, and that's something that we've always been klutzy with is the format of dissemination, tapes, introducing CDs and DVDs, introducing Fact Finder, great, but that's part of the kickstart we got after 2010 was to get to that a API. You brought it up. It wasn't in the words I read, but that's what, where we're going. And the deputy director is keeping us on that route so that it, it is hopefully someday a compound or a collective API that meets the needs of the nation in a faster, rapid highway, and that comes from Bob Groves, the, you know, the rapid information highway we have to keep up with. So we are looking at that, and that's the key part of the SEDSI Eddy platform. And it gives you, you know, something to look at, too, if you're just a kid doing homework. But we're looking at that API and how that feeds Eddy, but also is uh, available to the data users. Jason Devine, Census Bureau, just to cover the last uh, slides you provided. So your suggestions for outreach and engagement, thank you. Um, We're really in the heavy into our pl planning right now for outreach. Um, we have a lot of different things scheduled, and uh, I think we can work several of your suggestions into those plans, um, especially the idea of looking for gaps in the Federal Register Notice, as I mentioned. And uh, we also asked about conveying the challenges to stakeholders. Thanks for the suggestions, and I definitely saw suggestions that I think we can incorporate into how we uh, work to communicate the challenges with, uh, 
with this to the stakeholders. So thank you. Other questions from the committee? Yeah, Juan Pablo. This is Juan Pablo Orcad. First, thank you, <clears throat> sorry, thank you for your presentation and thank you, Kathy, for your very thoughtful comments. I just wanted to add more ideas on people to reach out to or some, something a little bit different. Uh, and this might be more targeted outreach. Uh, so one would be uh, media outlets, specifically people in media outlets who make use of census data, who make visualizations, et cetera. Uh, there may not be that many with national impact, but it might be a good uh, group of people to, to work with. Uh, the other one that came to mind is that, uh, being that I'm a computer science professor, um, everybody wants to teach data science these days in one way or another at different scales. Um, it would be useful perhaps to reach out to the authors of textbooks that are being widely used to include some census data. I mean, this is not like really big data, but for the smaller data uh, items. So I'm teaching a, an introductory programming course that's data oriented right now, and I am using census data. Uh, but the, the author of the textbook, which is one of the most popular ones around the country, is now using it. Uh, and I think it would be great to use it. It might be a way of introducing a lot more people to census data. And I think it's, it's also good for the instructors, because in my, from my perspective, it helps students do interesting things with data while relating to their learning something about their community or their country as well. Did anyone else, Mario? Did you have any? No. no. No one else, no? I'll just echo what Kathy said, that I think this is the funnest part of the meeting. The, I get so excited thinking about what it was like in 2011 when we got all the data and we just like pounced on it. Like, you know, we were kittens with a mouse coming out of the hole. We were so excited. So this is great. And the ACS user's guides are a fantastic model. They're so helpful and they're oriented to different groups. So I think that would go a long way for different users as they're dealing with um, new kinds of products. I think we're good. Tommy Wright, uh, thank you very much. Oh, oh. something. We you got you on track. Didn't you we? did, Jane. Yes. You did. Yes. You did. Uh, and Jason, thank you very much. And thank my you, new Kathy. best friend. Yes. <laughs> and thank you, Kathy, <laughs> and everyone. Okay. The next presentation by John A. Bowd and uh, Tori Velkoff, Managing Privacy Laws Budget for the 2020 Census. Thank you, Tommy. Um, hi, I'm Tori Velkoff. I'm, I really don't have a speaking role in this presentation, but I'm, I'm kind of the, the translation between the, the previous presentation and John's, uh, John's presentation. I think it's clear from Jason and Jane's presentation that we're very committed to putting out data products from the 2020 Census, and we're very interested in getting your feedback on those data products. You may have also noticed there's some issues uh, that we haven't resolved yet for some of those data products, and uh, John will go into those in detail, um, and that makes it difficult for us. As a demographer, as a data user, I want to put out as much data as I possibly can, and I have my good friend here who wants to keep the data as confidential as he can. So we're trying to strike a balance, and uh, we're working very closely together to make sure that we're putting out data that's usable by our data users, um, but is also confidential. And John is going to walk you through the risks that uh, face us if we continue to put out our data uh, using the same disclosure avoidance that we used in the past, and he's going to talk about the new methodology. Um, and again, it's, you're going to see that there's a balance here that we're going to have to strike of confidentiality and, and putting out data. And we're very interested in hearing your feedback on that. With that, I'll turn it over to John. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Tori. For, for those of you who don't realize it, uh, Tori's assigned role <laughs> is to remind me at all possible occasions that the reason that you run surveys and censuses is to publish data and our users are expecting it. And as, as a, uh, an active user of data <laughs> for many years from the Census Bureau, I, uh, I'm uh, fully aware of that. I want to say before I start on the slides that um, the presentation you just heard from uh, Jason and Jane represents um, a, a very concerted effort to um, uh, 
uh, inside the entire Census Bureau to get our arms around uh, what it means to do confidentiality protection and publish useful data products in the 21st century. And as the discussants have uh, properly noted, that's not uh, a straightforward task. So I'm going to try to give you some um, uh, background on how we're doing it. Um, I'm anxious to hear the comments of the whole committee, and I'll try to leave as much time for discussion as I can. Okay. Ah, yes, it's not going to come up on this screen. It's going to come up on that one with this tool. <laughs> so uh, the first thing I want to do is, is spend a few minutes summarizing the presentation that I made to the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science on February 16th. Some of you may have uh, seen some of the um, reports about this. There's no technical paper to, to circulate yet in this, in this regard, but it, um, I made a report on the high-level summary of the reconstruction abetted re-identification study that we did using the 2010 census. There will be a technical paper um, soon. <laughs> I'm the binding constraint. Uh, anyone who's ever co-authored with me knows that the binding constraint ends up being the, uh, um, the busiest co-author. Uh, Ron has expressed a similar um, lament about the papers where he's the binding constraint that he's on the teams for. So uh, what we did was we did database reconstruction using the, um, the theory that was originally laid out in uh, uh, Diner and Nassim. We talked about this at length in several CSECs, so I'm not going to uh, belabor how that theory works. Uh, suffice it to say that we reconstructed a record for every single one of the 308,745,538 people in the 2010 census. I had to say that number all the way out to the units placed so many times under oath that I can now just sort of spew it out. Um, we had one record for everybody. All right. uh, that record contained the tabulation variables from um, summary file one primarily, block and tract level tables. And uh, so those, some, those variables were the complete 15-digit census ID code uh, for your geography down to the block, your age in years, your sex, the race that you declared, all 63 categories, so that's every possible combination of the uh, six OMB categories, and your ethnicity. So those were the variables that were reconstructed. Those are all the tabulation variables that we used. We didn't use relationship to the householder. We then took those reconstructed records and um, did record linkage to uh, a consolidated set of commercial databases that had been acquired around the 2010 census for the purposes of supporting research uh, about the 2010 census. And when those records linked, we acquired the PII associated with a record in those 309 million uh, reconstructed records. So the PII come from commercial databases. The PII in this case is um, your name and address, but they've been transformed in our internal data sets so the researchers don't see the name and address. The researchers see a thing that we call a protected identification key and a MAF ID. And the MAF ID has been recoded into the block, so really we're talking about the PIC and the block are the PII that get acquired here. Um, so it, we call the successful linkage to the commercial data a putative re-identification. It simulates what someone with access to these commercial data would be able to do if they had done the reconstruction themselves. We compared the putative re-identifications directly to the confidential data, the, the census edited file, what is considered the gold standard summary of the 2010 census. Um, when we had a successful linkage to the confidential data, that's a confirmed re-identification. A successful linkage was defined as matching on every variable, name, address, sex, race, ethnicity, age, and years. And uh, so that meant that the record that, the, that was putatively identified was an exact image of the record that we had internally. All right, we called the successful linkage to confidential data confirmed re-identification. And the specific harm from this particular experiment was that had someone done it on the outside, they would have learned the actual self-response on race and ethnicity uh, exactly, not statistically. So here are, the, here are the base results. Um, you can reconstruct the block and the voting age 
correctly for all 6,207,027 6, inhabited blocks in the 2010 census, and the fact that a block was inhabited in the 2010 census wasn't given any confidentiality protections in the swapping system that was used. Uh, we said in our documents that the swapping wasn't going to affect population counts or uh, voting age population counts, and it didn't, so that's why you can exactly reconstruct those. Uh, that means that we had block, sex, age, race, and ethnicity reconstructed, and those in the reconstructed file, those five variables, exactly matched a, a CEF record for 46% of the population. And that's salient because um, more than half of the records in the uh, census edited file are population uniques on those five variables. So what you have is the intersection of uh, the ability to get an exact linkage in a record, in a database where on those five variables, uh, more than half of the records are unique. If you allow plus or minus one year variation in the age, which is the same criterion we used for linking to the commercial data, then 71% of the population links back uh, uniquely to the, uh, to the CEF. So uh, that uh, in and of itself, uh, signals that there's a problem with the uh, protection system that was used in the 2010 census if we were to use it going forward. It was not an option to do anything more sophisticated with the 2010 census at the time it was done. I want to be clear about that and I sometimes forget to re remind people that, that this is technology that, that bloomed during the 2010s. Um, that said, we confirmed the name, block, sex, age, race, and ethnicity for 38 percent of the putative re-identifications, or 17 percent of the total population, about 52 million people. And so for the for confirmed re-identifications, race and ethnicity are learned exactly and not statistically. All right. Okay. That's the summary. Uh, here are the, um, a summary of the schedule of publications from the um, 2010 census that you just heard. And, uh, I, I carefully made this uh, match the uh, presentation that Jason and Jane gave. Uh, and so you'll see the same products and approximately the same uh, timetable. Um, and we're just going to go through them now. I will point out for the record that public use microdata is sitting there uh, without a time schedule for after all other releases. That's not chipped in stone uh, because the research concerning how to release public use microdata isn't complete, but uh, there is an, 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 a willingness and an intention to release some public use microdata. All right, so the first issue, I actually can't read that screen, so I need to get this synced up here so I can read what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first thing I want to talk about is something that I think uh, Kunal will have more to comment on. One of the biggest um, technical challenges to implementing formal privacy for publications from the census is that the Census Bureau uses a concept in developing its tabular products um, that didn't have a technical name, um, and so we had to invent the technical name, so we call them invariants. That means that the number that you see is exactly the same as the number that is in the confidential data or for the database uh, people in the room, the query answer on Ceph is the same as the query answer on the protected microdata or in the protected table. Uh, this concept does not appear in the formal privacy literature. The kinds of things that they prove theorems about simply don't allow this. So, <laughs> uh, so we had to do all the new science for this, and, and that has been an ongoing exercise. The, the several papers have been under internal and limited external peer review for almost nine months now. Uh, I will say that my participation was briefly interrupted uh, to take a tour of the federal courthouses. Uh, but the others were continuing to work on this. <laughs> so, so the first thing to establish is that this concept of an invariant, something that is published as enumerated, there's only one constitutional mandate and that is that the reapportionment shall be based upon the actual enumeration. And so we have uh, interpreted that as a mandate uh, that that has to be done with an invariant. All right. There are no statutory invariants in spite of uh, beliefs in some parts of our user community. Confidentiality protection applies 
to all Census Bureau products. And at the beginning of the exercise of developing formally private methods for the 2020 Census, we got a written opinion from the Chief Counsel of the Economic Statistics in, in the Office of the General Counsel at Commerce confirming that confidentiality protection applies to all Census Bureau products and that the standard was preventing the association of a name with a particular data item, a name and address, identifying the respondent and associating that identified respondent with a particular data item. All right. Historically, on the other hand, there have been many invariants. In the 2010 pu publications, the total population was invariant at every geographic level down to the block. The voting age population was invariant at every geographic level down to the block. The number of housing units was invariant at every geographic level. The number of occupied housing units was invariant. And the number and type of group quarters was invariant at every geographic level. Those are historical invariants that were um, designed into the disclosure avoidance systems that were used in 1990, 2000, and 2010. Uh, much of our research has indicated that the population and voting age population invariants at the block level are the main reason why the reconstruction of microdata from the tabular products of the 2010 census is so precise. And so we've made an effort to uh, discuss with the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee relaxing invariants for the 2020 census and in the end-to-end -end test products that were just released the invariants were the total population for the, for the census area, which happens to have been Providence, Rhode Island, so that's the highest geographic level at which you can uh, apply it. That was the only county that was tested um, in the peak operations. The number of housing units at all geographic levels was left invariant. Uh, that's an operational constraint. Many of the procedures that we do in conducting the updates of the master address file rely on being able to communicate uh, the number of addresses so widely that it's extremely difficult to treat that as a confidential data item. So we treat that as an operational constraint, the existence of that invariant. The number of occupied housing units was invariant because the programmers couldn't relax that invariant in time to meet the production constraints for the 18 test. But it, uh, the ability to relax it will be engineered into the next version of the, of the software. The number and type of group quarters at all geographic levels, there were only seven group quarters types in, the, in table P42 of the PL94 data. Uh, that's a very complicated one. And, uh, uh, one of the presentations that accompanied this presentation, one of the white papers on the site, is Dan Kiefer's explanation. He's the scientific lead of the team developing these algorithms, explanation of just how challenging the group quarters invariant is. But, a prison is a prison. Um, the idea that you might be able to noise up that that's a prison um, uh, is, is inconsistent with the way we do all of our economic products and inconsistent with the historical treatment of group quarters and basically inconsistent with um, common sense. So, uh, so no attempt is being made to relax those kinds of invariants because they, they are sensible constraints on, on the system. And just remind everyone, as I've said before, DCEP sets the invariants. They are not set by the uh, scientific committee, uh, scientific team doing the research or by the engineers. All right, okay. I think I've already made most of the points on this slide, but um, the problem with invariants is that once you put the invariant in, the promises, the guarantees that formal privacy produces are compromised. You can no longer say that you have controlled the ability of an external user to um, do a reconstruction and use those reconstructed data to do a re-identification up to the limits of e to the epsilon or e to the two epsilon, uh, whichever uh, um, semantic system you use. So that's a problem because then you have to try to quantify exactly how much you have um, compromised that guarantee. And that becomes another problem because infinity is hard to quantify. And every time you put an invariant in, you create some configuration of external users who have no 
uh, bound on, on their ability to do that reconstruction. Now, some of them are monumentally implausible, but many of them are not. And the whole idea behind formal privacy is to eliminate that kind of assumption from your reasoning and to be able to say that for this set of attackers, which you make as general as possible and in full-on formal privacy, that set of attackers is all possible attackers with all possible information sets, this promise still holds. So we're trying to understand, when we put an invariant in the system, how it has compromised uh, that particular feature of formal privacy. So to manage the privacy loss budget for the uh, 2020 products, you have to think of the tables as coming in fundamentally three forms. Person level tables, and so that is the bulk of the redistricting data are person level tables uh, for uh, the demographers in the room. That's universe total population or universe group quarters population or universe households population. Those are person level queries. For the computer scientists, uh, though they can be constructed entirely by queries addressed to a single table in the hierarchical database that constitutes the CEPH, the person table. Uh, those were the ones that we had to have a working prototype for in order to do the 2018 end-to-end -end test products. And so uh, the system that has been built can manage a privacy loss budget for that type of table uh, uh, the citizen voting age population tables, the CVAP tables have the same structure. So that technology is available for that structure. Um, many of the tables in the new demographic and housing characteristics uh, publication, the successor to SF1, can also be covered with this technology. But only some of the tables using detailed race and ethnicity in American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiians can be covered. The, the, their, these techniques are not good for managing the privacy loss budget for sparse distributions of small populations. Um, that uh, You need a different toolkit, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. For household level queries, the PL94171 only has one such table and CVAP has none. And it was a very simple table, it was just occupied housing, so it could be done using the same technology. Um, that technology generalizes, but as Tori very politely pointed out, we haven't shown that we can actually scale that technology to the household level queries on the order of what uh, Jason and Jane outlined earlier. We believe it'll scale and we have uh, available um, algorithms that seem to, to scale, but that research is certainly uh, ongoing. That potentially can also be used for the detailed race, ethnicity, and AIAN products, but we need some more experimentation. The household level queries there were simpler than the person level queries, um, but uh, that's, that's still an open question. The other challenge is household person queries. Uh, in uh, de demographic terms, how many uh, people of this characteristic, children, live with householders of this characteristic, white. That's a join in database terms. And I'll get to more technical discussion of this, but uh, those joins are extremely challenging for uh, formal privacy models. A fact that was known to the team when we started a fact that's been known to me for almost a decade because we've been trying to do this with other data sets that involve joins and we always get to the point where you take a deep breath and say, these are the joins that we can now do and you cheer, but they're not all the joins you wanted. <laughs> they never are. Um, fi finally, the way that the person and household level queries have been implemented would permit the release of public use microdata because the tabulation systems that the Census Bureau has inhale microdata to do the tabulation, so we've made the, the confidentiality protection system uh, create microdata that reproduces the protected tables. So that's just a post-processing. But those microdata for the households don't link to the microdata for the persons, and if you try to put them back together and then do the join tabulations, they're monumentally more noisy than if you estimate the join tabulations with their own formally private mechanism. That is 
the main challenge there. Okay. How do you allocate privacy loss across sets of tables? Um, that is new science. Most of it was developed by our academic partners, um, and most of it was developed with funding from people, from agencies that are not the Census Bureau. And I uh, also provide a, a talk by Michael Hay, one of those uh, academic partners, with the CSAC materials. So, so they, they required a, um, an extension of formal privacy to cover the entire database rather than table by table. If you look at almost all of the original work in differential privacy, uh, you begin with a very simple definition of a database, rows and columns, uh, which in a relational database is just a single table. So this work begins with the definition of the entire database, all of the tables that are in it, all the primary keys, all the foreign keys, and, uh, and the set of queries using structured query language, SQL, that can be uh, allowed. Once you've set it up this way, then you can take the privacy loss budget and you can assign a part of it to the person, a part of it to the household, a part of it to the joins. You can review a join and say that join's not allowed, so you're just not going to answer that query, or that join has unknown sensitivity, a technical term in formal privacy, so you have to estimate the sensitivity, so you have to give some of the privacy loss budget to estimating the sensitivity. Those systems now exist in prototype uh, with demonstration products, and the use case for the demonstration products was the 2010 census, so uh, they have been developed with our use case in mind, uh, but they, uh, they are definitely not at the ready to test at scale uh, point, and they don't satisfy the design requirement that the Census Bureau gave the disclosure avoidance system of producing microdata from which you can tabulate. Instead, they produce protected tables. And so we are in active discussion with uh, all of our colleagues at the Census Bureau about how to address this requirement uh, of um, if these must produce microdata, we don't know how to do it yet. We might know how to do it in time, but we don't know how to do it yet. On the other hand, we do know how to produce the protected tables, and they could in principle be the engine from which the tabulations are done. Tori is holding back, wanting to comment, because this is like inventing an entire uh, <laughs> uh, structure that doesn't exist. I don't think it's quite as bad as that, but I admit that it's a very serious challenge that the, that we haven't figured out how to have these things produce microdata. Um, all right. So in allocating um, the privacy loss budget, I would summarize the situation this way. That for the person tables, this is mostly a solved problem. And that will cover uh, a fair amount of uh, the tables that uh, Jason and Jane talked about. It's a tractable problem which I believe will yield to our uh, research efforts for the balance of the tables in uh, DHC that are not joined tables and for the household tables in DHC. One of the things that we need to do, however, is we need to optimize the privacy loss budget across the geographic hierarchy. For the test, it was distributed equally to the nation, state, county, tract, block group, and block, and that's probably not an optimal allocation. It was also not structured to favor the population count over the um, interior cells of the race and voting age by within those population counts. So those are areas where optimization will almost certainly yield better um, outcomes with the same privacy loss budget. Allocating privacy loss to the household person tables and to sparse tables. I think I've done the to challenges of the household person join adequately. Um, the sparse tables, which are in the successors to summary file two and the AIAN tables, present a genuine new challenge that the, uh, that the in-place algorithms were not designed to do. And uh, that wasn't an accident. The, the charge to the team initially was get all of the redistricting data and the bulk of SF1 uh, under control, and the only SF1, old SF1 tables that are not covered by uh, those besides the joins are, uh, are the 
county level detailed race and ethnicity table, so they've been moved into the uh, successor product to SF2. We need a data dependent set of algorithms, and we have avoided data dependent algorithms up until now for two reasons. Uh, one, they make the calculation of the um, margins of error associated with the disclosure avoidance more difficult. And two, for the test case, redistricting data, they didn't perform as well as our data independent algorithms when we were doing our initial research, so we specialized in data independent algorithms. That said, all of the post-processing, and I don't know how much we'll get into that, that we do to the differentially private measurements introduces some data dependence anyway, so that we're, we're, we are now developing methods for conveying the uncertainty associated with disclosure avoidance that includes allowing for the, what happened because of the post-processing. All right. Just have two more slides. This one I was encouraged to change the slide title of, so I won't, uh, I won't say what I originally had, had uh, put here, but it's very important for us to continue on the path of implementing formal privacy here. Differential privacy is just one example of formally private confidentiality protection systems. They all have extremely important properties for operating as a data publisher in a data-rich world, and they are rapidly becoming the industry standard for convincing uh, your, your data suppliers and data users that you have actually applied a meaningful confidentiality protection in the data publications. That is absolutely necessary for the block level publications. Our reconstruction experiments uh, just uh, make that crystal clear. But you can't just do it to one part of the system. It's very much like discovering a problem with your encryption system that, uh, that requires a repair. And you, you can't just patch it on the left side and leave it alone on the right side. You have to figure out how to fix the whole thing. And in the transition, there can be um, moments of angst. Uh, we are in the transition. We have encountered some of those moments of angst. But I don't think that they're um, insurmountable. If I weren't an optimist, I wouldn't be able to convey optimism to my colleagues. I hope that I'm able to continue to be an optimist. But it's important also to be a realist. Some of the things are not going to be solved in the timetable that we normally have. I don't know which ones those are. I don't think any of the ones that we've discussed today are in the set of things that can't be solved. But uh, if you don't have a solution in your hand, you can't promise that you will have a solution in your hand a week from now. It's just not an option to do some of the things the old way and some of the things the new way, because everything you do the old way compromises what you did the new way, and there was no point in doing it. So we're going to have to uh, get through this. And I'm extremely grateful, all of us are extremely grateful, for the participation that our user community has had in helping us isolate the use cases. It's true that we haven't had to call out the use cases with such precision in the past, but calling those use cases out with precision can make the data better. They will make the publications better, and, and they will make them more useful. So it's important, and um, we're all going to walk this learning curve together. Uh, here are the questions for CSAC. Uh, I actually happen to know that Kunal's going to answer them all, so I won't read them, and then we'll just start the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kunal Talwar, CSAC. Uh, so I guess I won't answer them all, but I'll uh, at least have all of them on my slides. I'll answer some of them, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, the rest of the CSAC will help uh, discuss the others. Uh, okay, so I guess just to say a little bit more about uh, the reconstruction attack that uh, that John talked about. Uh, 
I think the fact that this, I would say, relatively simple reconstruction attack works so well should be very worrying. And the fact that it gets to something like 52 million people uh, should not be taken to mean that that's the amount of exposure that this data has, because this was, in some sense, one of the simplest attacks, the uh, kind of attack that was published back in 2003. Uh, and we know that if you have some other additional information, you could mount more sophisticated attacks than the ones uh, John tried. Uh, so we should really view this 52 million as, as a lower bound on what's possible. Uh, and so if we get to a point where we have, say, moved, or moved the needle so that these particular attacks fail, we shouldn't take that to mean that we have succeeded. Uh, so I think that's kind of the importance of having a formal privacy guarantee, uh, that it, uh, it gives you some kind of a mathematical assurance that not only this attack, but all other attacks will also be prevented by these techniques. Uh, I guess I also wanted to mention the, so one of the things that John talked about was the uh, were the tables which, have, which are household and person tables, which were not used in these attacks, uh, but they do contain a lot of information. So uh, they, in some sense, uh, further kind of make people a bit more unique than they were already in the data set, uh, which would allow for attacks like this to be even more successful. Uh, so if we want to publish those tables, that's another form of uh, stronger attacks that are feasible. And I guess it also points to why it is uh, challenging to release those uh, household person type tables. Okay, so well, with that being said, I guess I'll go over the questions that uh, John listed and I guess uh, say something about them. Uh, so the first question that John asked was, uh, how should the Census Bureau communicate the vulnerabilities that invariants produce when trying to eliminate them from, while trying to eliminate them from the publications. Uh, so I guess I can try to give my perspective on how I see these invariants. So uh, I guess invariants are, in some sense, some kind of uh, what we call auxiliary information in formal privacy analysis, uh, but a very specific kind, they're very exact kinds of auxiliary information. Uh, and what these invariants end up doing is they are putting strong constraints on uh, what the data set could be. So if I start out knowing nothing about the data set, uh, so this is a very cartoon picture, not at all accurate, but uh, this is two dimensional, I can draw it. Uh, uh, and hopefully, it, and it actually conveys the intuition of why the invariants are challenging. So here in blue are, let's say, all the integer lattice points. These are the set of feasible data sets. Now, what a privacy mechanism does is instead of telling you which of these data sets, which of these points is the actual data sets, uh, it defines some distribution around the correct data set. So I guess I've tried to draw it using uh, uh, some kind of a blob. Uh, and I give you some sample from this blob. Now, if you have this sample from the blob, there's still considerable uncertainty about where this where the original data set would be, because uh, uh, any particular sample from this blob uh, will be in similar blobs around lots of possible data sets. Uh, and in some sense, this is uh, one of the primary ways in which uh, these formal privacy guarantees uh, work. Uh, not the only way, but, uh, uh, but kind of a, uh, a good proxy for uh, what, these, uh, this, uh, what these formal privacy methods do. Now, when I place some invariance on the data set, if I tell you a little bit of uh, information uh, precisely, what that often ends up doing, and this may not be clear in two dimensions, but when you think of very high dimensional data, uh, this is pretty much how it looks like. Uh, it reduces the set of feasible data sets uh, to a smaller number. So in this picture, uh, given the invariance, uh, only the red points are possible data sets. The invariants already rule out all the blue points. And now, 
just given the small amount of information, you know that the actual data set is one of the red points in this picture. And now I guess you can see where I'm going. Uh, if now I give you a blob around one of these red points uh, and a sample from that, uh, it's very easy to figure out that the, uh, the only red point this sample could have come from was the correct data set. So you've uh, ensured reconstruction uh, or made reconstruction easier even while giving a relatively small amount of information, a small amount of invariance. So I guess that's uh, one way to see why invariants uh, uh, seriously uh, make it, uh, seriously hurt the, uh, these disclosure limitation methods. Uh, so we should view this as if I release an invariant that does cause a fair bit of privacy harm, and we should think about what is the privacy, what is the utility uh, that justifies that harm. Uh, okay, uh, the next question was, uh, how should the Census Bureau communicate the vulnerability? How can the Census Bureau effectively communicate to users what that complete accuracy of inputs to their use cases is infeasible and was not true historically? Uh, So I guess this is a, uh, a difficult question. I don't have an answer to what's the best way to communicate this. Uh, I guess one thing that one should point out is that, uh, and that John has pointed out, is that uh, traditional disclosure limitation techniques uh, create distortions that are, that are opaque to the user. The user doesn't know how they were done, what the parameters were, and as a result, the user of the data has no way to, to correct for these, uh, uh, for these issues. Uh, I guess Steve Ruggles tells the story of uh, uh, the ages of uh, older people being very, very wrong in one of the data sets and they discovered it just because this, the data statistically didn't, didn't make sense. Uh, but presumably there are other similar errors that occur which are uh, uh, which are not discovered, and this is a serious uh, uh, issue with the traditional, uh, uh, traditional techniques. Uh, differential privacy allows the user to uh, account for the noise added. So uh, as a user, you can kind of do some post-processing to get uh, precise error bars around, uh, around the conclusions they are drawing from the data set. Now, I suspect a lot of uh, the, the worry, of the concerns about these formal techniques also comes from the fact, uh, or comes from the impression that the error bars that you will get when you use differential privacy uh, will be larger than what the previous techniques had. Uh, now, I guess I have no way of uh, figuring out if this is a true statement or not because the previous techniques didn't have any error bars around them, uh, even though they had errors in, around them. Uh, but this, in some sense, is a policy question about epsilon. So if you choose a very large epsilon, you'll make these error bars smaller. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, we should realize that if the error bars become very small, then the reconstruction attacks or perhaps more sophisticated reconstruction attacks would work. Uh, so, uh, so there's this fundamental tension between, uh, between the accuracy of the answers and the reconstructability of, uh, of the data set. And, uh, and this in particular has, this tension has nothing to do with differential privacy. This is, uh, this is a mathematical theorem that if I give you fairly accurate answers to lots of questions, then you will be able to reconstruct the data set. Uh, the best solution we have to, to resolve this tension uh, at the moment is differential privacy. Uh, and for the kind of queries that uh, we are looking at, which are kind of counting queries, 
Uh, differential privacy is in some sense asymptotically optimal, and I guess there are some uh, big asterisks around this, this statement. Um, nearly optimal is optimal kind of asymptotically, which means up to uh, possibly large constant factors, and it makes sense to try to make those constant factors smaller. Uh, the lower bounds aren't quite exact reconstruction, but reconstruction given some kind of uh, auxiliary information. Uh, and perhaps in the coming decade uh, or so, we will come up with better ways to resolve this tension. Uh, but the current state of the art is differential privacy uh, and the methods that uh, John is using. And I guess uh, there's no reason uh, to not use them. Uh, the next question was on uh, balancing the accuracy requirements. How can the Census Bureau best do principal balancing of the accuracy requirements of diverse use cases? Uh, I guess hidden in there are, in some sense, three different questions. One is the question of figuring out the use cases, and we heard a little bit about uh, attempts to do so. Uh, there's a policy question there, is, which is, uh, even if we know all the use cases, we have to figure out how to, what balance do we want between them. Uh, and then finally, there's a technical question of once I know the use cases and have figured out what weighting I want between them, uh, how do you do the optimization itself? Um, I guess there are some kind of answers to the last question, the, the technical one, uh, that I guess John is aware of and uh, I can give more details on. Um, the first two questions are, I guess, more challenging and in some sense uh, uh, outside my expertise. Uh, there was also the question of uh, partitioning privacy across geographic levels. So in tuning the full geographic hierarchy, which levels make the most sense to optimize for accuracy? Uh, this is in some sense related to the previous question in that different uh, partitionings of the privacy budget to the geographic to different levels would lead to different balances between uh, uh, various uh, use cases. Uh, so I guess we should treat these, uh, this partitioning as a hyperparameter, uh, or what we call hyperparameter in machine learning, uh, which is sort of things to be optimized. And then we can kind of tune these hyperparameters based either on uh, certain algorithms for tuning hyperparameters or trying out many different values of hyperparameters and choosing the best ones. Uh, this tuning itself can be done on previous census, census data so that the, the choice of hyperparameters doesn't leak private information. Uh, or there are actually methods available to tune them privately on the current uh, census data as well. Uh, which I can, which I guess are very recent, and uh, I can uh, uh, relate to John. I guess, yeah, I can relate to John offline. Uh, the next question was: If the only feasible algorithms for producing household person join tables and detailed race, ethnicity, and AIA and tables cannot deliver microdata for tabular publication, should the Census Bureau invest in? A dissemination system that publishes from protected tables instead. Uh, I guess I didn't quite interpret the question properly, so uh, uh, so ignore the answer up there. Uh, I guess this, to me, makes a lot of sense. I sus I believe we don't actually have uh, uh, very good methods for handling. Uh, joints where there is, uh, where say something like the household size is large. So joints where, uh, which are not one-to-one -one joints, but many-to-one joints. Um, so I'm not surprised that uh, the, the experiments that uh, the Bureau has been trying haven't given very good answers. Um, so I think it makes sense to explore other options uh, perhaps one should look at what are the use cases for these uh, household person joints uh, and figure out 
which of those use cases actually uh, care about large households, for example. Um, and Uh, use cases for pumps. Uh, so how should the Census Bureau assess the use cases for uh, pumps and restricted access to the confidential microdata? Uh, so I guess this is a very contentious question. I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess the users of pumps feel very strongly about them. Uh, John has had many uh, panel discussions with them. Uh, Steve has tried to convince uh, me and others to, of the importance of pumps. Uh, I guess one question is uh, perhaps a lot of the use cases of pumps, even though the the private uh, the privately generated, pump, privately reconstructed pumps are not very accurate at the block level. Uh, perhaps a lot of their uses are at a higher level of aggregation, uh, in which case the, these reconstructed pumps are probably good enough. Uh, that's a question for exploration. Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, it's possible that there will be cases where these are not good enough, and I guess uh, this is a policy question of uh, whether one should uh, uh, expand more uh, restricted access. Uh, should the Census Bureau relax the requirement that all published tables be fully consistent, as other national statistical offices have done for their census publication? Uh, so this, I guess, again, is a contentious question. Uh, I think requiring consistency uh, has, has downsides. Uh, so in particular, one thing, as John alluded to, is that consistency kind of makes it harder to reason about the noise that was added. Because when you enforce consistency, uh, the noise doesn't necessarily remain unbiased. Uh, so as a user of the data, if I was trying to reconstruct the correct error bars around uh, my procedure. Uh, if we didn't do such the strong pre-processing needed to ensure consistency, this would be a very easy thing to do. Uh, the techniques for ensuring consistency also make it harder to, uh, uh, to do this, uh, to construct these error bars, to make the data more useful. Uh, one could imagine kind of two versions of the data, one without, uh, one just the tables without, that are not consistent, and if somebody really wants uh, consistent tables, we could, since this is all post-processing, uh, it, the Bureau could in principle release software that ensures the consistency between two or a few tables, uh, that someone could use. Um, I guess I should point out that uh, there are many cases where we are perfectly happy not having consistency. So uh, uh, the charts Al showed this morning of the percentage of people uh, responding or not responding uh, was a, had a footnote that these numbers don't add up to 100 because of rounding, which is one form of inconsistency. Uh, and since the inconsistency is usually small, uh, hopefully this should, uh, this should be not a big problem. Uh, at the same time, there are perhaps uh, strong, strong arguments for requiring full consistency. Some people use software that uh, digests two tables and assumes that they are consistent with each other, and the software can um, stop functioning when you don't have uh, consistency. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I would my personal recommendation would be to get rid of consistency and whatever software is, whatever post-processing will help ensure consistency uh, can be released as a piece of software that some users can use. 
uh, how can the Census Bureau incorporate systems that will give a holistic perspective on the impact of these changes? Uh, this, uh, I guess this also is a, is a very broad question. One of, the, one of the things that can be done uh, is to, uh, is to, is for the census or collaborators to publish uh, uh, at the very least examples of, uh, of analyses done on this differentially private uh, publication uh, so the users have, so that users have some examples of how to uh, reconstruct these error bars. Uh, even better if there are tools to do this automatically that would uh, go a long way. I'm sure this is not the only thing and there's a lot more that can be done but uh, I guess this is this is all I have. That's great. Thank you, Kunal. I don't know if John wanted to respond to any of that or should we see if others have comments? Go ahead. Yeah. If others have reactions, comments, questions. You're not asleep, are you? No. <laughs> um, well, I had a thought. Oh, somebody does? Oh, go ahead, Jay. Thank you. No, so you're going to have to, uh, oh, no, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. I doubt it. So I have a really naive question, um, and I'm sorry if you've answered this before. So um, the only way you've learned race and ethnicity exactly is because you are the Census Bureau and have access to the confidential data. You as the hacker only have the putative re-identifications. Is that right? So meaning that... If you, if you were attacking this database, you've done a reconstruction, you've matched it, you've linked it against commercially available data, and you have these putative reconstructions which consist of 138 million records, and it turns out that a bunch of them are, in fact, correct. But you, the hacker, don't know that, right? Hmm. That, that's, that's the whole question. <laughs> so, so that's basically correct. After you've done a putative re-identification from the outside, you would need an additional uh, uh, data effort to confirm your re-identifications. So, so the, the, what's troubling is the 38% the confirmation rate uh, in, in record linkage, that'd be called the, uh, um, um, the sensitivity of the, of the analysis. And that's just orders of magnitude higher than uh, we had previously thought that the sensitivity of such attacks would be. Kathy? Oh, um, this is for a non-statistician question. So how does this affect, I mean, we're talking about the um, control totals and how it affects the totals and consistency, but does it, um, the like correlations and the relationships between, among the characteristics, does that also have more noise after the end of this, or how does, or does that question doesn't make sense? Over the last 15 years, there's been a lot of discussion in the statistics and computer science literature about what happens when you do what's called noise injection or noise infusion disclosure limitation. And um, there are many true theorems for which the hypotheses are not uh, uh, the same across them, so it's hard to give you a general characterization. The statement that the analyses that are accurate are only the ones that have been designed into the system is not generically true. The correct statement is that uh, if you have published the analysis that generated the protected data and uh, in a sufficiently, sufficiently uh, robust mathematical form, then it is possible to calculate the extent to which any other analysis is covered by the, um, essentially by the moments or the, or the support of the analysis you did. And so uh, there are always ways of determining the extent to which any particular analysis is correlated with the analyses that were used to build a set of protected tabulations or protected microdata. What's not well known is that 
the space of such hypotheses for the person tables that we've already designed for the redistricting data for the 2020 data is actually much larger than the space that was true for the 2010 data be because we have to fit the entire uh, fully saturated contingency table at every level of geography in order to, uh, to have one of the properties that are needed, which is the consistency as epsilon goes to infinity, you get back the real data. Uh, so uh, every hypothesis that was supported in analyzing the redistricting data in the past is still supported, as are many hypotheses that were not supported in the historical data. But that may not be true for other things. It's, it's so at the moment, no hypotheses about joined tables are supported. So I don't want to give you only the good news without the bad news. At the moment, hypotheses about joined tables are not built into anything that we're able to figure out uh, how to, well, we know how to release them now. We just have to figure out how to engineer that so it's conformable with the systems that the Census Bureau can actually implement. Dr. Ebal, this is Mario Morazzi. Just to Skeptical question to make sure I understand. So, um, uh, beginning of the presentation, you described the original experiment, the re original reconstruction, where uh, the problem was that race and ethnicity had been identified um, for the entire population of the United States. Um, the census has 10 questions. Two of those are race and ethnicity, probably very sensitive questions. Um, in addition, each questionnaire has an address tied to it, so you know ex it's exact geography if you know, if you have all the information associated with that questionnaire. Eleven questions. Two already done. Um, you know, commercially available data has thousands of fields available on each of us. Um, can you name variables that are gathered, besides the race and ethnicity, that are gathered in the census, the decennial census, they are or discoverable, and they are discoverable through this reconstruction, but that they are not available commercially. In case you missed the news, there's an 11th question on the 2020 census. Touche. Well, currently enjoined, but we are instructed to ask it unless enjoined. So, 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 so that's one answer, the citizenship question. Uh, it would clearly be an example of what you're saying. But even without the citizenship question, our job is not to say that commercial databases can't identify you or, uh, or get information about you that they acquired through some means, usually legal, uh, and that's not on the Census Bureau, that's on the private database. Our job is to not improve the quality of those databases with identifiable data when we publish statistics. The data that are collected by the Census Bureau have to be used for statistical purposes. Exactly identifying an answer to a question on a census form and then linking it into your database is not a statistical purpose. Uh, it's not hard to imagine inappropriate uses of such data. Um, there are historical examples of that, not just in the United States. It's very important for us to have a confidentiality protection system that gives the users of the data statistically reliable numbers for their uses when those uses are statistical uses. It's also important not to deliver apparently statistical data that can be reconfigured to be used for another purpose that's not statistical. Um, that's a hard line to walk and we are trying to walk it uh, erring on the side of making sure that we don't allow inappropriate uses of the census data. Thank you, that's a brilliant response from a brilliant man. And I believe that, uh, you know, no matter my question, the literature on differential privacy is extremely important and needs to continue to be developed in a research and an academic setting. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, you've kind of shed a huge amount of light on something that I was not even aware, so you're right. There is a potential 11th question, and so if I'm understanding correctly, the inclusion of the citizenship question would actually make it more important for differential privacy to be implemented in the 2020 census than less. And so that raises all sorts of questions in my head that I really don't want to even get into, but I'll, I'll just raise them here right now for us to all think about, not to talk about. 
Um, it, it does, however, um, you know, I mean, you, you made some great points there at the end, but I, I wonder because some people, you know, especially people who have been using these official date statistics for a very long while, are wondering whether the output of this differential privacy algorithm isn't, in fact, um, some sort of, um, you used a word, I'm not even trying, I can't really remember, was, is it really statistical data after all? <laughs> You know, is it, is it, is it, can it be for a statistical use if it's been altered from what it was supposed to be? Right, we're trying to do a census to count the people where they are, but we end up generating something different to protect their privacy. So are, is it a statistical purpose if we pr publish data that has been, you know, um, noised and fused in this way to protect it from being reconstructed? It's go around and around and it's difficult questions, but I thought I'd just raise them. I'll just say, say something that the addition of an additional question doesn't uh, increase or diminish the, the notion that we're still under a statutory requirement to maintain the confidentiality of these data, regardless of what questions are asked. Um, and and that, that's, the, that's the tension here. There, that, that requirement versus the accuracy of the data, those two things are not they do not inhabit the same world, so you have to have some sort of trade-off between them. Absolutely, and it would be very difficult for me to disagree with uh, the deputy director ever in my life. Um, but some of these statutes for confidentiality were written many decades ago, and so what's changed is not the statue, or it's that there's now commercially available data, right? And so. No, I mean, I, you guys are stewards of the data, and you guys have to comply with that mandate, but, um, you know, we are in a new information environment as individuals, and so the relationship between the individual and his information is changing over time, and there's a whole bunch of, and part of that is because there's all this commercially available data about each of us, and so um, I wonder at one point do we evolve, and, and at what, what point are we taking step backs or forward? I'd, I don't know, but I think these, this is the right form to have them, so I'm just raising them for that purpose. Well, I, I, you know, we can talk about that sort of thing in this forum, and probably not today, this afternoon, but this, this, to solve this problem requires people outside of this room to get involved in that conversation. Um, in particular, the Congress would have to get involved in that conversation. So in some countries, the, the legislate, legislative bodies have taken up that conversation. I, I think that's only a very nascent stage here. Um, and so th this, is, this is a huge issue facing society, not just for statistical agencies. The, the basic problem is how do, how do we compute on private data and add value in a way that does not distract from, from uh, individuals' privacy. So that, that's a generic problem that, that we all face, that companies face, that government agencies face, and it needs it needs to be solved. Um, I think we're, we're sort of maybe the spear point of some of that, just because we have a use case that is so disclosive. So. I would also not quite agree with your uh, statement that what has changed is just the emergence of commercial data sets. I think. Uh, what has also changed is the attacks that are available. So I guess the analogy is uh, probably 30 years ago, a six-character password was secure enough. Uh, and today it's not because there are, uh, uh, you can easily crack a six-character password. Uh, uh, and I guess similarly, the, the best attacks that were available uh, that existed uh, 30 years ago uh, were reasonably protected uh, against by the, dis the disclosure limitation techniques that were being used. Uh, today we have these reconstruction attacks which uh, allow reconstruction and I would I would say it's not obvious to me that even in the absence of these commercial data sets if some if I showed you these uh, reconstruction attacks uh, it's it's unclear whether uh, there would be disclosure limitation techniques that allow for these reconstruction even without the existence of commercial data sets would 
uh, still not obviously be in compliance of the law. You're right, I completely forgot the, com the increased computing power that has risen over the past 30 years to do these attacks. Completely agree with you, Kunal. And I think that in terms of, you know, a private company like Google, we have to do a lot to make sure we protect everyone's privacy. Absolutely, please continue to do so. <laughs> Um, I was uh, had a couple thoughts I'll just say real quickly. So as I was looking at your questions, John, I was thinking about um, uh, what Kathy had said earlier about really an analysis of the use cases. Um, and I don't, I, I haven't heard whether we've there's been an analysis of the use cases um, and that might help uh, to uh, better determine which you know, which are use cases that have many, many, many users, and which are use cases that maybe have a smaller number of users, uh, that, uh, that then perhaps they could, those people could be encouraged to, you know, connect with a university census, act, yeah, whatever that term is for those private systems they have at universities. Um, so anyway, I haven't heard if there's an analysis of use cases that, um, that has been done um, that might be helpful maybe from the people who have pulled from POMS or the IPOM system. Um, and then my other thought was just, as you mentioned, that um, you've got some mostly solved problems, some tractable problems, and some remaining problems, and you're continuing to work on all of them. Um, and you asked uh, about how to communicate all of this to the public, which I know is, is <laughs> difficult. Um, and I wondered if, uh, you know, this is an opportunity where there's a working group or something where we um, have more people who can help uh, even beyond CSAC, because with working groups we can have external folks who can help with um, moving this forward more quickly, maybe prioritizing use cases or analyzing then prioritizing and also helping with communication. So you'd have more spokespeople who could talk about it. Uh, thank you, those are, those are very helpful. Um, I, there have been several analyses of the use cases. Uh, I don't know that we have any written summaries. Uh, no, thank you. Yeah, so Karen Battle says, we do not have any written uh, summaries. Thank you, Karen. Uh, but uh, I think that's a, a reasonable thing for us to, to think about doing. Uh, um, as much as many of our colleagues uh, throughout the building are working hard on uh, specific things. I'm not going to make a, a promise that we will do it soon. Uh, what I will say is that I read a lot of them myself, and I know that very high-level demographers and uh, other uh, data analysts, subject matter experts throughout the Bureau did, trying to identify them not so much by volume, but by type. And so um, uh, many of the recommendations that went into the, uh, to the products that were discussed earlier are based on is isolating use cases by particular types uh, to try to, to meet them with a collection of tables that, um, uh, that will work. And one of the things I think worked, that worked well, uh, I'll actually invite Karen to make some comments if I mischaracterize it, but in trying to figure out how to do the demographic profiles, we identified what things we should give uh, a high priority to, uh, to, to making available in the, in the products, because those have historically been developed from the public use products, but they don't use all of the public use products, and they don't use them at the levels of geography that, w that are in the public use products. So that, use our own use case, how to do the demographic profiles, considered sort of the highest priority product from the census, drove a lot of the considerations. Karen, if you'd like to add to that, that would be fine. She indicates that she does not, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that, so exactly. as for the use, as for the working group, um, uh, uh, I th why don't you, may I suggest that you make that a recommendation and we will take it under advisement. Thank you. Sounds good. Ah, Juan Pablo. This is Juan Pablo Rocan. I'm just going to ask something that I, I think Dr. Raybao mentioned. I think he mentioned it at a previous meeting, but I can't remember for sure. Um, will the Bureau at some point uh, release a version of the 2010 products with the privacy loss budget with a similar methodology that was used that will be used for 2020 so the people who are concerned about their analysis being affected they can actually try it out <coughs> and see if it actually results in something that would cause concern to them. 
John A. Bout again. Thank you for that question. I forgot to mention it. Uh, I didn't do that on purpose. Um, we have committed to releasing the code base, and the code base is uh, undergoing a review along with uh, sufficient documentation so that it can be used. Uh, the code base will come with a wrapper that inhales the 1940 census so that you can uh, um, first do the things that we used it for for the 18 end end test, and it's just the 18 end end test code base. It's not the, the whole, well, it's all the code base that exists, but that's the 18 end end test code base. Um, we have also promised to release products with that code base or similar code base run on the 2010 census. Those are also being internally reviewed and in preparation. We haven't made any public statements about exactly what we will do. We have a suite of things that we did in support of the decision making for the 18 end end test and some subset of that suite uh, is being prepared. It's all being examined and some subset is being prepared. I have both, uh, I have statisticians, disclosure avoidance experts and subject matter experts reviewing it to try to figure out uh, what, what release format would um, make the most sense. Uh, Kunal Talwar, CSEC. Uh, just one quick clarification question. So you said the uh, reportionment will not be, uh, will be an invariant, will not be differentially private. Uh, so will the actual state populations be published or will just the output of the uh, reportionment algorithm be public and the populations can stay secret? Johnny about again, the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee is scheduled to do, consider that in one of its April meetings. Okay. Anything else? We good to go? All right. Um, so we're gonna have a break. Right? Yes. Can I give them instructions before Please. they go on break? Okay. Do. Okay. So um, what we'll do after we're done with our break is start writing up our recommendations from today. And we'll do it the same way we did last time, right? Where um, uh, each individual who was a discussant will take the lead. Um, and Peter Glenn, who's not here, he, he is um, waiting at his computer for you to email him um, anything so he can compile um, the comments for um, the update on the 2020. Jay, if you could do the CBAMs, um, uh, you know, obviously write up your own uh, recommendations and then anybody who has additions for Jay, go speak with him. Um, Mario doing the integrated partnerships, uh, Kathy doing the data products, and Kunal the um, privacy loss. Um, and, uh, and then also, um, you know, we can kind of, anybody has extra time on their hands, you can get a head start. Um, at least Jessica and Jeff and Juan Pablo could be thinking about like maybe just typing up what might be some of your recommendations. Obviously, they could change tomorrow by the end of the day, but that way, um, what I noticed, um, part of, I think, what got us a little bit behind last time was that we were pretty delayed in starting our group discussion. Um, so I, if we can start our group discussion a little faster tomorrow, um, then I think we won't have the problem of having to do an extra meeting. Uh, so, but, we, but you guys have done an awesome job, really, getting all the recommendations together. You guys are fantastic. So please take a 10-minute break. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. And but we'll talk about. So, Allison, yeah. are we coming back to discuss the first? We days? won't. No, we won't, we won't be discuss discussing. This is just the time just we have to organized. write them down. Yeah. Okay. So write them down and edit them. Get the typos out. You know the whole thing. <laughs> yes. And then do we email them to the? And then you email them to me. Yeah. To and I'm going to give you my my work address, my work email address, and you email them to CSAC chair. But um, I think there was also a delay getting the CSAC chair emails last time. Remember, we were sitting there waiting for them, so that was frustrating. So um, I'll, I'll come and give everybody my business card so you have that, too. But feel free to stretch your legs. Thank you. Yeah. 
do it. No, I, it's, it's happened. No, that's, that's, that's coming. Private thing yeah. comes through us.
Hello, ma'am. Hello, Tara. Hello, Tara. This is the operator. If you can hear me, please pick up the line. You will now be placed into conference. Hello, Tara. Hello. You will now be placed into conference.
Excuse me, Tara. This is the conference operator. Are you still online? Again, this is the conference operator. Do I have anybody on this line?
For the other uh, committee members, Peter sent me a note possibly a while ago that asked if anyone else was planning on sending him comments on the decennial operations update. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can this join our club of the most opinionated people in the room. This is Tommy Wright. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning at uh, 8.30. I think bus shows up at 7.30, and uh, the meeting is ended. Good job. And this concludes today's conversation.